I would think that's very, very close. Jetzt kommt er, jetzt kommt er ran, zieht sich ran. Uh, very good if you're a fan of BMW and Rover Racing have turned up this weekend with two of the M4 GT3s. Of course, uh, their first full campaign uh, in the top category and 99 was put on pole. That's the one shared by Conor de Filippi, Agosto Fafus and Nick Yellowly. But a, a real mix of cars at the top, which is exactly how we like it. Car number 44 ended up second fastest. Another BMW, that from the BMW Junior team. That's Daniel Harper, Max Hess and Neil Verhagen, who just seem to be permanent fixtures here they're still only 12 years old 14 and 16 between them i joke but of course that's the point of the bmw junior team uh, putting in another really good job and uh, the best of the rest third fastest walking horse another bmw i talked about variety i was uh, kidding with you a little bit that's christian cronias andy suchek and uh, sammy matty trogan but the interloper the spx class car car number 53 ended up sixth fastest overall and that's one of the two true racing KTM Crossbow GT2s, of course, that's the important factor this year. Racing in the GT2 European Series, that's Reinhard Koffler, Mad Sillyhaug, Max Hoffer and Tim Heinemann. I have missed out two cars in the top six there. The fans of Manti Racing, winners of the opening round, Kevin Estra, Ke uh, Fred Machiavicki and Lawrence Van Tour. They are fourth fastest and fifth was car number 35, another Walkenhorst BMW M4. So there's a bit of a theme going on at the top, but then we have a jumble. And of course, this weekend, this time around, we've got a couple of Ferraris in the mix in the top class in SP9, which is very good news indeed for fans of Prancing Horse. Indeed, a bit of, a, bit of Italian flavour. We normally have the, uh, the Conrad run Lamborghini that was uh, on pole for round one, but uh, finished. I think it did just scrape into the top 10, didn't it, at the end of the race. Um, the Manti Porsche winning that race from uh, 15th on the grid, so a complete swap around for them. Um, we joked, did we not, last year, Bruce, at this, uh, particularly this BMW junior team of the outgoing M6, that it was old and dated and whatever, but it seemed to be right up there at the front, and we, we made these sort of jokes in with about the, the BMW board saying, why are we signing off all this money to build this new car when this one's perfectly good? Although it is, on its debut, at the Norcipher, pole position. There's your answer. Yes. Evolution. Evolution, of course, that's not where BMW stops, because this weekend, among many new entries to bolster the field to 160 starters, two of next year's GT4 version of the M4, so nothing stands still. I remember when the current iteration of the GT4 M4 came in and a lot of teams looked for we like what we see. Um, but a couple of those entered by BMW M Motorsport. They're in the SP8 T class. Get this, look at the driver, this is the driver lineup. Works BMW driver Steph Dusseldorf, sharing with Jörg Weidinger, and then Eric Johansson and Philip Eng, who's BMW through and through. Through and through, but not through the barriers. Unfortunately, we had a, a few little problems uh, this morning because I think people were just trying to push as hard as they could on what is an unusually good track conditions. But it was cool, and 474 was a Porsche we saw uh, backwards with its tail against the barriers. That was a Team Mantor racing Porsche Cayman. Uh, but I hope that can be fixed in time for the race. But uh, through it all came the Rover Racing. Uh, 99 and 98, both well placed, but uh, the one that took the sharp end of the field was the 99 car. And uh, don't forget, over the years, Rover, Rover Racing have run many makes of cars. Some years, well, let's take a look. Here we are, BMW M4s in 
four of the top six positions, but uh, by one point, nearly 1.3 seconds, uh, Augusto Farfus and Conor De Filippi at the top of the table there. Aston Martin, I'm going to pick out the number 21 car, TF Sports, making their seasonal debut. They tried to do it a couple of weeks ago. The snow beat them, but uh, Marco Sorensen, Maxime Martin and David Pittard, who, talking of M6s here last year, the last couple of years, has been absolutely mighty and his reward has been promoted towards the Aston Martin side, but uh, Porsche's in the mix as well, down towards it, but look down to ninth, the top Audi, that must be the first time you've been able to see one that low, starting on a grid of the NLS for many, many moons since the launch of the R8 LMS, but uh, look out for Frank Stipper in particular in, in that car from the Team Phoenix crew. Big, big spread of tyres, but it's not that important. The bragging rights are definitely with BMW, and the, and the BMW coffee stop must have been a very happy one after qualifying. Yeah, I'm obviously an Aston man through and through, but I'll say it now before you have to. Uh, but uh, great to see um, TF Sport out there, and that's their semi-works now. They've withdrawn works cars properly, but they're supporting uh, client teams, and very much customer teams, and that's, uh, that's one of the great to see there. Tom Ferrier runs a very, very tight ship. Uh, not a bad drive these day as well. Absolutely so, and it uh, was just uh, interesting looking down at the grid, I can see number 26, which is the Octane 126. I alluded to the fact we had, or even mentioned, uh, we had a couple of Ferraris in the top class. That's uh, the one shared by Bjorn Grossman, Simon Trummer, Jonathan Hershey and Luca Ludwig. And Luca has always been a star in Ferrari since he got his uh, tail in one handful of years ago. Just want to talk about the fact we've got a boost up to 160 uh, cars taking part in what we're going to call the second round of this year's championship but we have lost car collection motorsport normally staunch supporters here but this event you always get Canada clashes has come up against the opening round of the ADAC GT Masters up at Ostersleben and uh, number 22 23 and 24 Audis um, are appearing up there instead that means we've lost the likes of uh, Christopher Haase Matthias Drudy I think Patrick Niederhauser is up there as well uh, Land Motorsport, who came second last time out with that brilliant run from Yusuf Arega right at the end. Remember, he was challenging for the lead on the final sequence of corners on the last lap. Well, he and Christopher Meese are taking part up at Ostersleben. And, and another crew that's missing, you've already talked about them, Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini, not here this time round. Why? Because uh, Franz Conrad himself decided he wants to do a spot of racing, the opening round of the Prototype Cup Germany, and he's taken Axel Jeffries with him. So they've... Uh, gone to compete in that that's, that's right he's allowed to do that isn't he he is i think if you've got 50 years service in motorsport you're allowed to pick and choose right but of course the numbers are going up and up because it's just a month until the nurburgring 24 and a lot of drivers up and down the field are sort of earning their their sort of driving card if you will and if you look quite a long way through the entry list you'll get down to um sam neary second generation neary racer normally competing and doing really well in british gts and he's sharing with esteban moot in a Walkenhorst uh, BMW, so you don't have to say BMW after Walkenhorst, but it's a BMW M2 CS racing class. That's a class of their own, six cars in that class. So for the young British driver, that's a chance for him to have a go, an even younger driver potentially sitting in a pushchair down there on the grid. But what I like to see and what you didn't get to see two weeks ago was uh, the fact that the sun is shining here, the track is dry. And by all accounts, yesterday was a fantastic day of testing. A lot of the teams felt they got a really good amount of mileage under their wheels. It's good to see. Um, let's look at what the drivers have got in the um, pole position. Rover Racing BMW uh, it was uh, it was um, Connor De Filippi that put it on pole position. Uh, I'm just looking at their, where their hometowns are. So we have um, St. Ingbert, North Carolina, Monaco for Augustus Farfus, and Nick Yellowly from Solihull. One for, one for JP there. <laughs> True to his roots. <laughs> yeah. But in that's time. That's a very cosmopolitan team there, isn't it? Actually, that's what I noticed. A lot of the drivers who are earning a very good uh, salary out of racing in GT3, which is the SP9 class here, uh, you know, they, they earn a lot, but not enough to live in Monaco, by and large. But you think <laughs> about all the years Augusto Farfus has been a works BMW driver, and uh, naturally. But uh, I think also another reason is that a lot of drivers are competing so frequently in GT cars around the world. They, um, you know, and there's so many events in Germany. It does seem to be with the with the 
Nürburgring Langstrecken series that uh, the very top drivers are here every second weekend effectively which is a really good way of getting der Olli mileage on not just in the car in but with the very best uh, der crews der out there ETM Bernd Schneider down in the group being here. interviewed ah, and just what a lovely guy here. and his record is, uh, in touring cars and GT cars and just just phenomenal I remember when he was you know leading up to his run in Formula One where he unfortunately for him ended up with Zach speed which wasn't the car to have when he broken in but you know had the been a German team at the time who could have taken him on, uh, you know, he could have been a Grand Prix winner. No two ways about it, but in, in his latter years, as he calls them, very happy being a sort of driver, driver mentor. So viele Familien, so viel Fan näher. He's about to get run over by KTM at the moment. No, he's telling him. Yeah, he's wise enough. He's had eyes in the back of his head. He didn't hear that one coming up, but he sensed it and moved out of the way just in time. Yeah, but of course, that car was the, was the one that qualified so well from the SPX class. That's the number 53 True Racing KTM Crossbow, the GT2 model. There are two of them here. The other one is uh, run by third generation Stuck Racers, Ferdinand and Johannes, with Marcus Palzler and Christian Menzel. That's a really strong line. In fact, both of those cars, you know, showing uh, true racing's real intent as uh, to what they, what they fancy achieving here. But that's right up in the mix, and that's, that's good to see. We always like uh, the pop Easter. We're sad that Conrad Lamborghini uh, isn't here this weekend, because that's a car we always look for, because it seems to have various roles in the race, going up the order, coming down the order. Exactly. Um, what well, we said many times before, haven't we? If it didn't have bad luck, it wouldn't have any luck at all. Uh, it just, um, it just never seems to, to capitalise. I'm sure at some point, I'll put a prediction on it now. Shall we say at some point this year that a Conrad Lamborghini might well win one of these rounds? Well, another thing, all the ingredients are there. No, exactly so. But you've, you've gone and cursed it now, which is just unfortunate. But um, that, that's how it is. But it's my job. It's your job. So that top car, you know, Nick Yololi was listed with it, but it, as so often happens here, we get a, a listing and then you get to race day and then a couple of drivers, you know, they've decided they're going to go with two. It's a four-hour race, you can do the maths, it's quite simple on that. Are you still doing the maths? I can see your... No, I'm, I'm just thinking, also, some of them even share different cars, they go the other way, don't they? They drive two different cars in the same race. Yes, that's normally the sort of um, Patrick Niederhauser. Exactly. Uh, and Frank Stippler, no stranger to that. So, 99 heading its way up th through the throngs of people still down there wearing fairly thick jackets this morning so it's still a little bit nippy but um it's great to see the blue skies up towards the front of the grid so over racing heading towards that pole position and if you weren't with us at the start of the show as we look ahead to this the 53rd at an hour adac run strecken trophy i love that the full history of these events um it's a packed grid 160 cars and as Snowy pointed out we've got 30 cars in the top class, but the fact they can be pushed and challenged, but in fact, 25 cars in the top class, Snowy. I've just had a little look. But then we've got those three in the SPX class. Now, shown by the 53 True Racing KTM, they can mix it as well. So they're heading to the front end of the grid. Yep, currently just, uh, just nine degrees. Nine. At the circuit. But better nine degrees and no snow than... The round two weeks ago that didn't happen the 23rd of april yeah but they called that off uh, quite On early On uh, Wednesday, exactly yeah. exactly so um and i you know many a time well we've been here when they they've called it off on the morning but uh, the nurburgring you know what makes it isn't just the the stunning lap that it, it just provides something for everyone interesting comment last weekend jules Gunion competing in up at alton park first time he'd seen the circuit and had that brilliant clash battle for the lead with Adam Carroll mm -hmm. in the race. He came away saying he absolutely adored the circuit. He likes grass and banks around the circuit. That's why he loves circuits like this. Yeah. And it still means something to drivers to achieve a top result on a circuit that can bite you. Has absolutely. Something. I mean, they, yeah, there's a there's a code word for Silverton. They call it grey rock, uh, as in it's just so flat, featureless, whatever. And it, it is particularly um, the Grand Prix thing is not so bad, but it, it is and he's flat, there's no undulations, no, no contours, no gradient changes, nothing, nothing happens. You've got the complete opposite, you've just mentioned Alton Park, which is, is often referred to as the sort of mini Nürburgring of the north in the UK, uh, and modelled on this circuit. And you, you couldn't get more variations here of altitude, descent, drop down to the foxhole, climb back up the other side, end of the lap, tier gone, as we saw on that, very, that first round, that last, um, last lap. Um, with uh, Yusuf Vega trying to get the lead off the um, Franco Mikovetsi in the uh, Manti Porsche. And you drop down the Dottinger Hauer, and it's it's a run down. Then there's a, a kink on the left, partway through the left-hand kink, which doesn't look like a lot on a map or aerial. You see it driving it at the speeds they're doing. 
you know, pushing on 300k, it's it's a it's a turn. It looks it's like a, a turn closed door in front of you. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely quite gorgeous. But then you get to the end, you get the tear guard, and it suddenly rises. It's, it's a dip and then rises, and you land. It's almost this plateau where you sort of turn right, left, and whatever. And that's where you have to they can try to go around the outside. And uh, I think it was uh, him, Mike Lee said it was um, Frank who said um, you know, uh, I, I, he, didn't, he didn't he didn't he didn't have an opportunity um, to overtake me. But yeah, it's, um, that's it's experience. About about yeah, yeah, so, didn't put him on the uh, grass, but just well, where are you going to go? Um, and, but down to the point to is, it was a, a second so, apart at the end well, of that race, after four hours, onto the very very last lap, and we're standing on the edge of our seat watching experience versus youth in two very different cars. You lost the record, a second to go, incredible. It was brilliant, but you know it was also. To Could me, the back? birth oh, this is of a young sure driver. Goal, huh? I watched this him race is, uh, two or three years ago when he was really probably too young to be racing GT3 cars. He's, he's still 19, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. But, but he's gained so he, much experience. And, and what he would have learned in that race is probably almost more than the rest of his career put together. Yeah. And I'll say that because he was racing against you know, the likes of Fred Machiavelli from a team that really know what they're doing. And Jörg um, Müller has come on leaps and bounds. And, um, this year, he's, think, as I said, this weekend, we're yeah. missing a lot of the drivers we're who are competing in um, uh, the ADAC GT Masters first round of their championship. Oh, he has turned 20 since that first round. Has he? Yeah. I, I could tell. Happy yeah. birthday That's it. To Coming away, no longer a teenager. Now, what I, I really, really enjoy is this mix of the driver, young drivers like Yusuf Vega and then drivers of huge experience. Jörg Müller is being interviewed down on the grid. You know, he's a driver who could have. Sure, you know, Formula 3000 champion back in around 1990 X. Could have, should have got to Formula 1, did lots of, lots of testing, but he stayed true to BMW ever since then and has just been all around the world racing. A lot of it sort of a bit under the radar, out in Japan and so on and so forth. But just down the grid, he's, he's smiling and laughing. He did say to me once, don't make out, I only laugh. You know, he wanted to be a serious racing driver, but he's had a phenomenal career and uh, just a really, you know, one of the lovely guys. And I can see why BMW have kept him closed because he's, he's great for, you know, for team spirit, he's quick, he's consistent and you know, it's just great that he's still here. I, I, I can't say the word great much more frankly but you know, he was a tip top driver, German Formula 3 champion, Formula 3000 champion but like so many, if there aren't the openings you, you can't push on if your ambition was Formula 1. But you know what, he could have ended up like Bernd Schneider not having a great career in Formula 1 and then it becomes quite hard. Bernd made the, the shift across into touring cars and how I think you can say but um, you know, good to have him here. So Jörg pressing on as ever. Still smiling. He's racing the number 35 Vulcan Horse Motorsport BMW today and um, looking forward to see how far they can go up the grid. And he's sharing that with uh, Mario von Bullen and young uh, British racer Ben Tuck, who's going faster and faster uh, by the round. So now this moment, of course, as the grid starts to clear, still a few of the Mercedes working their way up the grid. In fact, Mercedes is the mark that hasn't really shone in qualifying, none of them in the top 10. I'm scrolling back down, 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 down until we get to the best of them is, I think it's the number 55 Mercedes, unless I've skipped over one, in 19th place. And that's behind the Glickenhaus, which is here this weekend. Great to have that back and um, good to see all the enthusiasm around that team. And, uh, and so much of Glickenhaus as they, you know, compete in the World Endurance Championship, the sort of foundations were laid in what was then the uh, VLN, now the Nürburgring Langstrecken series, because they've got loads of mileage and the big man himself, such a supporter of this event. So that's Thomas Mutsch, uh, Felipe Fernandez Lazar, and Frank Mayer, all loyal to the team there, starting from 18th on the grid. And uh, let's see how they can go in number 56. But behind them, those two Mercedes, 55 from uh, the Landgraf Young Talents team, Patrick Assenheimer and uh, Lucas Sandro, genau, Treffs, also known as Lucy Treffs, and then the number eight get speed Heimann. car. Du sitzt schon Quite what, Adam Erwartung Christodoulou, Mario Engel and Maximilian Gotz, a brain so trust, if you will, are doing down in 20th on the grid. But then last time, in the opening uh, round, of course, the whole grid was shuffled, wasn't it? And we had the, the winning car coming through from, I think you said, the 15th uh, position, uh, fighting very hard with the car that started 13th. You know, it, so it can happen. I, I keep saying qualifying good, but it's not the ultimate thing here. Keep, as long as you don't lose too much ground on the opening lap. Yeah, that's key to it. That's... Uh, they get the first couple of laps we were uh, amusing about this, weren't we, last time? That Because um, we have these three starting orders, three grids, three groups, my apologies, uh, that start with 30 seconds between them. Yeah. Um, so the SP9s, they disappear off, but they get the one lap. It is a 25 kilometer lap, remember, but they get the one, probably about on one and a half, almost two laps before they catch the third group that's been delayed 
you know, a minute later. So we're talking standing starts, no rolling start, obviously. Uh, between just you know under eight minute lap around here. So it doesn't. They don't get very long. They get 15 minutes at best of racing amongst themselves, and then the traffic comes into it. And as you say, 160 cars. It's phenomenal. But it, it's 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 not all, even as though when the cars, the first cars in the lead pack come up, there's going to be a handful of them. There are effectively 20 plus of them. So, so if anybody's had a problem in, in, let's say, the third group of cars on their opening lap, it might only be a lap in. And then there are certain points on the circuit. You'd rather if the field's coming through, they catch you just as you're coming onto the coming past the pits. They can use the first half of the Grand Prix loop. But if they suddenly start coming past you when they get onto the Nordschleife, then, oh, my word. It's going to be very, very busy, but uh, good to see people now clearing the grid. The cars starting to become more apparent. 160 cars ready to play, and it's looking just picture perfect. 25 minutes until the start of the race, a month until the Nürburgring 24. And I think it's now time to talk a little bit more about TF Sport and their Aston Martin that's starting from what do we say from seventh on the grid. Marco Sorensen, David Pittard, and Maxime Martin. And uh, David Pittard, you know, I thought he was made at Silverstone. I saw him racing many things of uh, minimal power back there in the day but he's worked hard made Nürburgring effectively his home and his success here is has been epic I mean he's been one of the drivers in a, in a field packed with tip-top drivers at the front of the field he's one who stands out because he just seems to have an affinity for this circuit and Aston Martin is his mount this year and um, well for a few hours he was a works driver wasn't he when they yes they, and they changed his grading changed his grading on them so he became a works driver and the press release had to change yes hands up who's heading to the first round not so fast Pittard who told you to move and Later on anyhow he's back he's starting well. he's down seventh on the grid he won't be starting because he's wearing so a, we'll his a race jacket rather driver. than his race suit yep, so we'll have to see if we can look into the car we'll and, uh, and put some little green see. ticks also, next to the driver's the name we'll give you a choice of Marco Sorensen or Maxime Martin so Maxime is going on board no no it's it's Sorensen it's 95 on the side of the helmet that's not his age obviously the helmet's going on it's always a bit of a bit of a race here to catch the starting drivers also here müssen wir sowieso jetzt 95 was the number that uh, was on the flank of the Dane train he shared with Nicky team over the years. David, good luck and a lot of fun during and, the race. Uh, on it's the unusual not to have Nicky here, actually, isn't it? Uh, but he's uh, clearly in demand elsewhere. But I must say, circuit looking picture perfect. Good to have the Ferraris in the mix as well. And also, I, I like the fact that KTM's are mixing it up and uh, they're, they're sort of in, in, not just in that stunning sixth place overall, there's another one relatively well placed because I can see one the true the second of the true racing cars number 23 is start, sorry number 52 is starting in 23rd position on the grid I have to just amend my notes because I just noticed one of the drivers is not in there anymore in the 52 car we've lost Christian Mensel oh, no hold on I beg your pardon I've had a, a bit of a change all round Max Hoffer's shift across Okay, I have to amend my notes when you look at your a very long entry list that, as we know, Peter, goes through through many, many pages. And it's well, a thing that's fluid. In, indeed, and talking of things being fluid, um, qualifying was perhaps a, a bit different this morning. It was, um, to say it was one of the messiest qualifying sessions of, I've reported on, seen on an LS, would not be an understatement to lots of offs, lots of code 60s and all sorts. And basically, if you, if you didn't set your time early, it wasn't there. So that's something else to add into the mix, that um, this grid, it may not be that representative of the GT3 car SB9 class because it's it's weather, it affects things, taint, um, code 60s, cars off in barriers, fluid down at various places. Uh, and it was a, it's one of those, I think, messy was probably the best way of putting it, uh, qualifying sessions. And normally they're not. And that's no no reflection on um, organisers or teams or anything. It's just the way the cars have fallen today. Um, you, you know, I think it's also the fact that they, they were probably going a little bit... Um, stir crazy on the fact they had a proper a circuit that was in uniform condition yep. so many sessions here it's about surviving a track that's already wet or possibly got on at this time of year almost the edge of snow on it but uh qualifying is so limited here and it is about keeping a nose clean but uh, if there was an interruption in your lap and flags in front of you you have to react accordingly so of course you would come off the power and exert a little bit of caution but uh hats off to uh, the bmw crew that so, well-known racing driver trait to exert uh, a little bit of caution, yes. Just a little bit less than the next driver in the group <laughs> exactly. is, is what your team manager would be hoping, but do not pick up a penalty yes. because nobody likes penalties. 
Yes. Save the car, no penalties. The rest is your job. Yes, yes. So, there's only so much we can help you with from the pit wall. OK, we've talked about BMW galore, four of the top five cars, but the, the Manti Racing Porsche, it's a one that's always a factor here, but the lineup, it's starting fourth. Yes, it's three and a three and a third seconds, three and a quarter seconds off the ultimate pace. That's not important at the moment. It started down in about 15th place last time around and it came through to win. Same driver lineup, Kevin Estra, Fred Machiavici and Laurent Vantour. So that is um, a mighty, mighty driver lineup. Both all drivers who shone here, this team has shone here, the, the Porsche 911 GT3R, tried and tested. And it's looking uh, very promising indeed, but uh, if you've never listened or watched a round of the Nürburgring Langstrecken series, welcome, first of all. But uh, just to explain the circuits that's used, of course, you know about the Nürburgring Nordschleife. We don't get there immediately. We turn through effectively first four corners, first one, two, three, four, three corners of the Grand Prix circuit. And instead of carrying on down the hill to the Dunlop Kerre at the bottom, after that uh, initial three-corner complex, which has that wonderful first turn, then the slightly banked second turn, turn three, in fact, we do go through four corners, then you're turning right, and then you're starting to head down the hill, but then you turn right again, you double back, and then you complete the, the sort of remainder of the Grand Prix circuit before turning left, and that's the important part, the Sabine Schmitz curve, where suddenly the track gets narrow, it's luckily being resurfaced, and you do a double left over a bridge, and then you're onto the Nordschleife, and then, it's a totally different track, Snowy. Yeah, effectively do half the Grand Prix circuit, don't we? Uh, loop back um, and you say, get the last one at that run up to uh, the Nordschleife. And nothing can prepare you for the change between the modern Grand Prix circuit, um, lots of runoff areas, you know, barriers, you need some binoculars to go and see them because there's so much grass in between them. And then you get to the uh, aptly named Sabine Schmitz curve. Uh, where it is a hairpin back, and there is there is no runoff area, there's nothing. There is a white line. And guess what's next to the white line? The barrier. So you suddenly have to focus. It's an absolute funnel, pinch point, and it, there's nothing else can prepare you more mentally for going on to Nordschleife. It's a corner like that. So, A, it's so beautifully now named uh, after Sabine Schmidt, absolutely as it should be. Um, but that's where you start. You go out of that bit. And we saw in the last race, uh, I think the Manti Porsche had a, a moment with a, with a Clio that was taking a fairly wide line in, going over to the right-hand side, to cut back to take the apex. As we've said many times, he's doing his own race, the Clio. Um, didn't quite see Grello, the one car on the track, I'm not sure how you could not see, given its colour scheme, and hence it's called Grello. But they nipped up the inside, and there was a moment where, mercifully, the Clio did see it, and both backed out of it for a moment, at the tightest part of the circuit, for the most opposed cars you couldn't imagine, a basic Renault Clio and a full 911 Porsche Manti. And they sort of just stopped for a minute, well, didn't stop, but they, stopped taking their lines and got through it and shop and take a breath and reset and off you go and there you go down through hats and back and away you go but e even if you're racing on your own nobody immediately in front mm. nobody immediately behind it is still a sharp intake of breath even if it's a subconscious one so breathing becomes a little bit more constricted once you've got through the, the initial twisters and then it it sort of starts to open out after Kittelbacher and going towards Flintplatz. You can breathe a bit more easily, but that first moment where it's, it's, you know, it's a constriction. No two ways about it. But it does set the tone for that, for what's about to come. And it, uh, we've seen some extraordinary battles through there. And the, the part, part of the exercise, almost the biggest part of the exercise for these drivers in these top SP9 category GT3 cars is judging where the gap is and not running into it too quickly, trying to not every opportunity finding it and particularly you've got somebody towing right behind you've got to make sure that you can both get through safety because they will try and come through with you and it, it's finding those gaps but if you hesitate you say we say caution we're talking about um crew saying to team drivers sorry teams saying to drivers you know careful no points no this no whatever just always keep the car in one piece so you, you exercise caution the next you know the car behind you jump past you and then you've got all the work to do it's where it's where do you overtake on the north side there there are there are a few places to do it. Uh, some, some people like Kevin Estra tend to use the grass. That's he, one of his favourite places. <laughs> yes, apparently they've, they've tarmacked <laughs> sure. a little bit of the circuit. No one yeah, understanding exactly. why. Um, now, one thing I really need to talk about, because the start is almost upon us, uh, new entries in the, in the top class in particular. There are a lot of them. We've got the number eight team Get Speed Mercedes. That's the one I mentioned earlier. Adam Christodoulou, Mauro Engel and uh, Maximilian Goetz. Racing engineers Audi. 
Hensel and Wustenhagen, the Team Phoenix Audi, they've doubled up. They've got uh, no, no lesser crew than uh, Robin Freitz and Kelvin van der Linde, oh my word. Then the TF Sport Aston Martin, that's starting seventh overall, and that definitely uh, could be taking a tilt for victory. Remember, they won at the end of last year. That's uh, Maxime Martin, David Pittard, Marco Sorensen. Then the Octane 126 Ferrari, uh, no longer with three drivers. I just noticed uh, four drivers. I noticed Luca Ludwig is no longer in the crew this weekend alongside Simon Trummer. Jonathan Hershey and Bjorn Grossman. Then we've got uh, Top Sport WRT. Of course, we're used to them running other makes, but now they've moved to Porsche. And Porsche said, hey, do you want to borrow three works drivers? We'll give you Julian Andlauer, Matt Campbell, and Mattia Jaminet. Uh, the Dynamic Motorsport Porsche, Matteo Corelli, Adrian Deslina, and Thomas Prining. Again, very strong entry. Racing One, the second of the Ferraris joining this weekend. That's uh, the Kohler, Kohlhaas, and Schneider. That's Norbert Schneider. Uh, that's car number 39. Then those two Rover Racing BMWs, the M4 GT3s, with Sean Edwards, uh, Sheldon van der Linde, and Franz Wittmann. And the one on pole position, just the two drivers on board. It's uh, Augusto Farfus and Connor De Filippi. They've come come to play with new entries, also new lineups. The number three Falcon Motorsport Porsche, no longer because they're rotating their drivers uh, ahead of the Nurburgring 24. No longer Patrick Pile and Marco Seafried, but it's. Uh, Evans and uh, Picar uh, Alessio Picariello. The HRT Mercedes, number six. We've got, um, I think, a little driver lineup change there. The Team Phoenix Audi. Uh, we've got Michele Beretta coming in because uh, Ricardo Feller and Kim Lewis Schramm are uh, competing at Osher Slaben this weekend. And finally, Earl Bamberg, Le Mans winner, is replacing Alexandra Imperatori in the number 18 KCMG Porsche. So we had a few teams drop out, but the good news, more teams have come in, more teams than have, have uh, taken this weekend uh, to compete elsewhere. So real mix of drivers and cars uh, on dry conditions. It was nine degrees a short while ago. It may have uh, sneakily, cheekily got up to 10 degrees here, but uh, all looking good. Du magst Sim Racing? Du liebst die Nordschleife? Und du bist zwischen 14 und 18 Jahren alt? Dann mach jetzt mit bei der DNLS Junior Sichtung. Der Sieger startet zusammen mit Mercedes AMG Fahrer Adam Christo Duden in der digitalen Nürburgring Langstreckenserie 2022 und 23. In der Nürburgring Esports Bar kannst du dich jetzt parallel zu jedem NLS Lauf von 13 bis 18 Uhr beim Shootout qualifizieren. Vielleicht bist ja du der nächste Sim Racing Shooting Star. See you then. Jetzt Falkenreifen kaufen und Tankgutschein sichern. 
Weitere Informationen auf tankgutschein.falkenreifen.de Falkenreifen Asphalt Watch. Die ersten Zifferblätter aus echtem Rennstreckenasphalt. Auf dem Asphalt wurden Legenden geboren und magische Momente erlebt. Cobblor. Liebe Fans, besucht unsere Social Media Kanäle von Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter und TikTok. Willkommen zu NLS. travel across months reading through all the notes uh, just for qualifying alone and think how much more excitement happens in the race and how many more incidents uh, occur just there, but the cars are out on their formation lap and one of the glories, not just to look at the Nürburgring from a high angle and see the cars going up the hills, the Caraccioli curve and down again through, through that wonderful bank corner, but the fact there are shadows from the trees, is bright sunshine in the Eiffel Forest. And uh, just think of the little heart rates in all those cars, 160, 153 cars, pit a pat boom, boom, as they go around, oh, round uh, the carousel I would, I would and down. I would tentative suggest they're big heart rates, not little heart rates. Ah, ah. <laughs> Sorry to be a pedant, but... <laughs> no, 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 no. And in many cases, it's what makes their hearts beat at all, I would say, as they go around. But, you know, it is a phenomenal championship. And I'm delighted, you know, having been involved commentating on it for about probably four or five years now, how it's grown and grown. But you know what? It's as though I'm doing it for the first time. Not because... Well, it's just simply the circuit is the star. The drivers are the bit parts in, in, and the cars in so many ways. But 
I've yet to see a dull race on the Nordschleife. I could sit here, because I'm probably a very simple person, and watch the onboard cameras all day, because it just never tires me. Absolutely, and if, if, if motor racing was an art, was there ever a better canvas than this? Thank you, that was Da Vinci. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, just, just brilliant. And in the background, you just suddenly break away and you've got car parks and then you just got the, I love the fact you've just got the, the main road just running alongside the circuit but when you're on the circuit you have no clue it's there and uh, and then you've got that long wonderful run out of Galgenkopf through dotting her it's the run back to the end of the lap but of course you think that's not the end of that really you've got that fabulous sequence of curves the Brems curve uh, you know t uh, effectively we call it a garden because that's what it is a combination of corners that lead onto the start finish straight and if you weren't with us a month ago, that's where the race order didn't change on the final lap. That so hardly sounds like a headline, but it wasn't for want of trying, with young charger Yusuf Vega still a mere 19 at the time, taking on Fred Machiavici, who's almost had as many years in GT3 racing as uh, Yusuf has been alive. And he used that experience to just great effect. It's a great way of putting it, isn't it? Yes. Sorry, sorry, Frederick. <laughs> <laughs> it did put it to great experience. A great, sorry, put experience to great use uh, in NLS one. Yeah, he really did. And uh, but again, it's the circuit, it's the cars, it's the weather, it's the diversity, it's the challenge. We've got four hours of that coming up very, very soon indeed. So looking forward, wishing everyone out there a very, very good race indeed. Sad not to see the um, Falcon Motorsport Porsches. We're waiting to find out. A story as to why they haven't um, come out to play, but of course they're building towards. They race all year in this championship, and uh, Falcon, of course, being a tyre company, and uh, no circuit provides greater tyre testing than the Nurburgring Nordschleife in all with all of its vagaries. But uh, they'll be building towards, and they're building up their team of very experienced Porsche drivers uh, towards the Nurburgring 24 in a month's time. But, uh, the lead, the pace car is just coming through uh, Schwalbenschwanz. Uh, she's going to be on to Golden Cup for them to the Dottinghof in a minute. Where, at Schwalbach, where we've got the um, slow-mo camera this weekend. They've moved it to a different position. It was down at Hatzenbach, I think, for NLS1. Um, and we did set some great images, which we'll, we'll try and describe to you with some extraordinary images of cars of not two, but sometimes almost all four wheels in the air in slow-mo. It is quite extraordinary uh, just to try and explain how that, that looks. I remember when, uh, a good 20 years ago, I was working with Formula 1 TV, and they got ever greater camera angles with slow-mo cameras and just looking at the tires just moving oh, around flexes, yeah just yeah. extraordinary and if you're on camera drivers remember to smile remember look as though you're enjoying yourselves i think that's <laughs> and, not... and wait just yes. uh, add a consideration yes so schwabert uh, if you want to know where that is that is effectively the last really serious corner before you get to galgenkopf that leads you onto the long run back to the pits which is where the cars are now what are they doing it's cool outside it's sunny of course they're snaking around BMW is almost as far as you can see. Well, certainly four of the top five runners. The Interloper is the car that's going to be starting in fourth place overall. It's a Manti Racing uh, Porsche that's broken them up. But on that front row, it's um, one of the two Rover Racing M4 GT3s. That's the one shared by Conor de Filippi and Augusto Farfus. Alongside in black, yellow and red livery, it's Dan Harper, Max Hess and Neil Verhagen. Three drivers who've got a huge amount of racing, huge proportion of their young, burgeoning racing careers here at the Nürburgring Nordschleife. And the third of the BMWs at the front end is uh, Christian Kroniers, Andy Suchek, and Sami Matti Trogan sharing the number 34 car. That's the car entered, one of many entered by Vulcan Horse Motorsport, which doesn't concentrate its entries only on the top class, but they've got uh, BMWs of all sizes and categories down this 100, and, well, let's call it 153 car field because not everybody made that's it through. What it is. That's what it is. That's <laughs> let's, what let's it go. is. I'm with you. I will go with that, Bruce. It could have been 156, but uh, two aren't starting. And as you pointed out, one didn't qualify, which is the racing one Ferrari didn't set a time. I have to see if that gets a start from pit lane. So if we start talking about car number 39, that'll be the racing one Ferrari, but we better not get ahead of ourselves. Two by two behind the foot, the the pace car leading them round. This is the first of the starting groups, and uh, be more than enough on any circuit to have even half of just the lead starting group as your field of cars. So we've got about 50 cars in that group, and then there'll be the 30 second gap, and then we'll have another start, and then the third group of cars will come in again after a half minute delay. So tighten your belts, sharpen your focus. 
And look at the red lights on the starting gantry. The field is about to start. NLS 3. BMWs to the fore. Aston Martin started from seventh. The Porsche making a fairly poor start from number four, but fourth on the grid. And the KTM Crossbow, the, the SPX class car, gaining a position or two, and it's a real gaggle of cars. Four or five abreast, they go past the starting gantry, under the starting gantry, down to the first corner, but the pole starting Rover Racing. BMW just gets through turn one ahead, and then a change of position behind because the Walken Horse Motorsport BMW pulled alongside, got its nose in front of the BMW junior team car. Kahneman, a 25, the first spinner of the race, didn't get in long, will be joining at the back of the pack in the, the class. the Motorsport car. Yeah, that was uh, Joachim, en Joachim Tyson, Enzo and Nico Mensa. We'll pin it on one of them when we get to see that. But uh, the story there was the BMW junior team car getting a little bit muscled out or outthought in many ways, trying to challenge for the lead, found itself on the wrong line, has now been muscled back to fourth place oh, by the Mad Thai Porsche. By the Mad Thai Porsche, if he doesn't watch it, uh, it's going to be having um, a bit of fun from the KTM Crossbow as well. That's the SPX car that's up there and challenging. But if you're in the lead car from Rover Racing, you're laughing because all those behind are battling and you've got your nose in front. But it's BMW, BMW, Porsche, which is the Grello car from Mad Thai Racing, BMW, KTM Crossbow up into fifth place. I think the Aston looked at uh, the TF Sport Aston looked a bit punchy as well at the start coming down the inside by the pit wall but then uh, I think it saw everything going on at the, at the outside there on the two with the Hoover Motorsport board to begin to spin yeah outside the top 10 in fact trying yeah. to find it just, One, gone two, through. Three. just gone through okay so it's lost maybe a place maybe so they again start, started well initially got done but they've got to that first board and and scratch and better part of Valor it's a long race four hours kept out of the way and just let that ball sort of kick off on the outside there so you know not a bad move there I'm not sure who started the Marco Sorensen at the wheel Marco Sorensen, my apologies. Yes, huge amount of there. experience right first three starting to make a little bit of a break which is surprising the BMW junior team car muscled out of uh, second place when it challenged for the lead fell back to third place now back to fourth ah now actually just starting to close up a little bit maybe it's thinking no no get on the tail of the Manti Racing Porsche and certainly the, the crew of Harper Hess and Verhagen, very experienced indeed. And uh, again, we've seen this over the years, haven't we, Peter? That you, it's about having a, th a good three-car driver, like a three-driver lineup uh, uh, in these events. I think uh, Marco Sorensen has actually gone back to where he started, P7. So it's exactly where the same start position. I think he jumped a couple of places at the, at the very start, but by turn one, the same came out of it. So I'm, I'm sure that's in uh, P7. So second group, back to start. KTM crossbows to the four, two of them, but then of course you get uh, cars from the TCR class, a host of Porsche Caymans, and one, two, three, four, five, seventeen. Um, but uh, it's two KTMs leading that group down towards the first corner. They've got clear air between them and those behind the Porsche Cayman fighting for third place with one of the TCR class VWs. Both get shoveled out towards the outside, but a nice, tidyish manoeuvre down into the first corner a bit of dust being kicked up on the inside of the circuit but uh, drives behaving actually marginally better than they were in the top group so well done to them one more group to go meanwhile of course the uh, leading cars are now where are they on the circuit Metzger's felt do I see yes okay so they're, they're, they're... Just got to yes Metzger wants to be Callan hard okay so as you look at your circuit map they're very nearly halfway around it it is quite something that you can have 150 plus cars. Now, race control circuit. message that starting group one, because we're talking about the SB9 category cars, under investigation. You shocked me. To the core. Really? Drivers? Not able to start a race? Under investigation? Surely not. That won't catch on. What is this witchcraft you speak of? No. Wow, those two KTMs in the second group. Just to give you, I said they were easily in the lead when they got down to the first corner. They're about. Ooh, a dozen car lengths clear and they haven't even got towards the Vidal chicane so that's very dominant meanwhile at race control starting group two under investigation well just to let you know that's not because necessarily anything was untoward it's they're all under investigation until proved otherwise it's sort of the reverse of you're all guilty exactly, exactly. <laughs> you're, you're all guilty until we say otherwise yes <laughs> yeah. so again neat and tidy as the second group uh, turn left and left again to the Sabine Schmitz curve onto the Nordschleifer and just waiting for the lead group to get to the, the first timing interval around our timing screens. It is a, a phenomenal um, element here, just having such an enormous gap uh, between the timing segments. And if you if you like your less powerful uh, Renault Clears, BMW 325Is, 
et al. The third group is just coming into the final sweepers of the, of the tier garden complex, I think we'll call it that this weekend. They turn effectively sharp right, sharp left onto the start, finish straight. Eyes all focused on the lights on the starting gantry. The, their safety car, the third of the sort of pace cars, peels into the pit lane. No, at that point, the lights are still red, waiting for them to turn to green. The drivers are accelerating towards them. They can't change position until they go past the lights. The lights go green, and then it's uh, BMWs. As far as the eye can see, effectively, in that group, it's all the 325 eyes at the front. But they're looking quite neat and tidy down into Turn 1. Well, as they go into Turn 1, our leading group come through the Caracciola Carousel, and they'll exit that up to Hoa Act, the aptly named highest part of the circuit, and then back on through the uh, Viverman complex and brunch and, and they'll come back onto and to site fairly shortly but uh, that's that's how far around the lap they are and we just got the third group started so if you just happen to be nipped off to make a coffee or whatever and miss the start of the race it was a clean start from the front of the grid or uh, from the 99 rover racing bmw a challenge from bmw junior team car through the first sequence of corners through turn one towards turn two but at that point they're on the wrong line and the number 35 Walken Horse Motorsport, uh, sorry, 34 Walken Horse Motorsport BMW dived up the inside, but then it wasn't to be their position for long because the Manti Racing Porsche that started from fourth on the grid moved up to third. Front three trying to make a break, but the BMW Junior Team car trying to hang on in the lead of the race. So just waiting as the timing screens uh, get busy. <laughs> not surprising you think how many how much information they've got coming through peter's going to keep an eye on any further warnings at the bottom of his screen but really i'd say apart from the spinning huber racing porsche it's been very very clean at the front of the field and that got going again pretty well and tucked in again behind so all good it's team sorg rensport leading that third group by the way number 504 up at the front of the field, though, it's still the order it was as they went down to hats and back on the opening lap. But uh, it's the 911 in third place, chasing the number 34 BMW in second place. It's the one from one of many from Walken Horse Motorsport. And leading the race, but only by about two car lengths, is the number 99 Rover Racing BMW for, that started from pole position. And the good news for BMW Junior Team, I feared they were starting to be dropped. I then sussed they weren't. And uh, uh, in fact, all of those cars, as they come down through her act, back towards uh, and the dotting of her, back towards the end of the lap, there are effectively two or three car lengths between them as they go down this long straight, trying to pick up a toe. And the lead car goes one way across the circuit, then the other way. And the, the Porsche is the one on the charge. It's suddenly got a fantastic toe from the second place BMW, has got its nose in front, almost take able to take the lead in Tiergarten at that point no no the grass not so good on the opening lap let the grass warm up but uh, the really really promising attack there from Porto what a toe there the cars were looking even 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 in terms of their placing but clearly a little more grunt on to start from straight or maybe just a, an early toe and that Manti Racing Porsche just went past the Porto Horse uh, car as if it was not standing still but not moving very fast at all and nearly nearly got into into the lead having looked down the inside as well is the manti car it's almost squeezed down inside the rover bmw oh and we've got uh, a couple of cars off at that kink we talked about on that's going to be a code 60 on the left hand kink of um her act yeah so her act, sorry they're dotting her dotting right? her falling her, in that apologies. hole and so yeah i saw the huber racing porsche that spun on the opening corner go past and so it's the back end of the lead group so at the end of the opening lap it's Connor de Filippi leading for rover racing by the mighty margin of 0.368 of a second from kevin estra christian cronyas former winner of the spa 24 very good opening lap for him for the number 34 walking horse motorsport bmw crew and then neil verhagen who started uh, of course of the, of the bmw junior team m4 in fourth place uh, tim, tim heineman fifth overall in that SPX uh, class KTM crossbow GT2 and then the second of the Walken Horse Motorsport BMWs that's Ben Tuck completing the top six Earl Bamba up to seventh just ahead of the Asimata which has lost the position overall Marco Sorensen and to complete the top ten Peter because I'm a bit like that Frank Stippler the number five Audi from Phoenix in ninth place just ahead of the second of the Rover Racing BMWs with Franz Wittmann Yes, we've got a first code 60 over at uh, Metzgersfeld, which was for uh, one of the Cup uh, 120, the Cup 2 Porsche GT3 over a VWS Motorsport. And I'm not quite sure why that's about. I'm more concerned about this one on the uh, 
and we're dotting a hoa that uh, only saw a little bit of. Let's see what we've got there. We've got yellow flags all the way along there. It's a, yes, it has become a code 60. It's a Porsche Cup class car. Uh, it's, a, it's a 107, car 107. I think it is, yes. Yeah, there's two There's two cars off the obviously coming here. Now, one's just reversing and getting itself uh, back us on our uh, Rover helicopter cam. You can see that one Porsche has got itself going. One's in the barriers. That one's reversed and rejoined. So it's 107. Big puncture there. So it's 107 is the first one. That's the Team Mantle GT3 car. That's from the yeah, Cup 2 class again, as you say. Mantle, Mantle Racing. So that's looking very uh, finished. It's a uh, left rear tyre missing completely. So whether that's cause and effect, I'm not sure. But you just wonder if a tyre's gone and he's just lost control at the highest part of the circuit and maybe cannon into other people and basically a passenger. Because uh, it doesn't look to be that much damage to the bodywork to have taken the tyre, but tyre is definitely deflated on that. So there's cause or effect. We'll have a look at that one a little bit more when we get some more details. That's going to say code 60, as we predicted, on the uh, dotting hoa. Yeah, the front of you would seem a little bit bunched up as well. And uh, then, right, that's interesting. We just had a change of position because uh, Christian Cronje was out for by Neil Verhagen. They, they were in a slow zone. They suddenly accelerated out of them. But the number 44 car in fourth place is now up into third. He jinked around, got very close to Taylor Verhagen. But uh, driver 44, that's uh, sorry, Neil Verhagen, driver 44, thinking faster on his feet than Christian Cronje's was ahead of him. So having started from second, fallen to fourth, he's now back up to third. But again, we've got yellow flags and almost coming towards another slow slow, and that's probably the one at Arenberg, is it? Coming up in front of them. But uh, yeah. our lead group of cars, they're going to have to stake their way through, and already rescue vehicles are there. Cars possibly on both sides of the circuit at that point, just in front of them. So qualifying was a little bit crazy today. We had incidents already in the race, and this, I always find a certain irony when you so many times they compete on the Nordschleife, and the weather conditions are unbelievably tricky on a tricky circuit, and they get dry conditions, and then they just. Uh, Things sometimes go a little bit awry. So, been a busy opening lap, and we've only really been talking about the lead group of cars thus far, but uh, groups two and group three having to uh, back off as well. Just to confirm, we've got slow zones at Arenberg at the moment. Connor de Filippi leading the race. Just remember, they, they got through ahead of all this trouble to start their second lap. The gap was only a third of a second or so ahead of the Manti Racing Porsche, Kevin Estra at the wheel. So it's Conor de Filippi, Kevin Estra, Christian Cronjes was in third place at the end of lap one, but uh, Neil Verhagen's got the jump on him going out of a slow zone to move his BMW up ahead. But if you're a fan of BMW M4 GT3s, they hit the ground running last year and this year they're really racing. Four of the top six runners here in LLS3 are aboard M4 GT3s. Conor de Filippi in the, in the lead, Christian Cronjes now in fourth place, Neil Verhagen just up to third and uh, the fourth of that group is down in sixth place overall, uh, young British racer Ben Tuck and he's uh, nipping in behind. In fact I sense his pace is enough to start bringing him towards that lead group but he's sitting in behind nee, the true racing KTM crossbow. Sieht auch ein bisschen geknickt aus, was man verstehen kann. Man tritt hier natürlich nicht an, um den Preis zu kriegen für den ersten Ausfall im Rennen. Nick, was ist passiert? So, still slow zones for cars to go in. I was trying to look at which of the Porsches limped back to the pits. We saw 107 Snowy stuck at the side of the circuit with um, rear end damage. Do you think a, a, a rear left tyre had gone? Hey, well, certainly, there was certainly some damage on that corner uh, of the car. Um, it's with the other one. I wasn't able to get eyes on the number. Oh, I think we've got it now. It was white and blue, and it's in the garage. 103 by the 103 by the looks of it, yes. Or what, something three, but 103 black fork and car. Yeah, it could be. And Peter Ludwig, uh, no. Nagels Dieck and uh, Mike Rosenberg. No, I don't think it is 103. It's a Mulner Motorsport crew. So, it's, yeah, the blue and white covers a Mulner Motorsport. So that would make it 1, 2, one, 3. One, two, three. Even easier. In fact, Nick Soleski was the driver, I think, who was just talking to an interviewer down in the pit lane. So he shares with Marcel Hopper. So I don't know if he was the one at the wheel at the time, but uh, clearly the way the car was dragging on the ground as it got going some while after the incident, but uh, did at least get back to the pits. That uh, means that this, if it's reparable, they can go back out and turn it into a test session. Still safety vehicles moving around the circuit. Of course, you need a lot of vehicles to cover a circuit as long as it's 25 kilometers of glory, but uh, you can get away with one or two course vehicles on a, a three, four kilometer circuit, but here they have to have a whole series of them. And also, many is a time 
that you get more than one one instant around a lap as long as this. So they've got to clear up, you know, two, sometimes three, and I think there might have been as many as three on that opening lap. The one that got away with was the Hooper Racing Porsche Car 25, went for a little spin um, down at turn one on the opening lap, but since then has uh, got going. I'm just trying to see how high up the order they are. Mensel's only got up to the 30th position, so he really shared a lot. That's Nico Mensel. Up front, though, the driver's escaping. And it's the 99, Conor de Filippi. BMW entered by Rover Racing. He was uh, nearly just over a third of a second to the good. Ahead of Kevin Estra at the end of the opening lap. But uh, Kevin Estra is the one doing different, as they say in certain certain places he's the Porsche among the BMWs at the front of the field and let's also remember of course we've got a KTM crossbow that was uh, running in fifth place overall so having started qualified so well qualified sixth but the KTM crossbow car orange and black car number 53 having a real go at it we mentioned earlier about Kevin Astrid liking a bit of a pass on the grass uh, and on that first lap there was a little bit of dust being kicked up as he tried to get around and of course it was Mr Estra at the wheel of the Manti what a surprise Yes, I, I sort of it's felt... It's almost a USP if it is, isn't it? Yeah, I know. I, I, I sort of wanted to jump straight in and say it, it clearly must, but his teammates also probably fancied that. Now, slow zones cause problems. There are waved yellow flags as the lead, lead cars are coming <laughs> towards the end of their second lap. They've caught the tail of the back group. We said it would happen in a lap and a half. It took slightly longer because of the wave yellows, and it almost looks as though they're standing. So lights flashing from Conor de Filippi because there's a... A couple of cars from the rear group. They're doing exactly the right speed, but everybody else is bunched up. We can Look have the Kevin top, Astro. top 10 cars covered by 10 seconds, but they're going slowly. They've still got to get to Tiergarten. It's double wave yellows. We know why, because 107 was in the barriers there last time around. They're still trying to tidy it up. Hoyt literally like coiled springs, waiting for that green flag to go. The 107 Porsche being towed back, that's why We've got this incident at the moment. His, uh, there's a little bit of damage on the rear wing, but I, I'm not sure why that car went off in the first place. But 107 is being towed back out of the way. They will clear it, and then it's going to have a race into Tear Garden, Bruce. Well, it's a question. They okay, they've got clear. And who was thinking fastest? It was the it was the BMW junior team car. <laughs> it's had a very good half lap because. Uh, hold on a second. I've just Angry. Kevin Estra we've overtaken into Tear Garden. Yes, no, he he, he jumped. Yeah. As soon as the slow zone, it was very quick gain of position when he cleared the slow zone out to Arenberg. And certainly Neil Verhagen deserves a huge pack on the back. He's done it again later in the lap, and they were released before they got to Tiergarten. He's now got ahead of the Manti Racing Porsche. He's back into second place where he started. He's still behind the car that started on pole position, Conor de Filippi. But that was clever racing. KTM trying to go all the way around the long side at turn one there. Uh, not quite making it, but uh, yeah, Neil Verhagen there, what a great. Great opportunity there, took it. That one caught Kevin Estra napping quite literally, which is a sentence I never thought I'd say. Say it well. again, just for good effect. <laughs> um, you're right, Race Control have decided there's no further action required on any of the starting groups. But They've got two, two, all been good boys. Too many other so things far. to look at. Yes. So, very, very busy at the front, but uh, Conor de Filippi, having been challenged into turn one on the opening lap, hasn't been challenged fully yet, but Neil Verhagen is looking to atone in the second of those BMWs, the yellow, red and black one, and he's uh, really, really pushing on very hard indeed. Right, I'd like to th um, here's news from Falcon Motorsport. Their Porsches have been withdrawn from this weekend's meeting after qualifying. This is due to an insufficient supply of tyres in the optimum compound for the track conditions. Caused, uh, this is shortage caused by the global supply bottleneck for raw materials, of which we're awfully conversant. And of course, their car tyres come from Japan. But uh, Max Cruz Racing, who's competing on uh, in, NLS, in the NLS3 on Falcon tyres, has got the rubber for his cars. But uh, two of the front running cars, not there. But uh, we've got more than enough to be going on with because the lead of the race is a fantastic battle at the moment and as they cross the start finish line after that uh, very clever analysis of what was sitting in front of him uh, we've got uh, Conor de Filippi leading by one second almost on the nose and then a 1.2 seconds back uh, from Neil Verhagen to Kevin Estra in third place so the order has been shuffled but I, I feel that's not the end of it as yet 
and looking further down to see who else is making moves. It's all quite steady. The TF Sport Aston Martin was eighth, is eighth. The KCMG Porsche was seventh in the hands of Neil Bamber, is still in seventh place. Looking to see who's going to be making the clever moves. But looking down the order, we've, of course, the top car in SPX is still being driven brilliantly by Tim Heinemann. And that's kind now, of a hang on, we've got a BMW in the barriers. Oh, that was the one that was running in fourth or fifth place. That yes, it's just nearly being collected by a Porsche that's also gone off at the same place. Is that Christian Cronjes, I think? Yes. Uh, nearly collected, literally, that we talk about these narrow strips of grass that's very dry at the moment, just kicking up the dust, which is what alerted me to it. Uh, looked across, and there was that BMW sitting in the barriers, and the Porsche literally off the track between the BMW. There's about two car widths there, and he managed to find its way through and miss it completely. That could have been uh, catastrophic, but uh, they've got away with that one. Yellow flags at that point. But uh, the BMW looks, uh, I think it might have just parked itself there, actually. Well, there's no incident, there's no tyre marks, nothing indicating it's had an incident to get to that stage. Busy, busy, busy out on the track. Shortly we'll list the corner at which there are not yellow flags. I, I guess, but it's been a busy, busy time. Keeping his nose clean, best, way, best place to do that is at the front of the field. It's Conor De Filippi, the Rover Racing 99 BMW M4 GT3, but he's having a little bit of a hard time getting past one of the tail end 325 eyes that tried to stay out of the way but Connor had already decided he wasn't going that way and uh, again I think we might have a slow zone up ahead we a have. slow zone up ahead so he's got to stay behind it so what we've effectively got we think now the incident uh, before Tiergarten with the 107 Porsche has been cleared just I could scroll down and find out but uh, messages coming thick and fast but around Arenberg still cars off and as they they clear up some they find others elsewhere because certainly that uh, bmw that was well placed in the hands of christian cronius appears to have uh, pulled up to the side of the circuit looking for anybody who didn't qualify well i'm just going to look at the world of mercedes i mean normally right at the front end the top mercedes is down in 14th place patrick assenheimer well, if anyone makes a car, Mercedes go around here well. But he's, he's 14th. Lucas Stoltz down in 16th. The, that's the Team Bilstein car. Yellow and, pale yellow and blue run by Team HRT. And then how the other HRT car in the hands of Philip Ellis is down in 19th. So that is not where you... And Maxi Gotts is down in 21st. That's extraordinary. All ah, right, Peter's going to do some car analysis. We have car... Is that 391? Three, 891. Three, yes, it, it is. That's in, that's in the gravel. But just before we do that, we've got... Um, uh, that those two Porsches earlier, 123 and 107, that's being under investigation now. So that is a, a little punch to what might have caused that. They've obviously had that coming together. That was on the left-hand kink of the dotting hoe that kept caused the first Code 60, and that's still in operation. Yeah, still a rescue vehicle there. No, sorry, I just said car 891 and moved off. I should have said that's the Hofer Racing by Bob Motorsport BMW M2 CS Racing entry of Felix Partle, Max Partle. Michael Mayer, but they're stuck in the gravel. I think in fairness, you quoted the number and I interrupted and changed the line, so my apologies. Well, for my eyes to be able to spot a car number, it's, it's quite an achievement. Well, frankly. absolutely, you want to be credited when you do, don't you? Especially if you got the right number. <laughs> always, always a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> car 1006. Uh, not in this race. They go All reporting, not, not investigative not journalism. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Guess the number yourself. So, yeah, I, I did start saying I'd look down the classes. So, we talked about SP9 Pro. Oh, pro, Pro, Pro. In fact, the top SP9 car that's not in Pro is the Pro Am entry, which is the Hooper Motorsport Porsche that spun on the turn one. That's down in 27th position. So, that's picking up ground. Top car in Cup 2 is several places higher, the 22nd position overall. And that's the, the Porsche 911 GT3 Cup class. Uh, car 120. And that should be. Tim Shearbart in that, and he's not got a huge margin of uh, over Moritz Krantz in the Kramer Racing, K Kramer Racing example, just, uh, just 0.685 of a second. 976 Porsche is leading in the Cup 3 class for, for Caymans, GT4 class Caymans. And uh, 976 is being, it's driven by Jens Motorfint, Moritz Oberheimer, and Torsten Volta. Small advantage on the top of that class. Very small advantage, in fact, almost nose to tail. Up front, though, really a place you want to put your camera is in the car that's running in second place because it's getting closer and closer to the car in the lead of the race. It's BMW M4 GT3 chasing BMW M4 GT3 and uh, Conor De Filippi. The American racer who's been tied to BMW for a very long time. No stranger to Nürburgring. He's being pushed very hard by fellow American racer Neil Verhagen. 
in the BMW Junior Team entry. So just a very quick update on the uh, what some of the causes of slow zones are as they're being upgraded now at Flugplatz, Schwedenkreuz as well. It's got I'm upgraded from about 122 at 60. Uh, and yeah, the car at uh, Flugplatz is the number 35. Oh, 35, not 34. So Correct, it's not 35 BMW, which had Ben Tuck at the wheel of that. Ah. And that, that's why that's off there. It's crashed at Flugplatz. That has been confirmed. And the... Arenberg car is car 891, which is the Hoffer Racing by Bonk Motorsport M2CS from the M2CS um, class, aptly named. Yes, they're good like that. It's clever, isn't it? It's very Germanic. Works. So that's why we've got those code 60s. So again, we'd like to see what happened in the in the Ben Tuck incident. You, I think you caught some form of sight of it, but I must confess I was looking at a timing screen and didn't. But you probably caught the end of the story rather than the front end. I, I, I fear so, yes. But it's uh, it, always wary of speculating. Uh, but it's just parked and something. It's also parked very close to the barrier and tidily. And, and tidily, but um, also being a left-hand drive car, it's not the easiest way to get out of it, is it? Um, but I guess you can exit from the other side. Probably not that easily, to be honest. Still a slow zone on the long run from Dottinger Her before they get to the bridge that's just before the kink. They're still clearing up the incident. Can't be much longer, well, but again and again, that group has to close right up. It's got to be barrier repairs, Bruce, hasn't yeah. it? Because the, the cars are cleared out of the way, so we did see the one on the right. So this is, there's a go under the bridge, under that kink. That's where the 107, I think it was, that was 90 degrees to the track, managed to reverse itself out, no apparent damage, uh, and then reverse itself out, and then get itself back to the pits, albeit very slowly, significantly reduced speed, uh, but it was the other car on the other side, 123, that had done the, the bigger damage, um, was it the other way around, 123, 107, wasn't it? And that's back in the pits. So both both got back to the pits one way or the other, but yeah. there must be some damage to the barriers on the right that's taking a, a, a while to, to sort out. Yes, and again, we'd like to see the front end of the, because certainly the, the Mulner Motorsport Porsche that limped away. Uh, one, two, three was um, was dragging on the ground. Whether that's just punctured tyres, I think bodywork was rubbing as well. So the field is released yet again after the slow zone, and yet again Neil Verhagen runs very deep into turn one. It doesn't give him an advantage at all as he tries to catch Connor the Felipe in this inter Nissan battle between BMWs. It's the BMW Junior team chasing after Rover Racing. Uh, Renault Clio stays very nicely out of the way between the second and third turns, but as they go in the sort of switchback that's turn three and four, Porsche came in very gently moves to the side of the circuit and goes beyond, beyond the call. And uh, now it's very busy out of the track. The first two trying to make an escape. Kevin Estra has actually been jumped by... So where is he in the background? It's just tricky, he hasn't gone into the pits. No, he's fallen back behind the KTM. The KTM is now up into third place overall. Kevin Estra, has he been caught out on another restart? Didn't quite spot that, but... Um... No, he had to be actually um, a good spot for his but I'd already seen that he was there. He dropped down, he was challenging for the lead. I he was that close in second, just half a lap ago. I appreciate half a lap around here is 12 more kilometres, four minutes, I grant you. Uh, but he was challenging for that position. He's now dropped down to not third, but fourth. So um, uh, the man type Porsche with Kevin Estra at the moment, going backwards by relative terms. I think he just likes a challenge, frankly. But for, for KTM Crossbow and for the number 53 team from True Racing, you know, we know in terms of pace they've been getting closer and closer to the front end of the field, but this is... This is their day of day at the moment. So up to the start is sick. That was a, a big fanfare, a blow of the trumpet, but uh, they moved up to fifth, fourth. Fourth, not good enough. Let's try third. Who'd you pass? The royal family of the Nürburgring Landstrecken series, a Manti Racing Porsche, here at the Nürburgring with Kevin Estra on board. Short that one up. <laughs> That's one for the grandchildren, isn't it? <laughs> oh, not that one again, Grandpa. <laughs> exactly. So, a little bit of a gap. It's a second and a 1.4 seconds, nearly a second and a half back from Bahagan in second place as he chases off after Conor de Felipe back to, to the SPX class KTM GT2. Tim Heineman on board, so Tim really enjoying himself. And then Kevin Estro across the start finish line, not only not in third but down in fourth, but he had nearly a four and a half second deficit over Tim Heinem in the crossbow, so a little hard to work that one out, what, why he's fallen back that far. We'll keep an eye on that. Cup 2 class car, just uh, looking down to see, it's still 112, challenging 120. There's Moritz Kranz pushing Tim Shearbart. 
just a, a quarter of a second between them and I, I sense there could be more changes and our lead group into another slow zone it's, um, those doing the second stint will be thinking I really do hope we get fewer slow zones but slow zones are here for a reason it's so cars can be cleared well we've still got those slow zones at uh, Flugpatz and uh, Metzgersfeld but we do have it clear at Dottingerhoa now so that's going to to, to the relief of those leading cars and uh, certainly Mr Kevin Estra that's one of his favourite places to um, to overtake usually using a bit of the green stuff as we've said he does indeed I'm just, drive, is he? I'm just going to give you a little Glickenhaus update of course they're running in the SPX class they're normally at the very front end of that class but of course with the best of that class being up in third place overall uh, now yes third place overall true, true racing with their KTM in the hands of Tim Heinemann I have scrolled down to 16th place on the timing screens for the Pay Fernandez Lazer is the driver who got to start the Glickenhaus and he's in 16 but some distance behind the dynamic Porsche but no disgrace in that dynamic motorsport Italian Porsche team have had a very good last three years or so and a very very strong lineup in that and the fact that uh, he's got works racer Matteo Caroli at the wheel shows it's a very serious attempt but it's the story of the race so far apart from Peter having Quite a few little incidents out on circuit. Nothing too serious so far, thank goodness. But it's been the story of the restarts. There's a car parking parked uh, in the middle of the track. What's, no, it's facing just the right way. Intervention vehicle just oh, is it? Okay. Jauntily tilted to the right just to sort of guide people across to the right hand side of the track because there's two uh, recovery vehicles there getting that BMW out of the gravel. So I think it's just a, a suggestion of Stra like no. air traffic control. So just move that way. Yes. A little bit. At least they do it, unlike on motorways, they don't do it four kilometres before the incident. There, it's just on the lead into a tight right-hand corner, and the, the restart happens. And have we had a change of position in front? No, we... Just having a little look. Have we had... Is it BMW Junior Team car? OK, waiting for a clearer shot as, as, the, as the lead group uh, break away. God, you've got... You cannot... The big problem is they can't see very much further up the track. <laughs> There could be another slow zone up ahead, but uh, it looks like Rover Racing got it got it right on that restart there, and have actually opened out a margin. Uh, but into another code sixty. Into another code sixty. They're behind another. They're behind an Audi, which must be about a lap down because it's also an SP9 class car, and certainly no Audi's been at the front end of this field. Um, trying to look at who might be a lap down, but it's quick, quick, slow, and um, very frustrating for those. It was looking like a really great four-car battle at the front of the field with the three BMWs and the Manti Racing Porsche. That's been broken up. Manti Racing car falling back through the pack, and we're just trying to get a handle on why that has happened. Meanwhile, at other points around the circuit, racing is going on at full speed. I can report the car's going down. The long run through the Dottingerhoa can now race through the kink before Tiergarten. The kink that uh, the kink that had uh, had all the uh, damage to the barriers that is now cleared up. So the end of the lap, the last sequence of four or five corners at the end of that long straight, are now clear for racing. That's very very good news indeed. So let's see. The group, of course, should be fairly compressed, and uh, cars already starting to dive into the pits. Is it coffee time already? 11:32. That's only half an hour into the race, so that's an interesting way of dividing it up. But, of course, uh, we've talked about this year in, year out, Snowy, that um, you have to keep right on your toes as team manager on the Nordschleife. A four-hour race should be nice, simple. Pit stop on the top of the hour, on the top of the hour, on the top of the hour, and out. But uh, barring damage, we don't want to see you in the pits. But here, certainly two Porsche Cabers coming through. Almost look as though they are going to pit stops. I thought they were coming in for drive-through penalties for a second there. It looks like we've lost one of the Athens. It's not the TF Sport one, but it's the... Um the other entry, the number 17, the Pro Sport racing entry. Matt's mean Dumre or Jean Glorieux. Jean Glorieux at the wheel. And that looks like it's stopped at uh, Metzgersfeld, which might be the reason for the Code 60 there. OK, it's a good spot. I, was, I saw a car there and I couldn't quite work it out. The camera's moved on. Yeah, it's parked on the left hand side, so I'm hoping it's a, it's a mechanical and not a, not a big, but that's certainly the cause for the Code 60 at uh, Metzgersfeld. Thanks very much, Snowy. So many things to look for here. And um, just actually what I'm looking for is a point at which the track is clear and we can go full, full racing. And certainly there are great bunches of cars in the SP9 class uh, down the order, uh, having really, really good scraps at the moment. But if you're a fan of BMW, it's looking very good indeed. Uh, two BMWs separated by seven tenths of a second at the start of this lap, a whisker under, if anything. But uh, that's uh, Connor De Filippi from fellow American racer, the BMW junior team driver, Neil Bahagan. 
the big story is uh, what's going to happen behind it. We're going to have Christian Conyers now moving ahead of Kevin Estra because Conyers fell back to fifth place. I mistakenly thought he his was the BMW that went off uh, about two or three laps ago, but that was Ben Tuck, the young British racer, whose race was spiked. So Cronjers, the Norwegian driver, is fifth overall behind Kevin Estra's Banta Racing Porsche, which is behind Tim Heinemann's surprise package. We know around a qualifying lap could be quick, but in across a four-hour race, let's see, is this going to be the best result ever for true racing with their KTM crossbow? Tim Heinemann in third overall. Yeah, qualifying times were a little bit um, uh, slower this morning. Of course, uh, P1 was at 8.57. 7.57. 7.57, my apologies. That an 8.57 would be very slow, wouldn't it? Yes. A yeah. 7.57, thank you. Um, across the test, well done. Uh, whereas they were seven seconds quicker than that in round one. We were kind of doing a, um, a 7 minute 50. Yeah, I hold position in round one. I think there were just a few too many incidents yeah. that would have had, you know, uh, yellow flags, and obviously that has its own process. But, you know, I honestly thought, oh, but rather patronisingly, going, oh, look, the KTM crossbow has qualified in sixth place. You know, Good around a qualifying lap, but what can it do over the four hours? But it, uh, it's gone the opposite way. It's not gone backwards. It's gone forwards up to third. So um, there are still well yellow flags waved around the circuit. I look across. Actually, Snowy's got so many screens in front of me. His little phone has got to wave yellow flags for everything. Sometimes you can get information overkill. But what all you need to know at this race, in the race at the moment, uh, coming down dotting a her. And then up the rise I'll towards just feed the end it to of the straight. That's, yeah, that's, that's good. It's very kind of you. Conor de Felipe, Neil Verhagen. And then nobody. Tim Heinemann in the KTM crossbow, at the start of that was 1.4 seconds down, but they've obviously made the most of a slow zone and, and, and read it and got the right side of one. And also around this lap, we said this before, we'll say it again, a slow zone can come just in front of your group and uh, you get caught by it, but those behind may not have it at all. But in this case, the first and second place BMW seem to have got clear ahead of a slow zone and they are certainly making hay while the sun is shining. They're going to be covered by under a second as they cross the start-finish line. And the shot is a long one from Turn 1, looking back over the crest of the start-finish straight, and the Grello Porsche is next in view, but it must be, ooh, eight, ten seconds back behind them. They're covered by 0.55 of a second. That's the Felipe from Neil Verhagen. And what's the gap? 9.7 seconds back to Kevin Estra in third, who's got Tim Heinemann half a second behind. So they've changed position on that run to the end of the lap and the Manti Racing Porsche. Don't forget, on the opening lap was the one that was so good down that straight and jumped from third to second. And whatever was untoward, Kevin Estra is going to have to be making up. Looks like he's already started on that project. It certainly does. Uh, your guess of 8 to 10 seconds, 9.7. Pretty spot on. You've done this before, haven't you? I gave quite a mo wide mark <laughs> with like two or three days. Spread betting. Yes. <laughs> Fastest lap of the race is still that uh, leading car, the number 99 uh, BMW. The Felipe at the wheel, that's on an 807.1. And uh, second fastest is Neil Mahal, literally a second behind, so that's all there is in it. Um, Kevin Estra has just set a 807.5. The Tim Heinemann in the SBX category. Crossbow that's running now was in third, now down to fourth. Kevin Estra just. Uh, Nicks that one back. Uh, Brad, that one's at uh, 809.3. Right, Ferrari fans, we've had a bit of a dearth of Ferraris and uh, we expected two in this race. Haven't checked yet. Down to the bottom, see if Racing 1 did get to start, but the, the Octane 126 car is in the thick of a very good battle at the moment. And um, Jonathan Hershey, 13th overall, being challenged by the driver who knows this circuit almost better than anyone else, Lucas Stoltz, Mercedes worth driver for so long. But it's the Ferrari ahead and the yellow and blue. Mercedes just tucked in behind, and their target is, well, Patrick Assenheimer, who's about two seconds ahead of them, and who's leading, who's chasing them. Who is chasing them? Indeed, it's uh, Stolz, it's Matteo Caroli. Yes, the, the blue and white nose, the blue, white, and black nose of his dynamic motorsport Porsche. But they're having a really good scrap there, and uh, great to see a Ferrari in the mix. They've always been popular here on the Nordschleifer in their many iterations over the decades very positively uh, as they go to the Sabine Schmitz curve and Luke Stoltz has to hang back a little bit and just think where he can get past Jonathan Hershey but for now I need to wait but all along if he feels his, his, he's losing time it's going to be a little bit frustrating he's lost a little bit more at Hanson back as well you can't predict where the back markers are going to be but uh, pour into the corner but very good out of it so in fact uh, he sort of uh, equalised the incident and the situation but now 
as they go towards Flugplatz, another twist and turn, but then they'll get the run towards Flugplatz, the Mercedes right under the rear wing of the Octane 126 Ferrari, which I think looks fantastic, Peter, in the black uh, livery with the orange stripe up over the nose, the roof, and down to the tail. Well, it was a star, wasn't it, uh, last year at one point? Um, mm. In fact, even winning a race outright on the road, and unfortunately being disqualified for using... Uh, was it, it was a compound tyre that wasn't on the approved list or something strange, wasn't it? I was, I was halfway home by yeah. then. Well, I know. No comment. It's a very long, very long drive. So, Conor de Filippi leaving by half a second at the front of the field, and uh, Kevin Estra will be a little bit frustrated, not only to be in third, but to be nearly 10 seconds down on that lead duo. What can he do? Where will the traffic fall in front of him? That, of course, is the eternal question. Just looking at the pace of the Aston Martin at the moment, last time at Buffalo. OK, here's an example of how a slow zone can hurt you. Best pace of the Aston Martin from TF Sport, Marco Sorensen, 8 minutes 11. That's four seconds, four and a bit seconds, four and a third seconds down the fastest half of the race set by Conor Felipe. This is the salient point, though. The last lap for Marco Sorensen, now down in ninth position, had been eight, has been passed by the Rover Racing 98. The sister car to the race leader was 10 minutes and 14 seconds. And that makes it 26 seconds slower than Conor de Filippi managed. Conor de Filippi and Neil Verhagen, the first two BMWs, the two cars fighting over the lead of this race, came up trumps in all those slow zones. They obviously just fell in front of them at the right way. And that is a huge, huge helping hand. It may equally easily go the other way and further slow zones, if they do manifest, manifest themselves. But uh, certainly the lead duo, that is why they've got that huge advantage at the front of the race. One of the most famous liveries in the race, or one of the most seen on the global scene, is the sort of acid yellowy green and blue livery that uh, has been used by Tracy Crone for so long, sharing this weekend in the Porsche Cup class car, car number 101, with his longtime racing companion, Nicholas Jonsson, the, the Swede, who was uh, one of the front runners in Formula 3 about 30 years ago. But... Uh, working well together and uh, good to see that colour out here of course that that livery has been seen at Le Mans and in the IMSA series for for so many years and uh, Tracy Crone I'm a, an oil man from Texas still loves his racing is there anything else you can do in Texas than oil let's see sell things to people who got lots of oil I don't exactly. know. I know. Yeah. yes it's um certainly if ever you go Ever you just happen to find yourself in Houston, I advise you to go on a little tour around a, a suburb called River Oaks, unless my mind is playing tricks on me, and you go, gosh, that's a big house. Oh, my gosh, that house is even bigger. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, there's a Louis, Louis Cattles Chateau. And then you go, oh, look, Tudor England on that one. Oh, no, that's embarrassing. Another Louis Cattles Chateau. Versailles moves to Texas, but it is jaw-dropping. But um, you know, it's just an example of uh, where the oil barons live. And, you know, we like to live vicariously. Go and take a look. Just have uh, been treated some uh, some footage here of one of the um, C2 M M2 BMWs, M250. Uh, so absolutely pure white, black wheels, and a number board on the side. Absolutely nothing on the left-hand side. Not a decal other than required. As the camera turns around, the car goes the other side. The other side is completely liveried. So it's obviously half sponsored. So the right-hand side sponsored, the left-hand isn't. Well, that's actually quite a good deal, isn't it? You say uh, say to your sponsor, right, if you put some more money, you can have the other side. Exactly. Yeah. And the, or, or else you ordered how many sets of stickers? Classify that <laughs> selling space. Yes. <laughs> but actually, you know, in many ways, seeing a car racing unliveried in this is, is not unusual because, of course, particularly the cars at the back of the field, people can afford to run them out of their own pocket. And the BMW M2 CS Racing Cup class has been an absolute exemplar of that. And those, those competing with... 325i's and even, even some of the people in Porsche Caymans they can do it out of their own pocket and they get great racing in fact as I say that look at the screen three cars going down dotting her they were nose to tail then they were side by side in fact little change of order the, 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 the car that's, that's, that's yeah. third becomes second and has a very good run but they've got to tear guard and hasn't got to move down onto the car in the lead I'm just going to pick out who, which ones they are for you but uh, the Cayman Cup class in GT4 is is a really really well supported. Worked out if it's the second best supported 
uh, class in the whole race, but always really, really well represented. Cup three. In fact, they've got 16 cars this weekend, so no wonder there are so many of them so close together. And unfortunately, one car, the... the What's well, a 270? That's the Toyota uh, GT86 uh, from the SP3 class proof from uh, Pit Lane and AMEC Sankt with Motorsport. And that's uh, looked undamaged, but facing, facing the wrong way on a very narrow bit of track. So I'm guessing, given that it's got uh, appears... Oh, no, there is damage to it. It has had to connect to the barriers quite hard. Uh, sadly, I was going to say, I thought perhaps it just spun and stopped and beat itself. But unfortunately... Uh, ever optimistic side um, has been disproven there uh, so the number 270 looks like it won't be taking part in the race but on the narrowest parts of the circuit there just to be to be stopped at the moment which is at uh Du magst Sim Racing? Du liebst die Nordschleife und du bist zwischen 14 und 18 Jahren alt? Dann mach jetzt mit bei der DNLS Junior Sichtung. Der Sieger startet zusammen mit Mercedes AMG Fahrer Adam Christo Dugan in der digitalen Nürburgring Langstreckenserie 2022 und 23. In der Nürburgring Esports Bar kannst du dich jetzt parallel zu jedem NLS Lauf von 13 bis 18 Uhr beim Shootout qualifizieren. Vielleicht bist ja du der nächste Sim Racing Shooting Star. See you then. Jetzt Falkenreifen kaufen und Tankgutschein sichern. Weitere Informationen auf tankgutschein.falkenreifen.de Falkenreifen First, Asphalt Watch. Die ersten Zifferblätter aus echtem Rennstreckenasphalt. Auf dem Asphalt wurden Legenden geboren und magische Momente erlebt. Koblor. Direkt 
Neben einer der legendärsten Rennstrecken der Welt baut die Hubert Haupt Immobilien Holding einen neuen Premium-Gewerbestandort für anspruchsvolle Motorsport- und Automotive-Unternehmen. Sichern Sie sich jetzt Ihren Platz auf der Pole Position. Liebe Fans, besucht unsere Social Media Kanäle auf Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter und TikTok. Willkommen zu NLS. see the gap between first and second between Conor de Filippi and Neil Verhagen. It was 0.59 of a second. And now it's Hatzenbach, the track is clear, Whipperman, track clear, Esbach as well. So a lot of places are being shown green flags, which is very, very encouraging. So we've had a little bit of a stop, not stop start racing, stop, slow down, not stop at all, just slow down racing and pay attention racing. But now hopefully we can get Clear, clear running, but uh, to reiterate, oh, now we've got a little, a little moment to report that's good for all of us because uh, Kevin Estro had fallen nearly 10 seconds back in third place. He was only 2.7 seconds back, 2.8 seconds back last time around, so he got to work the, the slower zones, uh, make up the deficit of those slower zones. Precisely, exactly what you should be doing. Uh, Pay it to your advantage. His last lap being uh, 9 and 4. Compared to the 911s, the two people say Porsche to the 911s, the two BMWs doing a 911. It's a, it's a brand awareness, though. Come on, give yeah. it yes, through give and it through. <laughs> well, okay, so where he lost eight or nine seconds, he's regained seven, and that's almost four squares. So let's see what sort of lap pace he can do this time around. Still the fastest lap of the race, Connor de Filippi, eight minutes to seven point one. Point lap route is seven three seconds. That's the point. There's no nowhere on tyres taking anything out to do that. It's the three seconds. Judicious use of the safety car. It must also be said, though, that uh, Tim Heinemann, who Sorry, the slow he no, deposed, the yeah, no, no, um, is uh, he was four seconds slower than Estra last time. So that's mm. Estra also. There is a little element he's taking out of his tyres because he, he's decided he had to close the gap. He's really, really pushed. He was the fastest driver on the track last time. Marcus Sorensen was the only other driver close to him in seventh place overall in terms of uh, lap and pace. But now we'll get to see the true story of this stint. But don't forget, um, getting towards the point at which they will be coming in, I would suggest a lot will be diving in next time around. We've had four cars from the front running group um, running into the pits last time around with just five laps on the board. We might get some coming in after six, but I think we're going to have most of the front runners coming in after seven laps overall. which is the tradition on a tri dry track here. Of course, they won't have had as... It would take longer to do that first run of seven laps because simply they've had those slower zones 
to endure. TCR class, it's covered by next to nothing. 8.11 and 8.01, door handle to door handle. Two Audi RS3s going Centrally, through yeah. the Grand Prix loop and a, a really great battle. 8.11, shared by two drivers who don't want to give us their full names. It's Max Cruz Racing entering at Audi. It's Peter Hansen, Burton Commons. Sharon with Lars Nielsen, Burton Commons. Whereas they're in the 8.01 crew with whom they're fighting, the Muller Bill Motorsport crew, they have their real names. Hakon Scheren, Kenneth Oswald, Anders Lindstad. While all that was going on, they've been around five further corners, door handle to door handle, but uh, great battle up to the Renault chicane. They get on oh, one way, on it the other, but uh, these, are, these are TCR cars that just handle so well, Peter. They look so light on their toes. They do, and they're great fun to drive as well. And they're a serious piece of kit as well. As you say, we, uh, we're, we're guilty sometimes of focusing on the... Uh, GT3 cars, it's been country because they're the most glorious ones at the top of the field there. But uh, these cars are uh, just as big racing cars in terms of set out, sorted out. What a, now we've got our. Exactly, the, the front runners have now then. come in after six, but Connor de Filippi has decided to listen to me. He stayed out for another lap. He's going to go for seven. But uh, Kevin Estra has stayed out, but uh, Neil Verhagen came in, Christian Kronjes, Tim Heinemann, and Earl Bamber. So effectively, Porsche that was third is now up into second and the race leading car is still out there but it's been a big dive into the pits so just to reiterate 44 is in that's Neil Behagen 34 that's Christian Kronjes in his BMW Tim Heinemann number 53 the KTM crossbow that rose as high as third place overall and Earl Bamber also in the pits in the number 18 Porsche from KCMG so a real flurry and many of those behind as well car number 27 uh, another Porsche that's um, Matt Campbell, the top sport, WRT entry, etc., etc. It's really easier at this point to list those that have continued out on the circuit. And that's a very short list of the cars at the front of the field. It's 99, which is uh, Conor de Filippi, Kevin Estra, the 911 Manti Racing Porsche, and the Aston Martin, Marco Sorensen, will now go up into third position overall for TF Sport. The pits are crowded, the track actually for once is fairly clear. So is Kevin Estra in the Mantai Grello, going to take this opportunity. He used the code 60 to take seven seconds out of that gap. We saw we talked about that. Is he going to try and put a, a flying lap in now? Capitalise on his best of the race so far is indeed uh, the second fastest lap of the race, an 8.07.542, uh, the fastest lap being uh, De Filippo, the race leader, on a 7, 8.07.1. Right, this happens from time to time when you get a code 60 and your driver isn't quite on it. Was that car number 420? I just saw penalised on the screen. Yes. OK, well, a, a, a 45 second for not adhering to... I can't find 420. Anyhow, uh, not adhering to code 60 you know, uh, protocol. It's almost seconds for being wacko in the head, so that uh, certainly is something uh, well something worth about. observing. 420s is yeah, the uh, four uh, motors uh, by a concept. Uh, ah, yes, uh, class of its own. Sorry, I was looking at that. Yeah, that's why I couldn't find it. Yes, because uh, we get our entry list listed because, according to class. And the the four, 400 track, numbers are normally very, very in the, well, the one of the production classes, the VLN V6 class, which is Porsche Caymans, Porsche 911s. Yes, class of its I'll do the details, you just make it good. Let's go, let's go. The track right now is. Good opening stint there from Neil Verhagen, who's uh, out uh, talking about uh, chasing after race leader and uh, fellow American Connor de Felipe smiles all the way, but his BMW junior team car is now out of his hands, but it's been very much a BMW sort of day with really Manti racing and potentially the TF Sport Aston Martin, the two that could possibly uh, start to change all that and challenge the BMW's big day. The 53. Then Max will finish the race. KTM crossbow okay. into the pits, out of the pits after six laps. It looks fantastic. If you get used to the KTM crossbow looking a little bit uh, sort of short and blunt of nose, in the GT2 format, a much prettier, more angular front and sort of more sculpted wings. They're slab sided now, as I say, destroying the work of the original designer. But uh, certainly always been a popular car, but the GT2 car now not just looks good, but goes very well indeed. Don't forget that. Started sixth, got up to third position. No, not, didn't just get up to third position, overtook the Grello Manti Racing Porsche, which is uh, three three pats on the back for the driver. Dan Harper has taken over the uh, pizza back to some housework for us, which is going to tell us who has changed uh, in the driver orders. But I can tell you, Dan Harper has taken over the BMW junior team 
entry that was, uh, came in from second place. That means Max Hess, the German racer, will do the third stint. Andy Suchek has taken over the number 34 Hawk and Horse Motorsports uh, BMW that uh, driven so well in the opening stint by Christian Kronjes. And Mad Siljahau, Norwegian racer, has taken over the KTM from number 53 from Tim Heinemann. So that's the one that's been so well placed. Josh Burden has taken over the KCMG Porsche. That's car number 18. Marcus Sorensen is still there. Mathieu Jaminet has hopped into the number 27 Top Sport WRT Porsche. When when teams change their manufacturer just after you got used to them running one, it's going to lead to a few mistakes. But Top Sport WRT, worth reiterating that running uh, a Porsche are doing so very well. That's a team from just around the corner in Kittelbach. They've obviously looked and learnt and uh, listened to what uh, anti racing has been doing over the years with their. Porsche that's been such a staple, not just a staple of the series, but also a staple at the very front end, Peter. It's had phenomenal success. It has. I'm just, I'm just looking at the Audi of Christian. Is it Christian Kolb in the 25 Audi? No. 25 or 35? 25. That's a, a Porsche from Huber. That was our, our spinner. Number five. My apologies. Ah. My number five. Sorry. Yeah, he's taken over from Frank Stippler. That's yeah, the difficult. Yeah, that's team. Cool. Vincent Cole taking over from uh, Frank Stippler. Obviously, with uh, a two-driver lineup, it's quite simple. You do stint one and three, I do stint two and four. It does make it a lot easier. It certainly does. Now, it's about picking a way through traffic, not just after a lap and a half when you catch the, the slowest cars in the third group of cars, but throughout the race, Peter. And, um, Conor De Filippi will be coming in this time around after seven laps. He has an advantage from the start finish line of six and a half seconds over Kevin Esper, who moved up into second place uh, when the BMW Junior Team M4 made its pit stop. But uh, every corner where there's a car up ahead, and it is almost every second corner, you've got to just be sure they've seen you. And actually, a little bit of time lost there by Conor De Filippi. And again, oh, he's had not had a good run of cars in front of him. He's got four in front of him. He's been blocked by two of the three he's got past so far. But again, of course, that story has to be repeated by Kevin Estra. We'll be coming up on them within about the next five or six corners. It's just so difficult when you when you watch these events and you see the driver in front is either minding their own business or looking in the mirrors and they can sort of think, well, I'd like to let you through, but I've got to do the corner myself. And uh, that's where the experience really, really comes off not just for the driver who's trying to make, get out of the way or the driver trying to overtake, but it's about just sort of interpreting and feeling is that body language of their car in front? Are they definitely fully aware I'm behind the Peter? Well, absolutely. You do have uh, a huge spread of driver experience uh, in this. Not a, I'm not going to say ability because that's different because there's a, the organising body have this uh, structure, don't they, of the with the ring license that you you can't just join for another a, ma a major series, and you know, so an F1 driver can't decide to come and do a weekend here and jump in without having done the whole process. It doesn't matter whether you're a world champion or F1 or Le Mans or something. Doesn't matter how well you um, show yourself in your own series, domestic series, whatever it may be. You can't just come and do this. Uh, you have to do this this category, this uh, testing. So it, that. All the drivers, therefore, should be aware. So th that's something to bear in mind. But there is always that possibility. We saw it to say that last race, the little Clio going onto the north side through the speed bit curve. Absolutely right, taking his line, and the Manti Porsche straight behind him. It's like, oh, who, whose corner is it? Yeah, you do, do you act? Do you keep out of the way and stay right and let the leading car through? But it's also racing because they're leaving their class into the pits now. Well, I think is that our race leader? Is that it is. Felipe in? Yes, he is into the pits, right up behind one of the. And the 911 follows him in as well, expected. Yes. So that's Kevin Estra coming in. But I, I think I think, well, it's he's an awful lot closer in terms of time. He was six and a half seconds behind the Felipe last time around. So he's taken yeah three yeah three and a half seconds. He was uh, he found last time around. But basically the we just wait to see. Of course the next car that is due in should be the Aston Martin car number uh, 21 from Marco Sorensen, who got promoted from seventh or eighth up into third by not pitting when the others did. But let's see where he slots in. He'll be bringing that car in very soon indeed. Esther Martin green and yellow trim on it. Looks like a nice, neat changeover. And we can tell you, even without seeing identification, it's Augusto Farfus has taken over because Nick Yaloli not playing today. So it's only a two-driver lineup in the 99 
BMW M4 GT3 from Rover Racing that started on pole position. So it's American racer Connor De Filippi out of the car. Marco Sorensen is in the pits in the TS Sport Aston Martin. A little bit of attention to the front right rear. Oh, there's bodywork damage on the front right corner of the uh, race leading car. And that uh, won't be in an instant with any of the cars in the category because it's been in front since the start. And look at the front left corner. It's clearly, what would you, the front corner has got a full rubbery black kiss on it, Peter. Yeah, yeah, front right corner. Yeah, it's quite uh, quite heavy damage there, isn't it, bodywork wise? But interesting, it's uh, the splitter and all that's all, all intact in one piece and matching side to side. So there's nothing else uh, going around the car at the moment. So um, slightly odd set of damage there to, to the bodywork, but if it had clouted something and a barrier or run wide or even the back of a car, so it must be it must be clipping the back of a car, basically, because yeah, it's, it's off got the to. ground, therefore it can't be a barrier, or has it done the splitter as well? So they must have clipped something at some point in that 99 at BMW. I tell you what, I, I would think that would be coming into a slow zone. They're coming up at far greater speed, and yeah. no blame necessarily attached to Conor Felipe. You, you don't have long areas of sight but the big question to me is Dan Harper going to be in the lead he was just just before he took their pit his pit stop the previous time around he was right under the rear wing or his teammate Neil Verhagen was un under the Felipe now is this pit stop going to be slower as they attend to that front right corner and Dan Harper into the final S onto the start finish straight accelerating hard in the BMW junior team car yellow red yeah, and black like... and surely because yes the 99 car, 99 car is still stationary in the pit lane and under the starting gantry and presumably into the lead of the race yep goes the bmw junior team car but we'll come to this later of course their pit stop was uh, shorter because it was earlier in the race so anyhow but we will wait and wait the big question is now the 99 car gets going augusto farfus would have been frustrated he just had to get in the car sit there and wait until the repairs repairs were effective but i don't think they've lost a lot of time Maybe a couple of seconds because the Grenoble Porsche from Anti Racing has followed it out about two seconds down. Look, and he came in about. Grello? Yeah, and he came. Well, who is at the wheel of Grello? The man that won it in the last one. Still Frank Makavecki. In there. Fred, my apologies, not Frank. Fred. Call him Mackie. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he hasn't been around very long, you know. So, Frederick, but uniformly been Fred for a long time. But of course, what we have is this very, very special element within the Nürburgring Langstrecker series that your pit stop times are affected not when you come in, it's how many laps you've got on the board. Therefore, there is a sliding scale that Peter memorises. I know, I have to look it up every week. Um, it's good for you, good for your little grey cells. Yes, yes. Um, of how long you have to be at a standstill. If you exceed that, that's fine, but if you go under it, it's not quite so fine. And. Um, just an example, if you came in after six laps, which is what the bulk of the field did, you have to be stationary for 300, sorry, from pit in to pit out, 328 seconds. So your teams work out how long it takes you on, on the pit limit, in the speed limit in the pit lane, to do your in and out, and they work out how long the stand so between. But your pit stop after seven, you'd get this, 23 seconds longer. So, of course, they're behind Neil Verhagen's car that's now in the hands of Dan Harper. But the payoff is when they get to pit closer to the end of the race, their final pit stop will be shorter. So it's yin, yin and yang in so many ways. So just to reiterate, those taking over haven't told you who took over the TS Sport Aston Martin, and it's David Pittard following in the wheel tracks of Marco Sorensen. So Maxime Martin will be making the coffee and eating the donuts for a little bit longer in the garage. So a slight change on the timing screen there in the number eight Mercedes. Our team gets we had uh, Maximilian Gotts as the second driver. Apparently now that's just been updated to Adam Christodoulou. Yes, because Maxi Gotts is in another Mercedes. Yes. We do sometimes get these little vagaries. So who else? Yes, Christodoulou's taken over. Robin Freitz. Okay. Uh, no, that's uh, well, a couple of cars that started late uh, and started further down the order yeah. and suddenly peer up the top because their, their pit garages are a little bit further down towards the pit exit. Robin Reince, I think, was now for a double stint in number 15 entry. He started it. He's showing he's going to do two double stints, followed by Kelvin van der Linden doing two double stints. Uh, right rear puncture for the KTM crossbow. Just double checking. Was that the one that was so well placed? Car 53? I believe it is only it's just well it could be the sister car but it's only just done one it pitted after six laps and now it's coming very slowly after seven that's really really unfortunate and uh, in terms of pace they've been fantastic yeah mad silly how bringing it in wheels gone never mind tire, the whole wheels gone 
I thought it was crabbing, it looked a bit odd in the mm. angle, it's sitting a bit low, even for a, a deflated tyre, but yeah, it's actually lost its uh, right rear wheel. Well, that's really unlucky, because this, 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 I was saying, could be the, the, the manufacturers, the team's day of days here in the, the NLS, but that's a really, really cruel fortune for them. So, brilliant opening stint from Tim Heidemann and Mad Siliahaug, who's just done fabulous things for at least the last half, do half dozen years for KTM, but uh, stepping up to the GT2 car and to lose the right rear wheel for why? A cameraman's very kindly taking a look. We can clearly see there is no wheel, but uh, what else has gone? What can we see in that wheel arch? Oh, even the disc looked loose as well. So that's a, a fairly major setback for the crew. Don't forget, they started sixth, got up to third place. Kevin Astra put them back in their place to fourth. And the wheel is on the run back from Dottinger towards the point at which the track starts to rise before it gets the kink to go into Tiergarten. Two cars heading right for it now. Unfortunately, they've seen it. The marshals are trying to indicate to them, but it's something dark sitting on the dark section of the circuit, which isn't always easy. And particularly if you're at the car behind in a slipstreaming group, uh, trying to keep your head down and um, attack from there. That's very tricky indeed. Trying to work out what's failed there because obviously the, the hub nuts come off the when we saw the uh, the cameraman went into the wheel arch to mm. investigate for us and give us a better look in and we could see clearly the disc and the caliper and even the stub axle that was there that locates the wheel quite literally that was still there so it would appear an initial thought so it would be the centre lock nut has failed of course they normally have a, a spring mechanism on the end that clicks in so should the nut come loose it can't actually get off uh, the spline off the end of the thread, therefore the wheel cannot go off. Now in this case, that's obviously failed. There was no, no major bodywork damage to the back of that KTM, as if that wheel's flailed round for a while in there, as a tyre does quite often. So it looks initially that I would say that wheel's come off almost instantly. But yeah. Also, also think about where it is. Or I'm guessing it's rolled some distance where it is or landed. Probably hasn't just come off there and stopped and laid on the track. Um, but uh, uh, they need to get that out of the way ASAP before some uh, unfortunate soul collects it. You don't want to be doing that because that can end your race as well. The damage caused, the cause. Right, get get yourself in the minds of Mad Silia. How how much warning did he get? Was he did did it become apparent as he was turning onto the long run towards home for dotting her, or was it a sudden catastrophic failure? But we still can't work it out because the the, the nut, hub was looked intact. How much did. warning did he have? I would say none. By the look of it, I'm guessing it's it's, it's instant there. Um, just looking at uh, Dan Halpert in the. Uh, running eighth in the number 44 BMW there. Um, some in-car footage there of um, harassing. I would say some of the boys, I would say it almost actually touched somebody there uh, to get them out of the way. Well, not to get them out of the way, but it got that close. Driver staying in the 53 uh, KTM. Uh, so presumably it can be repaired. It's a very, it's a very odd... No, the, the, that's the sister car parked in front of it. That's apologies. the 52 KTM, and that's really bad news because they've got both their cars in the garage. The yep. one pushed towards the tail, one would presume, is the 53 car. Maybe they've... I'd have thought the last thing you want to do is bring your other car into the pit garage in front of it, but maybe they know it's going to be a long fix on the 53 and they can get more mechanics working on it if it's back in the garage. Yeah, good spot, Bruce. I just assumed it was the same car. It's a dangerous assumption. So two in the garage at the same time. I wasn't quite expecting that, but they've got the sister car pushed to the back. Uh, well, we can give you 50, a... 52 is now out and rejoins. And it's got one of the Stuck brothers on board, yeah, but I couldn't tell you which. The 53 car, the one that had the hub failure of some sort, the, the extraordinary failure that cost it the use of its right rear wheel, because the wheel is missing, is still sitting at the back of the pit garage. And, uh, no, it seems a little bit of head scratching, but then, of course, you have shared garages here. I saw some of the Gitty tires crews going through. They're nothing to do with it other than interested observers, but it's what's happening with the people in orange, black and white. That's the true racing livery and uh, driver being spoken to by teammates, but what a strange moment. So, the rear wheel, or the right rear wheel of the KTM, still sitting in the track, two-thirds of the way. It was it's sort of, if you're approaching it, it's a third of the way in the width of the track from the left-hand side of the track. And uh, really, largely, the cars would naturally be going towards the outside of the circuit there as they consider the kink ahead of them. But if you're in a slipstreaming group, that's pretty much at the point you might be thinking, I might just jink out now. So, very difficult indeed. Right, Dan Harper should be coming through to lead this race. He was the, the best place, the cars that pitted after six laps for their fresh rubber. And uh, this is his eighth at the moment, but that should suddenly 
uh, start to advance to a smaller number next to his name when he goes through because you still have a couple of other sorts of cars that have made their pit stops. And in fact, the last of those is a Cup 2 class car in the pit. So, yeah, Dan Harper in the lead of the race. And his margin over, well, who's going to be next in line? It should be probably Robin Frights, I would suggest, potentially, because Augusto Farfus, Fred Makiewicz and David Pittard have all taken over cars that came in after seven laps. Robin Frights' car came in after six. So that should move up the order. But uh, indisputable, though, Snow is that the lead is firmly in the hands of Ulster and Dan Harper there going through the, the cut through on the Grand Prix loop but really nobody uh, in front of him nobody behind He's, he can now just settle down to his race whereas yeah, Frights uh, Audi did do something else OK there we have it so Augusto Farfus is in second place so these two cars were fighting for the lead the, the time difference pit stops by being the dint of one lap apart was, just refresh my memory, after, after six laps, it was 23 seconds, a gap between them on the track, 21 and a half. So it's, it's uh, nobody's really gained anything in particular. But of course, later in the race, the Dan Harper car will have a longer final pit stop accordingly. So they're, they're dead square. Wheel nut has uh, been found by a fantastic uh, spot by a camera van, and it looks like an undamaged wheel nut lying in the grass. Very arsy, a little bit of dandelion action in the background, and the white line at the side of the circuit. But... Have we got David Attenborough on, on, on tap just to, to report this for us? No, I was wearing a pale blue shirt, and I thought I'd just step into the... Um... The lesser spotted blue KTM wheel nut. I Very rare at the Nürburgring. Yeah, I bet they have I'm trying to hide in the nesting in there. Is it, is it in the mating season or not? Oh, I don't know. I don't, they're probably the sort of people who don't have a wild, hive for wild bees. Imagine that. <laughs> With no bees to put in it, though. Not yet. That really is a case of to be or not to be, isn't it? Right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I had to move on. <laughs> I couldn't resist. Please fetch the pointy hat. <laughs> put it on the man next to me and put him in the corner for ten minutes. <laughs> ten minutes? That's not so bad, though. It's not bad. So, by dint of different opinions on when to dive for the pits, we have a 21-second gap between the two cars that were nose to tail before the pit lane uh, was hit first after six laps by the number 44 BMW Junior Team car. That's leading by 21 and a half seconds now in the hands of Dan Harper. August. Augusto Farfors took over the 99 BMW. Don't forget, the first time we actually noticed there was front corner damage on the Rover Racing BMW that started on pole position was when it came into the pit lane. It could have even been on that lap, as, as much as we know. But a lot of the shots have been high from the helicopter, which is fantastic. But there have been many moments, Peter, where the car had to really hit the brakes, coming into slow zones. We've had many incidents being cleared up. And presumably, that is where the front right corner got that little bit of bodywork damage. And I liked your analysis of the fact that the splitter hasn't been damaged. So if it wasn't a barrier, it would have been the tail end of a car, presumably. Certainly looked like it. Um, not too much. I think it just, just, I think it just kissed it. Yeah. So, and in fact, if you get away with, with damaging your car very lightly, we all know it's easier to damage your car quite heavily with contact. But uh, that was a, a good, good job, and uh, very fortunate indeed. And certainly for Conor de Filippi, who was in the car when it came into the pit lane, the 99 Rover racing car that started on pole position, he drove that M4 beautifully. But he was under a lot of pressure from yeah. Overhagen. It was, certainly was, but he, 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 he responded to it well and resisted it. So, Dan Harper is that's our, our race leader now, BMW Junior Team. Uh, quite a, I'm almost scared to say this because it's, uh, You're gonna it's, say it's it. a curse. Go on. I've, I've started, so I'm, I'm going to finish doing my uh, Magnus Magnussen thing. But um, it's quite a debut for these uh, M4s, isn't it? Well, it, no, it, re it really is. But don't, don't forget, the, these, these cars have raced for a long time. But I really want to see how, well, now is the moment. We need to see where the concept cars, the, the new ones that are making their debut, the ones down in, in the... Uh, next year's GT4 class cars running an SP8T. Where are they? Look down the timing list, we need to find cars number 51 and 54. Because, of course, the M4 GT3 surfaced last year, and really this is its first full, full racing season. But um, SP8T is the class one needs to find because this is one of the many, many beautiful elements, Snowy, of um, the NLS. Just simply that cars are brought out here for, for race testing. 
and certainly if you're an interested party up and down the pit lane, then um, there is plenty to be look, looking for. You're looking at a car you might want to buy for next year. Car number 51, Steph Dusseldorp is running. He's completed six laps, maybe just about to complete seven. He's in 50. He's 87th position overall. Car number 54. And I'll, keep, I'll keep looking for that. Car number is, oh, you might have to keep looking for that because... Uh, Things are, are, are changing fast, and uh, yeah, and we've got a code sixted X Muller, ah, okay. Bruce, which, uh, and it looks like there's a barrier damage on the right hand side and a wheel on the left hand side of the track. So if something is collected and connected with the barrier with significant force, shall we say, they take a wheel off the car. And I'm just trying to, I think, I think I'm right in saying it's the Team Saw Grensport. 330i BMW, number 514, from the class uh, VT2R four-wheel drive class. I think that's the car that's causing uh, the Code 60 at X-Mule at the moment. Thanks very much we've for that. Just, we've just gone to a, a full-course green as well for the first time in over an hour or so. It just a fortune just happened almost immediately. I'm finding myself just rather hoping that, that the sort of unusual level of incident so far this this meeting is something we're just gobbling up those for future events and um, hopefully we can well, have more obviously there's, there's, there's a quota for the year so we're obviously as you say we're trying to get through as much of the quota as we can this meeting uh, we were actually behind last year last meeting so we're it's le leveling up that's what it is well, leveling up leveling up and that gave me a quick moment to find out where the other of the bmw M4 GT4 concept cars entered by BMW M Motorsport yes the works team is running and York Weidinger who's sharing with Steph Dusseldorp is um in 39th position, as I say, that becomes 41st position. The order's uh, changing quite uh, rapidly as uh, the field is uh, running, completing their first round of pit stops. I think pretty much everybody has gone through. Maybe a couple of Cup 3 class cars haven't yet stumbled into the pits, but uh, pretty much the order is settled now. Now, correction on the... Uh, there is still the Code 60 at Exmuller. That's still uh, existing. However, it's a 953 car that's gone off, which is the uh, 718 Cayman uh, GT4 from um, the Cup 3 class, that's the Smillers Racing car. Smillers Racing entry, my apologies. Uh, that's off on the right-hand side, and I think it was just that 514 had pulled off nearby. I think they're just two not necessarily uh, connected. We've also got a uh, report that the 176 um, Aston Vantage GT4 is driving very slowly uh, around the track. Just trying to locate where that is on the track for us, Bruce. This is the 176. The, well, that's the, the Pro Sport car, isn't it? Guido Dumaret and Alexander yeah. Walker. That's a GT4 category class, I yeah. should say. Yeah, so it's running an SP10. One thing I really do advise you to do if you ever get a chance to uh, under, you want to understand more about the classes, the many classes, the myriad classes uh, competing in the Nürburgring Langstrecken series, go to vln.de, check out the website, and it'll list all the categories for you. You can find the official race entry, and you'll see as you go down through what was 160 cars, we think we've got just north of 150 starting today, that uh, you, you can get to understand how you have classes, then you have the experimental classes as well. So it's multifaceted, but you could just see the sheer range of cars that go out to compete. You can also get to understand by the enormous numbers in some classes, those are the classes you want to be competing in. It makes it harder for you to win, but you pick up more points accordingly because they're allocated according to how many starters. Right, we've got bodywork damage uh, to, is it the, looks like it's the dynamic Porsche. Let's take a look. There's a KCMG Porsche has been uh, a, left rear damage the bodywork is hanging on well the whole tail section is now starting to fall off that car and that will be that's been a off somewhere that's that's, that's jo josh burton at the yes. wheel yeah there's bodywork damage to the right hand side that's losing the whole rear body section of that car grello grello porsche appears to be off on, at the side of yes. the circuit coming and another car in the background is another it unrelated porsche. or not yeah it's out of galgenkopf onto the long run home to dotting a her what has happened has a hit b and b has hit c but fred mackett vicky was running just ahead at the start of lap of josh burden they were sixth and seventh overall but effectively fourth and fifth because a couple of cup two class cars were, had pitted they're off the damage there's another car off on the left hand side right hand side of the circuit in fact oh gosh 
and uh, the cameras don't know where to look left. Another section of the circuit has got another Porsche off, but no, it's suddenly Cop. become... That's Galvin Cop still. Okay, so that was the Porsche in the background, view. which the Porsche came and I think, off at the side of the circuit, but the crucial ones, just before the first gantry of the, over that long run home, is Fred Machiavicki's uh, 911 from Manti Racing and limping home in the pits now, possibly having been given a biff up the backside, is Josh Burden in the KCMG Porsche. But of course, what does that breed? It breeds slow zones. And uh, I'm just trying to see which of the Porsche came. Is it's kind of 440, which off the top of your head is at the side of the circuit. You're about to tell me who's driving. I can tell you who's driving it because I'll take a little look. See, it's a. Well, that's the uh, QTQ race performance uh, with Zumper Tassello, Anderson, and Andreas at the wheel. At the wheels of that, depending on who was only there. So the 911 Grella, well, this is a turn of the books. Uh, Fred Makovici staying in the car, hopefully, uh, hoping to get that towed back. But uh, no signs of obvious damage to it and nothing indicating on the top. We've got our uh, Rover Helicam shot again. So just describing that, looking from above. The, the 911 Manti Porsche, from what little we can see, it's a reasonably close up shot, does look undamaged. There seems to be no evidence of barrier damage, tyre marks grass etc um, front right wheel is pointing is turning right but as long as the other one's doing the same the opposite side all is good well um, th that that's really quite extraordinary because I presume we might find a bit of damage but it's, that said that car I thought was ahead of the KCMG Porsche it certainly was at the start of that lap um, and I was I don't know trying to add two and two but uh, certainly that's unusual it seems completely undamaged do you think maybe he, he was ahead and came out of Galgen Kopf and accelerated and suddenly nobody was home? Or I'm just intrigued why it's got so much right-hand lock on, steering mm. angle on it, uh, parked on the grass straight. Um, my concern is that the front right wheel isn't, hasn't got the same degrees of steered angle on it as the left-hand wheel. Yes, because certainly the left-hand wheel is turned about 10 degrees away yeah. from... It's just, not, it's just not natural to park a car and leave it quite like that. You would pull up and stop. Somebody, certainly of, of Fred's experience, you, you pull up and stop and you just have wheel straight you never will leave lock on i don't know why it's just something drivers do we're creatures of habit <laughs> bruce is smiling at that one like oh so many tales going through his mind right now where do i start <laughs> I shan't. it's I... a whole nother four hour show that is uh, well, and that's, no. only, that's only just just scraping the surface isn't it and that's before i, I throw to you yeah i know i know <laughs> what i can tell you is at the end of that lap with nine laps on the board is uh, Dan Harper leading for the BMW junior team. Big day for BMW, BMW Rover Racing in second place, 27 seconds down. So the last lap was five and a half seconds gained by our race leader. Just to reiterate though, he made his first pit stop. That car made its first pit stop after seven, after six laps, whereas uh, the race leading car, the 99 car came in a lap later after seven. In the midst of all this, by the way, we, the, the Pro Sport GT4 Aston, not the two GT3 cars we've got running Aston, the GT4 version of Pro Sport, that you said was travelling slowly, that also did stop just before the carousel. And another car's having another go. The 53 KTM that lost its right rear wheel, they've shoved it to the back of the garage and they've decided orange looks good in the sunshine. They've pushed it back out again, they've fixed it. Mad City Howe would have lost, well, two laps there. That was a shade. This is the car that was running third, fourth positions, there or thereabouts, taking it to the SP9 class cars. And great to have a challenger doing something different, much as Glickenhaus has done over the years in this championship. This is where you've got to have absolute faith in your team, which the drivers do uh, on the basis that that lost its wheel nut, and we, we saw that was proven because it was we saw the footage of it in the grass. Um, he's taking a little bit circumspect, isn't he, this first lap of going out, just making sure it does turn all the right every time he turns and brakes and accelerates and puts load through those rear wheels, that they do stay on the car because it is something that drivers do like. They, they, they're fond of them. They, they like keeping them on the car till the end of the stint. Are you sure that Mads didn't suddenly remember he got cramp in his right <laughs> rear foot and let a teammate go in? I did laugh as soon as you said that, then the car locked up going into the, the cut-through on the Grand Prix circuit. So maybe just concentrating on vital signals a little more than the, the braking point. But if you just popped away and come back, why a car's running slowly down... <laughs> Excuse me, down the dotting her. I found that so exciting. Um, because we've had uh, two cars off, uh, a Porsche Cayman and, importantly, the Grella Racing Porsche that would have been in fourth position. And another car we'd seen just before that may have been caught in that moment of the car pulling off. But uh, Josh Burden has brought the KCMG Porsche into the pits. And that was uh, you know, probably the closest car to Fred Machiavicki's Grello Porsche. 
and uh, that had rear-end damage. Down in the pits, though, Toyota liked to come and play. Kazuki Nakajima, used to seeing him over the years competing in the uh, World Endurance Championship, uh, wearing his Toyota Gazoo Racing jacket, ha having a chat. And, you know, we saw that Toyota GT86 at the side of the circuit earlier. So no works entry here, but, you know, Toyota, like many Japanese manufacturers, are fascinated by the Nürburgring. And they can see all the testing that's going on here. And... Um, they're fully aware that running cars here really gives you a helping hand in a race that's gaining more and more prestige over the years, which is the Nürburgring 24 hours coming up. Or maybe it's just that Kazuki fancies racing. Fancies coming here. It's, it's on a par uh, challenge-wise with being the, I'm not sure which circuit you'll probably get it or which event, the, the ultimate challenge of being Nürburgring 24 hour or Le Mans. I think Le Mans is the, the prestigious one. Probably the Halo event, isn't it? It's the one that everybody wants to do in terms of names. But in terms of... Uh, Really actual time for you. driving it uh, and running getting a team to get to the end of it and yeah. engineering all logistics all that to go for these this place Nürburgring is incredible um, provided the weather helps you as we had last year when we had that I think it was the shortest ever running wasn't it officially it, it was indeed. nine hours something yeah the fog came down and the rescue helicopters couldn't be but but also I, th I think you have to put in that mix the spa 24 hours as well because not just because the fleet are best there, but uh, also just because that is all cars in the GT3 class, so it's an incredibly competitive field of sort of uh, getting on for 60 cars, all in the same class. Here, a totally different mix because of the mix of cars you get in the Nürburgring 24 hours, and of course, the more multi-class, but I think multi-class is taken to the nth degree for the Nürburgring 24, just simply because they can, and they do, and that's the history of the event. 24-hour racing, great idea. Start one day, finish the next day, just keep going through the night. Brilliant. Whoever came up with that, round of applause. It, I can't see it catching on. But it is, never it's, last. The, it's, the, it's the challenge of it, and we all know whether whatever role you have in a race, whether you're covering as a commentator, you're with a pit crew, you're the driver, you're the family, you're whatever. Win, winning is fantastic, but just completing the race, that moment when you've finished and all those emotions come out, Peter, it's just extraordinary, isn't it? You're, you're, you're running on empty, which of course brings the emotions to the fore, but it, it's just... Yeah, I get caught up with it every year at the more You know, you're running around trying to get the interviews at the end of the race, and you just get caught up in everybody's enthusiasm and, and just their sheer passion and brackets relief or disappointment or whatever you want to throw out there. But it is phenomenal. Well, it is the first objective of, of, of a 24 hour or any race, obviously, but of uh, the 24 hour race is, is to get to the end. And that, that sounds ridiculous, but it's the, the psyche, the mentality, the strategy, everything that goes with it. There's so many permutations, so many layers of. Not just the drivers, they've got to do their bit, but the team to work. As we saw earlier, those pit stops earlier when we had so much safety car, the first two BMWs came in, jumped in. Was it, a, you said, have they played the game right, have they not? Well, what are they gaining by staying out there on track? And it can, it can all change. You suddenly, we've, we've seen this race so, so very different. This is the, the second race of the year, although it was called NLS3. It is the second race of the year, and it's been strewn since qualifying and now with Code, safe, uh, code 60s, incidents, yellow flags, debris, wheels, wheel nuts, all sorts of things on the track. NLS 1 couldn't have been more different, complete opposite. It was almost an uneventful race apart from the racing, yeah. uh, which did go down to the last corner and one second apart. So yeah, that was fine. But what I'm saying is on track in terms of incidents, outside influences, if you'd put that into a, a computer, your spreadsheet and said, right, these are the permutations, you wouldn't have run that model. because You'd have said, well, something's, it's a Nürburgring, something's going to happen. You've always said it giveth and it taketh away. Well, it didn't last round. It just said, tell you what, have that one. Then it went, do you know what? You had a, a nice easy race. We're going to snow now, so we'll cancel round two. Race, yeah. race three, race two. Very different. And, and, yeah, no, it couldn't be more different. And I also just think that last time, the only people who did anything different were people who were just way down the order. Everybody else just realised running to the same tactic. Clockwork, 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 yeah. seven laps, seven. You know, that, that was just the one that was clearly the optimum tactic. But all along, they'd have been waiting for just something, just a little slower section on the circuit because of X or Y. Talking of lap pace at the moment, the, the race leaders are lapping sort of 50 seconds off their best pace. That's just an indication of the slow zone going out of Galden Cobb from to dotting a hurt. There probably is some others as well. So, so he's having a little look at his uh, incident screen that if ever you had that printed out at the end of the race it would take half a tree wouldn't yeah. it because um even if it's just saying i'll give you an example under the it'll tell us who's a, who's having a driver change i can tell you lyzen former champion changing change to freezer max uh, vasel has left the pits then we've got other drivers coming in driver change who said their new personal first 
best time sometimes who's been um, who's left the pits a yellow flags the last uh, yellow flag message that was Schraubenschwanz so that's towards the end of the lap so that's uh, the corner bit, <laughs> excuse me before you get to Galvenkopf and maybe some of maybe some of the clash happened there don't forget that's probably the lead into the yellow zone through until um, the exit of Galgenkopf onto the dotting her. Haven't had a shot from there for a while to find out if the Grello Racing Porsche, Fred Makiewicz, has been removed from the scene. And indeed, we're still guessing, because there seems to be no damage, possible steering damage, as to what could be wrong with that car. Shall endeavour to find out. Talk amongst yourselves. OK, well, I'm just going to look, see. Uh, Ryan, we've got... Uh, we haven't really talked about Audis in this race. We mentioned the fact that there was a brilliant lineup of Robin Franks and Kelvin van der Linde, but uh, the one that's going best is Michele Beretta, who's up in sixth place in the number 16 entry. That's uh, one of the ones from Team Phoenix. He's showing up with uh, Kuba Yamaziak and Kuba a go later. Uh, he's done the first hit and he's in the second. He's really pushing John Edwards in the second of the Rover Racing BMWs. So uh, that's good to see that uh, an Audi is up in sixth. But normally you'd expect to have one in the sixth from the outgo, outset of a race. Right, right. I think we have just looking for the information on uh, Grello, and um, there's been a, a collision between number five uh, Stippler Colt Audi ah. and the Vander Linde Whitman Edwards BMW GT3 M4. Now we've got uh, instant vehicles on the track now trying to bring back the Grello Porsche, which has not moved at all from. Uh, where it stopped at the end of, well, just the beginning of dotting a hoe, wasn't it? It's Galpenkopf, it's come out of there. That is an on-track incident or a side-of-the-track incident. And just to add to this this sort of feeling there's a lot going on at this meeting, one of the refueling pumps in the pits wasn't worked yeah. and the whole area just had to be taped off while they get a sort of mm. rescue crew in to just make sure all is safe. So whether it was leaking or whatever. But uh, again, it just makes you understand and appreciate how much organisation has to go into running a race with this many cars on a circuit as complex and uh, testing as this. Well, the wheel that came off the KTM, the number 53 KTM, 53 KTM, I'll get my teeth around that, uh, was, uh, has been removed. There is still a change of surface flag uh, at the dotting her, and it looks to me like the 176 Aston is back out running again. It's certainly uh, in sight at the moment. Okay, and also uh, another car that's been to the pits too many times. We expect in this race to be run smoothly to come in three times at the end of the first hour, the second and the third. But Matteo Caroli in the number 38 Porsche uh, from Dynamic Motorsport in for a third time after only 10 laps. So clearly not all going smoothly for them. Yeah, and I can confirm that the 176 Pro Sport drip run uh, Aston Vantage GT4 is back out running. Do worry at the wheel of that. Uh, running in 63rd, I think it is now, but uh, it is out, back out on track again. So it slowed, stopped, and obviously put it back, and there it is again. Right, Peter, as an Aston Martin man through and through, uh, a green Aston Martin is something that, you know, is almost uniform, but what do you think of the uh, race delivery with orange, lighter orange above and darker orange below the green? How would you mark it out of 10? Out of 10, I'd give it a, I'd give it a good 7. 7? Uh, to me, it's very much a traditional sort of colour scheme, also sort of... Um, Castrol oil colours, isn't it? And quite a, quite an old-fashioned sort of 50s, 60s sort of colour scheme. It's quite different. No, I'm, I'm pleased it's different because um, I remember a long time ago, the DTM, when they were having enormous TV audiences and huge audiences at the circuits, worked out the best colours, colours that, the colours that showed up best on television. And it was white and blue. If you had a white and blue combination, yeah. that would be the best. And it's also across all weather. Um, and I suppose the orange and green that Pro Sport run is, is their colour, so at least it's identifiable as a team. But, it, you know, if the team that scientists was going, we, we want the most TV exposure. Well, they lead the race, and if you can't lead the race, stand out by um, having a colour that works on TV. So, we're not neglecting you. We haven't talked about the gap between first and second for a while, because just uh, bear in mind the BMW Junior team, M4 GT3, that is leading the race. That's car number 44. 20, well, it's... 23 and a half seconds the good over another BMW M4 GT3, which is Augusto Farfus. And that has a 10 second advantage, an 11 second advantage over another M4 GT3, which is Vulcan Horse Motorsport. That's uh, Andy Suchek, the Spanish racer who's really taking to the to the Nordschleife this year. It was started by Christian Kronjes. Andy Suchek has taken it over. 
but the important thing is number 44, the race leader, came in a lap before the 99 that's giving chase. So it had a shorter pit stop by 23 seconds. The margin between them is 23.391 seconds. So uh, that is an advantage. But in fairness, the 99 car will have a shorter final pit stop according to the sliding scale issued here. So Dan Harper, press on as he has been. And Peter reckons he saw him almost touching someone early in his stint as he tried to make his escape. Ah, the Grello Porsche is up onto a flatbed, but uh, Dan's going to need to press on a little bit because the gap needs to be a bit more than it is at the moment because he'll be coming in. Uh, well, it depends how they, they split their split their tactics. But he's, he, he did make that first pit stop, or his car made that pit stop, a lap ahead of the 99 Rover Racing BMW. Andy Suchek, though, good to see him get used to, you know, over the years, you get used to a driver racing for one manufacturer. And Suchek, for a long time, of course, was a, a Bentley boy, racing very competitively in what was then the Blanc Pan GT World Challenge. And um, good to have him on board at the Nürburgring, because, of course, he's got eyes on other prizes at the moment. Race leader Dan Harper heading down the dotting of her, or along the dotting of her, then he get the track, goes to the kink up the rise and again when television foreshortens things and you then go to the circuit and decide to have a track walk maybe not on the Nordschleife but parts of the Nordschleife you suddenly realize it, the, the lap really kicks up at the tail and and in to the pits comes car number 44 so let's note that down that should be 11 laps on the board Our race leader is in. How much time on the board? We've got uh, an hour and 20 minutes remaining. Two hours. Two hours and 20 minutes. I, could, I lost the big hand for a second. <laughs> it's next to the one. Okay, so what is the BMW? Is it a penalty or is it a pit guard right at the end? No, it's a drive through. A drive through. Maybe you spotted contact. That's what you've got to uh, have a little look for. Yeah. Because a drive through penalty, that didn't make any sense at all. And I thought about drive through, and I thought sometimes you get caught out, you see a car coming to the pit lane, and their garage is right at the end. So he's emerged where? Right on the tail of the new race leader. So the order is as it was on the opening lap nose to tail between 99 and 44. That drive through penalty has gobbled up all the advantage that um, BMW Junior team had by dint of its first pit stop. It was going to have to lose time in its final pit stop. So now, really, the advantage has swung very much back towards the Rover Racing team. So for what was that penalty, the drive-through penalty that Dan Harper has had to serve? And so many times you have to serve the penalty that maybe was picked up by your teammate who did the first stint, but we don't know as yet. But uh, well, 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 I was quickly trying to work out why they came in after 11 laps when they made their first stop after six. That just didn't stack up. So Dan Harper knows what he's got to do now, above all other things, is get ahead on the track and then try and build an advantage. Easier said than done, Augusto Farfus uh, minding his own business. So the 99 Rover Racing M4 GT3 in the lead of the race by one and a half car lengths. They go through the Sabine Schmitz curves as the Toyota GT86 in front of them gets out of their way. It's not very easy to get out of the way through the Sabine Schmitz curves. There's so little space, even with cars going to one at a time. But uh, neither the first of those M4 GT3s, the 99, Far from Rover Racing, nor the chasing BMW Junior team entry, driven by Dan Harper, lost out at all. The gap stays exactly the same through hats and back they go. Staying off the curbs, drivers really being very, very careful indeed. And as I say that, suddenly Augusto Farfus clouts the curb. Tail end of his M4 gets kicked out a little bit, but he straightens it up all over again. And Dan Harper is going, maybe a little bit of sucker for me here. But then the track finally opens up and uh, there's a chance for them to settle down rather than the left-right, left-right approach they've had for the previous six corners. So, one drive-through penalty is one drive-through penalty too many, Peter, in a race like this. It's so competitive at the front end of the field, and uh, that surely, surely, unless something else underboard occurs, will inter interrupt any chance that BMW Junior team had of taking the win here today. Yes, very much so. I'm still trying to get to the bottom, of Bruce, while being quiet for What happened to this, uh, to the Manti Porsche? And it does look like I think they've been collected by um, a slower, kind of different car, country car, just moved across. I'm just trying to get up um, 
very cheeky managed to find the onboard footage of Mantai uh, from the race. I'm just trying to find what, what exactly what happened there. Uh. He's a spy, you know. <laughs> Weather conditions, still a bit of blue sky, but a lot more cloud. Here I am trying to throw another curveball into the mix. I mean, this race has had so many curveballs thrown into it, but Rover Racing with the 99 car. Disproving what I said earlier in the race that qualifying isn't that important here because of course starting at the front has given them that advantage and the fact that they're fighting for victory in this race with the number 44 car the BMW junior team M4 GT3 that started alongside it does mean you get clear of incidents on the um, opening lap of the race but incidents have been coming thick and fast ever since the Grello Porsche we still can't see what the problem is with it but it's back in towards the pits on the back of a flatbed and uh, might be parked up at the rear of the garage. It's, it's, it's extraordinary to find, I mean, many points on the circuit there have been other bits of other cars on the track, but we'll get, but Peter's being a snoop, he's having a little look to see what he can find as to what occurred. Out on track, yellow flag at Espash. Almost as soon as the bottom of the screen they clear a yellow flag warning, you get one somewhere else, but uh, I think. And we've got a slow zone coming up at uh, Style Strecker, which is Marshall's Post 139. If you've never been to the Nürburgring, most tracks have maybe 20 Marshall's Post around the lap, but when your lap's as long as it is here, with we, I think, coming onto the start finish straight, onto the start, not the start finish straight, I think Galgenkopf, the start of dotting her is about Marshall's Post 187. Du magst Sim Racing? Du liebst die Nordschleife? Und du bist zwischen 14 und 18 Jahren alt? Dann mach jetzt mit bei der DNLS Junior Sichtung. Der Sieger startet zusammen mit Mercedes AMG Fahrer Adam Christo Dugan in der digitalen Nürburgring Langstrecken Serie 2022 und 23. In der Nürburgring Esports Bar kannst du dich jetzt parallel zu jedem NLS Lauf von 13 bis 18 Uhr beim Shootout qualifizieren. Vielleicht bist ja du der nächste Sim Racing Shooting Star. See you then. Jetzt Falkenreifen kaufen und Tankgutschein sichern. Weitere Informationen auf tankgutschein.falkenreifen.de Falkenreifen
first asphalt watch. Die ersten Zifferblätter aus echtem Rennstreckenasphalt. Auf dem Asphalt wurden Legenden geboren und magische Momente erlebt. Cobblor. Liebe Fans, besucht unsere Social Media Kanäle von Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter und TikTok. Willkommen zu NLS. All eyes on the pit lane. In Incident between 18, 440 and 911. Write those numbers down. Peter, mm. Dossinger Hoa, incident under investigation. 18, 440 and 911. We know 911 is the anti racing Porsche. Car 18 is the KCMG. And 440 um, was the Cayman. I mentioned it was off on the other side. The yeah. two there, the other, they got pulled into the uh, exit, the barriers there for safety. So. With the drive through penalty at the end of lap 11, and Harper is now this is out from the pits. I think he served a third pit stop, and it just hasn't yet come up on the right hand side of our timing screen because at the start of the lap, he remember he came out just behind Augusto Farfus. So he'd been leading the race in 44, came in, served the drive through penalty, had that 20 something second advantage, and came out just behind the Rover Racing BMW. But this time, listed as 7.4 seconds down. If there has come in the pits, that would be how much he'd slowed down to before he crossed the start finish line. Yes, in his last lap, eight minutes forty-four. Yes, yeah, lost thirty seconds. Mm. Okay, we'll keep it, keep an eye on that. But it's suddenly really looking like Rover Racing's day. They've got the car in the lead of the race. That's Augusto Farfus. They've got a car in fifth place. That's John Edwards. And John has just set uh, almost equal fastest lap of the race. He's now starting to catch Matteo Jaminet in that top sport WRT Porsche. So it could soon be four BMWs in the top four positions. So things chop, they change, and the BMWs work ever more to fall towards the fore of this race. Must be particularly galling for, remember Ben Tuck was featuring very well early on in one of the other Morgan Horse Motorsport 
M4 GT3s and we saw his car off at the side of the circuit. So that could also have been right at the sharp end of the field. He'd have been handing over to York Muller, Muller uh, Mar Maria von Bolen, but for Ben Tuck, Ben Tuck from Biggles Wade, as we call him, uh, the race doesn't run to a conclusion. And I said keep an eye on this lot. Robin Frights, oh, I'm not lapping slower than eight minutes. Seven minutes, 59.9 .9 seconds, but he's down in 13th place. It's not where you'd expect to find him, but he's uh, certainly quicker, well, clearly, quicker than everyone else in front of him at the moment. Dan Harper. Non compliance with the minimum pit stop at the time. Fuel oh, too quickly. I wonder by how much. Five seconds is for every, Oh, that's quite every, a lot. Well, every litre or part thereof, you get a five second penalty. So that's why that car's been sitting there. Oh, okay. Basically, they, basically they've refueled it too quickly. Right, so what they've had, they've had a drive through penalty. But did it drive through? it drove through without stopping? Did it then come through another time? Yeah. I think it did. So it came in on 11 and it came in on 12. Correct. They did one lap, yes. Exactly as the uh, times would suggest. That's exactly what it's done. That is extraordinary because the BMW Junior team has immense experience here and, um, and success here. Last year they won the Adenauer Red Strecken Trophy, Trophy and the Reinoldus Langstrecken Red in June and July. The same trio that have been competing this year. So that that is, well, that's, that's a communication malfunction, one feels. It would uh, appear so. And that's a very expensive one, time-wise. Well, that has just given Augusto Farfas elbow space, a huge yeah, exactly. amount Brief of elbow space. space. And also because the 44 BMW Junior team car made its first pit stop a lap earlier than the 99 Rover, Racing example, already the Rover crew had an advantage in their pocket for later in the race when they'll have a shorter final pit stop. And a full course green, finally. We'll go with that. Right, Cruz, it's up to you. <laughs> How long will it last? Place your bets here. No, well, <laughs> they can do it. They have done it. They, they... Oh, they can do it. In fact, what we're getting suddenly is a flurry of... Um, Drivers setting their fastest laps, and it's probably halfway through their stint, two thirds way through. Their... Actually, no, they're towards the end of their second stint in terms of fuel load and stuff. But it's because we've got green flag. So the fastest lap in qualifying was seven minutes fifty-seven. The fastest lap so far in this race at Whisker under eight minutes. Robin Frights, car number fifteen. Audi entered by Team Audi Sport Team Phoenix, and that's a car that will continue to rise up the order. You can be sure of that. Looking for any other real movers. Let's run down the classes. SPX, of course, it was being dominated by the number 53 KTM crossbow GT2, with the best of the rest being the uh, car we're delighted to see back, the Glickenhaus, but with the 53 shedding that right rear wheel, it's uh, very much fallen in the hands of Glickenhaus's team, so uh, that's running 14th place overall. Best car in Cup 2. It's been a very good run, as you'd sort of expect from the, the driver in question. It's car 112 in the Porsche Cup class, and that is from K Kramer Racing, and it's Moritz Krantz, who just goes better and better in this series, around this circuit. So he's in 16th place overall, um, and he's got a tiny advantage of over half a minute over the 114 from FK Performance, which has got Ben Bunagel at the wheel. And Richard Farfus just set a new fastest lap of the race, and one, fi sorry, one, a seven, <laughs> one, that would be extraordinary, wouldn't it? Deceptively yes. quick. <laughs> just checking him, this, 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 this is awake, that's all, including yourself, Bruce. Um, a 7.58.487. Okay. I'd pay good money to see a 1.58 round there, but <laughs> I'd pay very good money to see that. You'd be looking at your phone yes. when it passed, you know. Exactly. I do apologise. A 7.58.487 from Augustus. Farfus, uh, race leader, just to establish they are there. Others have fallen by the wayside. Some have had incidents, some haven't. They've just kept going at the moment. And exactly what a way to celebrate of reaching, in a minute's time, halfway, half distance of this race. I'll just pop in the fastest lap. Why have I not? Just a little marker there. This is what we're doing in the first half. It's a little We've got more. We've it's got more. It's a little something for his teammate, yes. Connor de Filippi. Yeah, yeah, yes. he led the first To so use one of your favourite phrases for all the rest of the teams absorb. <laughs> <laughs> So, drivers starting to come in the pits. The get speed. Is that the, the get speed in coming yeah, in? Yeah, the 98 car. So, this is 13 laps on the board. So we can do some maths, but why bother? 
too complicated. So, 98, that's the sister car to the race leader into the pits. The number 12, Lucas Stoltz, has been setting some very quick laps in the Hout Racing Team, Team Bilstein. Uh, Mercedes, he's come in from sixth, and Patrick Assenheimer brought his Mercedes in from ninth. Next time around, it's going to get busy. Because that will be for crews that have uh, opted for... Well, some would have done a six followed by an eight. And our race leader will probably come in next time around having done the more traditional seven followed by seven. Shall I look for you, Bruce? No. Oh. Go on, go on. You've got all the gadgetry there. Go on, humour me. Humour me. Go on. Four first, six laps. Mm -hmm. Two check seven. Jaminet seven. Edward seven. Beretta seven. There's a pattern here, isn't there? Stolt seven. Pittard six. Trumer seven. Assenheimer did seven, but of course he did back to back as well because he'd already done, uh, he did five to start with, didn't he? Okay, another way we could look at it is the fact that uh, 99 are race leading BMW, 911, the, the Fordham by the wayside, Manti Porsche, and 21, the TF Sport Aston Martin, were the only three of the front running cars that did seven laps on their opening stint. Mm. The vast majority did six. And then a handful, four of them, including the car that just pitted uh, from fourth place, the 98 car did five laps in the opening stint. Number five came in after just five laps, which was Frank Stippler, followed immediately by 98, which was the um, second of the Rover Racing BMWs, another other two that came in after such a short stint. Number 12, the Lucas Stoltz Manuel Metzger Mercedes from Team Bilstein, and number, I've written it down here, 55, which was uh, the Landgraf Young Talents car, Patrick Assenheimer. Patrick stretching it a bit with the Young Talents bit. He's north of north of not, not a teenager, but Lucy Treffs, I think, Luca, and Luca Andrew Treffs is uh, certainly at the younger end of the scales. So you know, Becoming talent sees, in fact, uh, yeah. When you look, at you, you look at your your notes, and you've got down XXX for his uh, date of birth. It's not good, but he's still a teenager. Patrick, Who was that? Uh, uh, that's uh, Treffs, and uh, just shortly, within the next week, Patrick Assenheimer will turn 30. So he's still young, but he's not a teenager. Robin Freitz, number 15, has also come into the pits as well after 13 laps. And number eight, Adam Christodoulou. And really, that in itself, the fact they're listed as 14th and 15th, drivers of that talent being outside the top 10 just shows the growth and yet more growth of this series in terms of the level of competitiveness at the front, level of competition. Because those are drivers who can walk into any works team and uh, do a stunning job. But right now, Augusto Farfus and Rover Racing have the biggest smiles on their face. We're into the second half of this race. Their car is leading by 47 seconds. And that's Andy Suchek who's moved up into second place. That second visit to the second unintended visit to the pits by the BMW Junior Team entry has uh, funneled it right down the order to get where? Tenth place. That has been a costly drive through, followed by a time penalty in the pits. Walkenhorst Motorsport, staunch supporters of the championship, and um, you know, big friends of this series. They haven't had a lot of wins in this series. In fact, last year they got one. They got one with Ben Tuck, David Pittard, and Christian Cronjes. Ben Tuck out of the race today. David Pittard racing for Aston Martin, and Christian Cronjes is racing number 34, which is in second place overall. So the driver who, who really sprung a huge surprise with Walking Horse Motorsport, winning the Spa 24 hours a handful of years ago. You know, this could become their day. But it will take a trip up from Rover Racing because they're absolutely in the power seat with that 99 car, Peter. 47 seconds the good. They are, but as you say, we're only half distance. Um, it's been exciting, action-packed, fun-filled first two hours of the race. We've got two more of it to go. Anything could happen yet. Looks as if the weather is going to stay static. I think, we're, I think we're fairly confident on that one. That's not going to throw in a variable as it can so often here in the Eiffel Mountains. So I feel that one's going to be uh, a nice constant. Uh, but this one, it's not. Uh, it's not too well. I think it was about nine degrees when we started this race, wasn't it? Um, so fairly cool conditions. Yeah, it's uh, 14 degrees now. So 
Yeah, no, it's 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 all kind card conditions. Four years ago it was. Philip Eng, Thomas Blom, Tom Blomfrist, excuse me, and Christian Cronius winning the Spa 24 hours. And I just remember afterwards, Henry Walkenhorst, the team boss, was uh, walking down pit lane towards the podium. He just did he just couldn't stop laughing and smiling because they just didn't expect to top of works crews and stuff and, and ever, uh, you know, before and since of course staunch supporters of BMW but uh, it's great when you see someone who doesn't expect to win something something that's as big as that and they come away we've done it we've only gone and won the things they say absolutely opposite side here at the Nürburgring I'm going to, I'm going to present you with a little um, uh, little suggestion here the penalty minimum pit stop penalty for the Danhoff BMW go on was by one second. One second. One second. Because I, all it was. I thought it must be tiny because I yeah. didn't see any great shift of positions relative to those who pitted exactly. at other times. That's what it was. That's what they got the uh, the drive through for. Okay, one second. So, who is going to go faster than the best lap of the race set by Augusto Farfus? Expect Farfus and the gang to be in next time around. Because they would have got to the end of 14 laps and they'll have that nice, neat pattern of seven lap first stint, seven lap second stint. We'll just have to wait and see. And as if on cue, 14 laps completed, 99 as I talk about it, brought in by Augusto Farfus. Expect number 34. Andy Suchek to come in next uh, this time as well because you don't really, especially as that car, the 34 car did a, a would have done an eight lap stint, would have done a six followed by an eight. That's the car in second place and will a lot of the others as well. But that is a big tidy lead. In fact, suddenly you know it looked as though in that first half hour of the race, Peter, when things were suddenly becoming, you know, we had slow zones and th those first two BMWs got clear of them and were sort of given an advantage by a slow zone clearing for them and catching those behind. It was a two horse race and unfortunately with the BMW junior team having its problems with the extra visits, it's a one horse race. Andy Suchek does come in to make the second pit stop for the 34 Walken Horse Motorsport BMW, but he's 43 seconds in arrears. To regain 4.3 seconds is hard enough. In a, in a series like this, on a circuit like this, uh, but uh, it, you know, conditions, incidents give it and they take it away. You might be able to haul that back, but they're so evenly balanced in terms of driving talent. But that sort of margin, that is that is one to squander. It is, and, the, and they didn't. They took a they took advantage of you said at the beginning. So uh, top three into the pits now: Fafa, Suchek, and Jamonet and uh, Beretta. So one, two, three, and five into it. Van der Linde uh, out at the moment. Still, that he's going to stay out. Top four cars into the pits. Evander Linda served the pit stop. Has my, my apologies. Last indeed. time around. Yes, sorry. T'other one. Yeah, so those that came in will we'll get the order settling down, but one thing, unless there's an absolute calamity in the pit lane for the 99 Rover racing crew, they will be back in the lead of the race uh, when these pit stops are completed. And presumably, Augusto Farfus will hand over to Connor De Filippi in stint number one. Only two drivers in that car originally penciled in to have uh, Nick Chiloli along with them, but uh, that's not the case. So often has been the case over the years here, you have a list of drivers and then for whatever reason, or just a decision the team reckons, you know, it's so competitive, we might be better with just two drivers in our lineup rather than three. So obviously with three, one of the drivers ends up doing two stints, whether they do stint one and stint four, or they do stints one and two, and their teammates do the third and fourth of those kind of stints. So down to turn one goes the field another time, just looking for people up and down the pit lane. Oh, the Datsia Logan's uh, back out. They've just reloaded the picnic hamper, put in the boot. In fact, it's come out of a pit garage onto the pit apron and then stopped. So, Any chance to get it on camera, you see? Want to yeah. Get it behind the race leader coming out of the pit. So put it on quick now. It's good sponsor coverage. Yeah, it works well, but... Uh, so Conor De Filippi out of the pits, having taken over from Augusto Farfus, and that lead, just to reiterate, was 43 and a half seconds when it uh, went into the pits ahead of Andy Suchek, who came in from second place. But they, the order's going to be shuffled a little bit because some of the drivers did their second pit stop 
a lap early. We'll see how they slot together, but the immutable fact is it's a 40 plus second advantage for the 99 Rover Racing BMW. In a day of incident, but also excellent, it must be said, from Conor de Filippi and the driver who did sit number two, Augusto Farfus. Conor had the hardest stint, not just because he had to take the start of the race, Peter, but also because he had to marshal and manage all those moments going in and out of slow zones. And also elements where times when there were little bits of debris out on the circuit, so easy to pick up a puncture here. And as I say that, uh, looking at a super slow-mo of um, the Octane 126 Ferrari at uh, the carousel, going up a little bits that could cut the tyres down on the inside, in the dip, in the bowl there. And you can see naturally the drivers have to have that much room to adapt and manoeuvre there, but uh, you know when you see something sharp lying in the track, you've got to go around it. Well, exactly, and we saw that with a little bit of onboard footage we had for the, uh, on the Grello 911 Manti uh, Porsche, just before a few corners back on its, on its lap that became its ultimate demise, but going down through uh, uh, Adenauer onto the bridge there, there was a big accident with the car off on the right and debris everywhere and they had to slow down and the, the BMW in front slowed down the Porsche did the same but they drove up the kerb onto the grass to go round so much debris on the track just to, it's actually a better option to be on the grass and risk it over a kerb than run over carbon that is almost guaranteed to shred a tyre do a tyre wall or something doing nobody which you don't want to find at a later, later part of the track at very high speed and don't forget that uh, quite early in the race there was a wheel lying in the middle of the track which came off uh, the KTM crossbow that had done so well the gt2 level car there are two of them in this race entered by true racing and um for the driver on board at the time who was that it was mad silly how uh, who'd only just taken over you know we thought i just saw the car sitting down on the right rear as it came into the pits of our puncture there but you, you spotted very well your years of experience identified that the wheel was missing <laughs> my years of experience identified the wheel was missing <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you go. There's a qualification if ever there was. I do like it's, to big people yes, up. Yes. I'm so glad it's finally come to use. <laughs> I've found my niche in life. I've found you another one. Slow zone up. Well, slow zone upgraded to code 60 at Style Strecker. There have been quite a few problems out there. That's uh, Marshall's Post 139, as well you know. So, Peter now goes to his very clever moving map. And he's going to try and identify what exactly is at the side of the track but uh, in synopsis as uh, sammy matty trogan the, the star of the i racing scene who, who's moved across to, to racing sort of uh, full metal is running in second place behind Conor de Filippi. it's bmw from bmw with julian andlauer putting a porsche into third place and if you were away for a bit and came back and th were thinking oh well that's possibly the winners of the opening round Manti Racing, alas not, their car out of the race. Fred Machiavici with broken steering. And the car had to be flat bedded back home to be put inside of the garages at the start of the Nordschleife, just behind the, by the Sabine Schmidt's curb is where they tend to put cars that are broken. They don't want to clutter an already very busy paddock and pit lane here. Yeah, we've got 150 plus starters, so that tends to be the format if the car brought in on a flatbed truck, because we don't want to bring a flatbed truck down the pit lane if they could possibly help it, Peter. No, well, no competitive car causing the slow zone, you just mentioned, but it is, um, I think it's just an intervention vehicle bringing something back, right out of the way, to getting into a, a place of safety, that's all there was that was on the track. That would be an interesting place to be in race control, looking at all those street screens, monitoring all those corners. If you do it, say, silver... Haven't we got any, are there not enough screens in here for you? I can't see... You the, just, I always can't want more, don't you, Joan? Always want more. I can't see the screens for the screens, but imagine being in there. At most circuits, you have a, an image of pretty much the whole track, every corner, you know, so you can check, for instance. Imagine how many eyes you need in your head to be in race control here. And also to be able to respond. How, hold on, we had 32 course vehicles, but 23 are out on the circuit in the wrong part. And, you know, you've got a huge distance to cover. I, I think it'd be the most remarkable thing. And I, I, I really absolutely take, take my hat off, not just because I'm indoors, but just simply because it's a phenomenal job they do. And in fact, now I've put that idea into my head, I really would like to go across. Well, I, I think it's there. I think there's, and have there's, a go. There's a film there. There's a, there's a podcast thing there. A, a, a Day in Race Control with Bruce Jones, Dr. Jones. I would have melted after half half an hour. I just this is just too you still, still be taller than me. <laughs> you still stop. You stop from a different altitude anyway. <laughs> I'd come down to earth, but I, no, I do think it would be a phenomenally interesting place to be because also it's just this. 
the lines of communication. Right, you can see there's a problem. How fast, how well is that communicated to the three course vehicles closest to you know, the point of the incident and what other vehicles do we need? Do we need a, a you know, one of those trucks that has a, a roller brush on it? And um, how many flatbeds do we need? Oh, the flatbeds are already just in use. You know, it's, it's a, an ongoing issue, but I, I think... I can see it now, behind the scenes with Bruce and Snowy. There you go. Yeah. It, it would, it would just. No, I just think everybody should take a look. And if you, if you ever, you're, if you, you're so impressed with that idea, you'd actually watch it yourself, wouldn't you? I never watch television. <laughs> I never have time. <laughs> Too busy looking at all the screens. No, but anyhow, I'll, I'll park that thought for now. But I, it really is because I think today they've been really tested, and it's just sort of ironic in so many ways that you expect. You know, if you come into race control here on a day where the weather has an enormous storm coming in from Spa Francorchamps. You know, just over the border, you're thinking, all right, we're in for one today. But we started in spring weather, clear, slightly cold, and yet, you know, they, they've really had to work so hard. And we're only just, just over the halfway distance in this four-hour race, the, the 53rd Adenauer Rundstrecken Trophy. You'll be pleased to know that there is a, a video of uh, race control that's available. I will send you the link. No, send it. To, tell people what the link is, if you have the link that you can no, read. If it, <laughs> it's... If I had the link to read, that's exactly what I would have done, Joseph. Thank okay, you. good. We need to clarify these things. Right, for Aston Martin fans around the world, they lead this race, but only by dint of David Pittard being in the pit and lane. And how appropriate on St George's Day, and Aston Martin in the lead. There you have it. But don't forget, before this, the Aston Martin Shh, from it. TF don't, Sports don't the story. was running in about seventh place where it started. It fell as low as ninth in the opening stint, it was brought back up to seventh. But uh, that's in the pits at the moment after 15 laps because that was one of the last cars to pit first time around. And this time around, that's come in from its short lived lead. And the other car that's come in after 15 laps from pit stop is the Octane 126 Ferrari. Simon Trummer has just brought that in. But uh, expect when they jumble back into the order, the Aston Martin to be within the top 10 and the Aston the Ferrari not so. But it will be. Conor de Filippi leading this race. Dan Harper's car with the, the drive through and then the come and drive in and stop penalties have really been struck. You know what, Peter? I'm just going to clarify something. We talked about a drive through and then another visit to the pits. I think mm -hmm. they were one and the same thing. Did they come in on lap 11 and lap 12? You can have a look at that because I'm just looking at time lost. They're still only listed as having three visits, the, two visits to the pits. If they'd had a drive well, through. Well, there's not, because they've got. So, this the, the 44 BMW Junior team car we're talking about, yes? Correct. So, Verhagen, six laps, Harper, five laps. There yeah. was then. That's lap uh, 12. Oh, it's lap 11. There's, there's, one, there's one lap there. And then, right. Harper again, is now three laps in. Okay, so they've had three so there pit is, stops. Look, there is a. It looks like it does on a one lap and come back in again. Well, no, because he took over the car. He then yeah. came in one lap, oh, shortly later for a drive-through penalty. And then he came in the lap after that as well? Yes. OK, that's what I want to clarify. Yep. And, and you've got a bar on your screen. So it should actually list on the side of the screen they've made three pit stops. It's only listed two. That's what's confusing me. Aston Martin still in the pit lane, the TS Sport car. Don't worry, Aston Martin fans, it's a standard pit stop. And in fact, another Aston Martin, the GT4 one, is in the pit lane at the same time, about five garages further to the east. Other than that, it's a quiet pit lane off those big flurries. Looking to see if the 26 Ferrari from Octane 126 team has gone back out. Can't quite see that yet, but expect Conor de Felipe. Rover Racing started on pole position, were pushed, were challenged, to still be leading this race. It really has fallen their way. Uh, that's to take nothing away from Conor de Felipe, who's back on board, and Augusto Farfas, who did the second of what will be four stints. Cup 2 at the moment, that's the Porsche Cup class cars. 19th place overall, car 102 leading the way in that category. And that's a, a change, it was a K Kramer racing car leading early on, but it's Tobias Buller who's sharing with Paul Karkema, Dutch racer along with the German. Um, that's Black Falcon, they've had so much success here, that's their team identicar entry. And that's sitting on a lead by, yeah, about... Uh, Fairly comfortable. No, in fact, it's not. Sorry, I beg your pardon. That's second in class. It's 104 leading the way at the moment after that flurry of pit stops. That may well change when you're immediately after a pit stop thing. It's another car from the Black Falcon team, and it's Carlos Rivas 
who is leading that class. Looking for changes at the top. Ooh, Dan Harper certainly responded. His last lap very nearly got below eight minutes. Eight minutes, point six seconds. So at least he's still in the fight, but he'll be handing over very soon indeed to Max Hess, one would pre presume, in the, in the cycle of drivers. Connor de Filippi, obviously his last lap time, if one looks at screams, was, was not that quick, but that's because it included a pit stop. But uh, certainly he has the fastest lap of the race. 7 minutes 58.487 seconds, which actually was set by his teammate Augusto Favs, wasn't he? In that sort of fanfare just before his, the end of his stint. I'm going to add something else to this. Go on. Bruce, just to, as you're obviously getting to too much of a conclusion here, so I'm going to add a little bit further in. I want clarity. Well, I'm not going, I'm not going after that. That's, no. that's, that's your role. Um, <laughs> there's a possibility that the 44 BMW was told soon enough about its penalty as it went out that it only completed the GP lap and came back in again. That is a masterstroke. But let me absorb that and uh, Indeed. get back to you because it came in on lap 11 want, and lap exactly. 12 i don't want you peaking too early take your time no. got, well i'm in the second half of the 40 race. minutes to go pace yourself man it's all about endurance it's all about excitement about passion perfect team there you go endurance and excitement looking for the moves and shakes yeah, open a shop on king's road shouldn't we endurance and excitement <laughs> we have now moved back to 1980 <laughs> exactly Depends which way you turn out of, the, out of the door, left or right. So, just trying to see if anybody else has got a shout in this battle against the 99 Rover Racing BMW. It's quick when it's on the track. It's got the bolster, the cushion over the BMW Junior team. But the big question to me is how close the rest can get. But the best of the rest at the moment is the 34 Walken Horse Motorsport BMW. And it's just not as quick. Sammy Matty Trogan has taken it over for the third stint. It was started by Christian Kronjes, driven very well. Andy Sujek, very well. Now with Sammy Matty Trogan. But I'm just not seeing the pace out of that car. Maybe it'll come later in the stint. But I just think uh, Rover Racing, with all their experience, have got this one pretty taped. Sort of come their way. But, you know, the finish driver, Sammy Matty Trogan, short in experience, but he's gaining it all the time. Since he came across from you know looking at screens and racing on screens to racing in the real world, spent time working with the Williams Formula One team as one of their simulator operators, which is um, it's one of those jobs that actually is fantastic for people who are shouted at by their parents for spending too much time on the computer. <laughs> Gaming, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes. yeah. What are you earning, Dad? Um, again, just looking up. Seal of approval from our. Teenager on the opposite side of the mixing desk here. Obviously proves the, the gaming philosophy. I was trying to think of a funny reply, but I'll, I'll come back to you on that one. No, but I... No, I, I when, when I said pace yourself, I didn't mean in terms of jokes. That, that <laughs> sort of punchy... Yeah, <laughs> punchlines at the right time are helpful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Teasing your audience again. Preferably at the end of the joke. So It is better, isn't it, there? It, I reckon it, it's, it's the norm. Is. It is, it is. Right, I just want to have a little look and see. Down the timing timing sheets, how Sam Neary's getting on. He's been sharing with Esteban Muth, and hopefully still is, and uh, Florian Weber, and he's a British GT racer. Richard Neary's son, they've been doing great things over the last couple of years, particularly with their ABBA racing Mercedes, but he's one of those drivers trying to do that sneaky thing called getting your ring licence for the Nürburgring Nordschleife, which is, you know, actually, I can't think of almost... You think about drivers going out and getting their experience uh, on the banking in the Indianapolis 500 at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and they, they largely go out with a very few cars on the track or even one at all. But here you're doing with 150 something other cars. And, um, when you say Sam Neill doing wonderful things over the last couple of years, I've just, just checked his age. He is only just 19 now, because mm. I remember being at uh, Snettenham when he ran, uh, as you say, shared with his dad uh, in that uh, GT3 Mercedes, first time out. And uh, I remember Richard standing down the pitch and turned to me and had the marker when he said, is that thing off? I said, it is. And then explained in, in Anglo-Saxon terms at how impressed he was that his son was quicker than him first time in the car. <laughs> he said, well, <laughs> cheeky little son, you know, etc., etc." of... I said he could drive the car, not beat me. I was like, you might want to watch this one then. <laughs> Richard? I, I remember talking to, to Richard Neary during... Um, he was a Silverstone... Oh, to be fair, he just, he just turned 20 next week. Does he? Yes. Ah, yeah. 
12 hours, 24 hours, I can't remember, years ago. And, and he said, I was interviewing him and he said, that's really great because Sam, Sam's, Sam's on the way to Italy on a school ski trip. He's listening to this in the back of the coach. <laughs> <laughs> that's dedication. So, anyhow, so just, just to finish that thought, Morgan Horse Motorsport running Sam Neary, Esteban Muth and Florian Weber in the M2 CS racing class, which is listed as uh, BMW C2S racing. I'm just trying to see where that car is in in that sequence in that particular class car number eight 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 yes triple eight just taking a look for that but anyhow wherever it is listed in class it's useful experience being gained because you can't race on the ring until you can race on the ring i think that's the simple, simple expedient there Right, again with these long laps, just waiting for the cars to come through to the end of the lap. Right, Dan Harper leading the race by 16 and a half seconds from Conor De Filippi. Is there a however there? I can't work out how that can actually have happened because he's had more visits to the pits, he's had the drive through. I know he pitted a lap. The first pit stop was much longer for Conor De Filippi. The 99 car. It was 23 seconds longer, but of course, what you lose in by an early pit stop, sorry, you lose by a late, early, late pit stop at the end of your first stint, you gain commensurate in, in your final pit stop with this special sliding scale that uh, we have for the Nurburgring Langstrecken series. Yellow zone at Schwalbenschwanz, so the end of the lap or the corner before the you get onto the start finish, not the start finish straight, the long run through Dottinger Hurt. More problems there. That was where we lost the Grello Racing, Manta Racing Grello Porsche. Maybe someone else has come a clatter. It's a yellow zone, not, now it's a slow zone. And Galgenkopf, it's now code 60, so that you can see how just in the space of two corners it went from yellow flag to, to slow zone. And uh, so that has moved. So that will affect everybody coming onto that long run, the long drag back towards uh, the end of the lap, the point on which the circuit on which drivers desperately try and get a toe to make an overtaking loop. It's been so difficult, so constricted around the Nordschleifer, they really want to stretch their legs when they get onto that long run through Dossing Her and then uh, frustration. So that's the there. Huber Motorsport entry uh, of number 25. The spinner on lap one at turn one. Yeah. That's the car that uh, appeared to be stopped in the middle of the track at uh, Schwalben. Or Gobben, yeah, it is at Schwalben. Yeah, so just onto the dotting hoe, isn't it? Yeah, so it's just there. Gobbenkopf, yeah. So not a, not a great place to be stopped. Right, I'm just going to finish the thought I started. Heaven forbid. Irrespective of the fact that there been the drive through hands, we seem to have the BMW junior team car in front. But its first pit stop was 23 seconds shorter than the pit stop served by the car that started on pole, the 99 Rover racing car. If they come in, again, separated by a lap, which around here at the moment without stoppages is eight minutes, the difference if they come in, it could, it could, he could be handing back those 23 seconds. That's almost precisely how it works out on the sliding scale that I have in front of me. So it's something one always have to consider, but we have also considered the fact there have been two extra visits to the pits for the BMW junior team car. So it's really, but it's still listed on the timing screen as only being in the pits twice. Yet we've changed, of course, from, I think Dan Harper owes us a pit stop. That's the point at the moment. I think he has, yeah. could you just double check there on your, on your magic screen of screens? Which because ones I choose from? Pick a, pick a screen. Best of three. I, okay. you know, um, Rock, paper, scissors? Yeah, that's it. Okay, done. Because uh, still waiting to drive that car is Max, Max Hess. Dan hasn't done a double stint, so it's, I, I don't quite get this. I, okay, with three drivers, you could say you're doing stint two and stint three, and Max will do the final stint, but... Oh, other bits of paper. I haven't got number 44. It's listed as coming in since lap 12. Or was that 11 and a quarter? Well, exactly, that's my point. So I think I think it's going to have to be this time around for Dan Harper, but he's listed to go. He's going to, if he comes in next time, he'll have done six, seven. Well, we'll have to see. But he owes us a pit stop. Is the long and short of it. Conor De Filippi is sitting pretty. He's 16 and a half seconds down. But as soon as BMW Junior Team car comes into the pits, then that will all change. Sammy Matty Trogan 
Uh, he's been able to claw all of that back. I mean, it's looking very good for BMW, the top three positions. Um, but, uh, and how long was it in the pits for? Because uh, under the regulations, it's uh, non-compliance. These are the exact words of the rule. Non-compliance with a minimum pit time will result in a time penalty, stop and go penalty, which will correspond to the amount of time below the minimum pit time inflicted by the Which was one second. Which was one second. So, if you weren't confused before, you are now. It's official. So who is fastest on track at the moment? That could be a point as well. So, the person I'm looking at at the moment is Julian Andlauer. His car, his fourth place. He's the 27 entry, the Top Sport WRT Porsche. So he's the best of the Porsche drivers. He is six seconds faster than the car he's chasing down, which is Sammy Matty Trogan. He's about 22 seconds back, but you know, only a handful of laps. He should be able to get on his tail if he can carry on with that margin of um, gain. So Sammy Matty, the, the, the Finnish driver, is going to have to work very hard indeed. I want to see his next lap. His last lap was not good. It was 8 minutes, 16 seconds. So he's losing 10 seconds, the two cars in front of him, and 6 seconds, the one behind. So this could be critical time for the Finn. Julian Andlauer. Fleetingly was the youngest driver ever to compete at, compete at more. He was born on exactly the same day as... Hold on, an American racer that weekend. I'll come back to you on a second on that one. When he was at the Mall and realised he'd lost out because his mother had him a little early, a little earlier in the day than the other one on the side <laughs> of the Atlantic so he wasn't the youngest driver at Le Mans but that's all going to be Only smashed this year hours. by Josh Pearson young, young racer who's uh, come across from the States racing with United Autosports pushing it down to levels in which you and I know we were probably just dreaming about getting our first moped <laughs> yes hadn't even progressed to four wheels still stuck at two I know Glickenhaus still going there or thereabouts, down in 16th place. So it's good to have that bit of variety, but it's all BMW up at the front of the field. It's all Porsche in the Porsche Cup class. That keeps you on your toes, doesn't it? And I'm just looking to see what is happening in the world of Audi. Kubuki Maziak appears to be in the best place of those. Number 16 in sixth place overall. Yeah, that's all good for him. He's showing with Michele Beretta. And the one who's out of sequence is um, the best of the Cup 2 runners. I fleetingly said it was 102 that had assumed position of dominance in that class, thinking what happens at 112. But I didn't look up the timing screen enough because uh, 112 is now listed as fourth overall, but that will fall after its latest pit stop is served. But uh, that was started and driven really very well indeed for K. Kramer Racing by Moritz Kratz. It's now in the hands of. Um, Christopher Brook and then the boss man himself, Carsten Kramer, will bring that home. But that, that um, dominating the Cup 2 class car. One oh four also going well in that class as well. That's third in the Porsche Cup class. That's uh, Kaya at the wheel at the moment. Just because, uh, only because the car in front of it, Schall, has just dived into the pit lane. Which of the shells is in 120? That would be almost oh, constant in shell. But uh, first to second, the gap is still. Well, last time around, the gap in terms of lap pace, we found the race lead was 10 seconds down on Connor de Filippi. But it's it's all of a jumble at the moment. So I really need so for you to just constantly just see if we can have any further messages about about the penalties that have been served by Dan Harper's car because he took it over after that brilliant opening stint from Neil Verhagen who remember was half a second down at the mm. end of that stint one well, he was off the tail of the 99 BMW from Rover Racing then came not one but two visits to the pits and yet the car is still listed out in front by 21 seconds now what gets me here it's almost of those times. I don't know how you could rescind any of that, but the gap between them in terms of pit stop minimum time in the pits is 23 seconds so far in terms of if they were straightforward pit stops. But we saw two further visits to the pits from Dan Harper in the 44, in the 44 TM, TM, BMW Junior Team car. Something doesn't add up, does it? There's something is not adding up. It's almost like the penalty's been taken away. But yeah, it's, if he had a time penalty, 
that was then taken rescinded, that's fine. But if you've had to come into the pits to serve a penalty, that can't actually put you back in the lead of the race. Unless they've put it, they've taken the time that he came into the pits. They've decided that the, the, the appeal the appeal was served, an appeal was proved, and they've just said, OK, you're behind on the track, but we'll give you the time that you had in the pits. I, 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 I just don't get it. I don't no. understand the timing screens. I need to see them come across the start-finish line with my eyes to just gauge where they are respectively. They're listed at 21 seconds apart with Harper's car, the 44 BMW junior team car, leading the race from the 99 car of Rover Racing. It's BMW ahead of BMW, but there is confusion. So we've got to get to the foot of what is happening. They're both listing as, listed as having been in the pits twice. That's absolutely correct for Conor De Filippi. It's a 99 car, but we've seen, I've seen the Harper car come in three times, three times and we yes. think it's coming yeah. four times. It's had two, yeah. well, has it had its third pit stop? Well, we've got a, long, a longer wait for that because the... Sorry, it's second official pit stop. Yeah, exactly. it's second, yes, it's second official pit stop um, because the 44 car is currently just approaching uh, Allenberg. So it's got a, the bulk of the lap to go. Yeah. It's not, not even not about a third of the way around the lap. So we need to see that come across the line and sort of reset this the screen for us, which is always one of the, the vagaries of, of the Nürburgring because used to having cars come in by roughly, I would say, a minute and a half is sort of a standard sort of lap length for uh, average for ease, but it resets very quickly. We don't get the opportunity here because it's, uh, yeah, we're talking eight minute laps. So it's a little while for that to go around, but it's uh, it's steadily making its way around. So the car that's, uh, so 99 is, where's that on track at the moment uh, in relation to the 44 as in terms of physical distance on track? Had an hour forced at the moment, coming to Metzgersfeld. So it's not huge then. So it's not huge. The other was it? Arenberg just a few moments ago. Lap times are all over the place. The last lap um, for Connor de Felipe, his lap time, I know there were slow zones uh, dropped around the circuit, but he was suddenly 14 seconds down on his previous previous lap that just shows how complicated it is to uh, chart this race and track position clearly if you have a, a little circuit spotter is, is very very advantageous to be able to observe you can be sure they're all very busy and just just to give you a sign of how much slower that lap was for Conor de Filippi that, that car's best lap set by his teammate was um, 20 well 22 seconds faster than he managed last time around with no really clear obvious problem on the circuit other than a, a, a yellow flag uh, around a couple of points I think it was around the circuit but of course they have to observe all those so the cut two car the, the interloper that was uh, suddenly listed up in fourth position after its uh, latest pit stop is uh, fallen from third or fourth down to 16th place. That puts it still in the lead of the Cup 2 class cars, but uh, not by as much as it was before, but clearly running a different pit stop sequence. Another car that's running a different pit stop sequence is the the number 38 entry, which is a Dynamic Motorsports one. That ended up with lots of pit, stop, pit visits early on. It's had four under its belt, so no wonder Adrian Delina is down in 18th place overall, but it was Matteo Caroli who was at the wheel when it seemed to have a couple of extra pit stops in the first stroke second stint so they'll be spending all their time just trying to catch a back up again but uh, it just goes to prove that quite a lot of teams in this race have had their moments had or had other people's moments for them in some way and have fallen down the order so it means some of those that started outside the top 10 should definitely get within it one car that's doing a very good job of doing that at the moment is manuel metzger in the number 12 team bilstein liveried uh, out racing team Mercedes who's uh, in seventh place has he just gained place I think he might have let's see is he close to Kuba Gimaziak I think he might have just picked off Kuba Gimaziak who's um, out in one of the Audis and uh, yeah I think that's the, the team team Phoenix car the Shearer Sport team Phoenix entry the showing with Michele Beretta so I think Metzger has uh, gained the position so there's a place gain that's the top Mercedes in the race, only just getting into the top six. So it hasn't been a great day for Audi, hasn't been a great day for Mercedes. It's been a busy day for the course vehicles, another one out on track as Metzger um, picks his way past it. But uh, certainly that car that Metzger is sharing with uh, Lucas Stoltz 
started way down the order. It was about around 15th place in that first stint, but uh, going forward ever since. That's uh, good to see from their point of view. Right, just going back to this uh, number 44 BMW Junior team car entry. It had its first pit stop after six laps, and it spent two minutes, 34 seconds in the pits. Yep. Yep, that's the standard one. Correct. Then had another in-lap at lap 11. Yep. For 29 seconds. It's drive-through. Correct. I think. It then had another one on lap 11 oh. for 46 seconds. So two on lap 11. So the, Correct. The, the, and the then on lap, then lap 12, it had a 2 minute 28 stop. OK. All so right. it's first stop is 2.34. Second one's 2.28, which will be right, but there's a 29 second and a 46 second identified by race control on the history of that car, this race. Two on lap 11 is what I'm trying to get my head yeah. around. We've had a report, someone suggested it, it did the Grand Prix, the half of the Grand Prix loop, yeah. and then came in again. Yeah. You would have to do that? To I don't know. I mean, the, this, this is my point. Have, have they advised? I'm just, again, always very wary on speculating, but have the team advised, because it was a second short, and they've had that say that had that ping to them and said that's too short. As he's gone out, said right, bring it back in straight away and serve a bit more. But is that allowed or not? So I'm, so I'm trying to work it out. So did they say to him, bring it in straight away, not that straight away? It was exactly. Well, no, complete the lap, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> said, yeah. yeah, the full, the yeah, full lap. I know, I know you're fast, but <laughs> I didn't mean to turn around and come back. Cost <laughs> car park space over here, number 44. Well, it's been a. Well, that, that's, I mean, it has been a day of considerable number of um, of incidents out onto the circuit, and uh, well done to those who made it towards the third hour of this race, uh, towards the fourth hour of this race. Good little battles in the various classes, but out front, we still have Dan Harper for BMW Junior Team, despite what uh, what appears to have happened, and uh, Snowy has just been through with its extra visits to the pit, still listed as being 21 seconds to good over Conor de Filippi. 18 laps on the board, and it hasn't come into the pits again, so continuing on its way. Did they decide to just re do all that refueling and everything that's required ahead of on Dan's second visit to the pitch, which is the car's third pit stop. I think we're beginning to think that might be the case. 20 almost, seconds. Almost as if they've out, out clevered themselves. I tried that once. And, yes, I mean, OK. The NLS has fantastic racing on a brilliant circuit. It can get complicated, but I think this one is taking the biscuit in terms of um, different permutations of the way you can go about things. But, you know, for a team that doesn't have the experience on, of this circuit and of this championship God. and the championship rules, I think someone could have made a stumble. But the BMW Junior team, I think, is fully conversant with the rules and they may have just been very, very clever indeed. They might have read the small print on page 408, which said that if you had a time penalty, you could just do a little loop and come through. But anyhow, it's one of those things we almost need to hear from the drivers to just establish what has happened there. But anyhow, lights are flashing. Dan Harper is charging past a TCR class uh, VW Golf does it very well and importantly to do so because it was just before the Sabine Schmitz curve. So sitting on a lead of 19.2 seconds uh, over Conor de Filippi. But uh, really, it's the time of these final pit stops that are going to be absolutely indicative of where exactly we yeah, are. It's only eight, an, eight, uh, an eighth of a second. Uh, they've gained there because it was 20 something before. We might be about to have a place change. I thought Cooper Gimiasiak could already been passed by Manuel Metzger, but down the long straight through Dottinger Hoe, they go towing behind one of the GT2 class KTM crossbows. They go and the Polish racer Gimiasiak still just in front of Metzger. So Metzger hadn't passed him, but he's trying very hard. Doesn't manage to make it stick before Tiergarten. It's maybe going to try and get a tidy exit of the final corner of the lap and then take an attack when they go down past the pits towards turn one. But a great little battle over what position? Over sixth position. Yeah, running right down the pit wall, dive, dive to the left. KTM does look at Mercedes, should dive down by the pit wall, try and get down the inside. Is he going to have a look down the inside? No, he's going the other way, going around the outside. There's too much traffic there, there's no room for that. He's going to try and squeeze his way through, long way round. The KTM is going to be in the way, always going to run out of road there. Uh, never get that one back. He's come back across. He's still tucking in. That KTM is thwarting his chance uh, to get past the Porsche there. But as you don't know, it's for the Audi. My apologies. Now they've got past the KTM, so they're clear of that. And he's got well, nearly got the inside. Then thought better of it. 
certainly got his nose alongside there, Bruce, and thought, oh, no, I think uh, uh, pulled on back. That's, that's not going to work out. The Audi just running a couple of wheels onto the grass there. On the loop, back round now, the end of the GP circuit, this half GP circuit we've mentioned. Lots and lots of traffic in front. One of the 250 BMW, that's one that's sponsored one side but not the other, just trying to keep out of the way. Uh, get the clean, so clean car, clean side of the car out of the way for that one. To need to put some decals on that. Um. Yeah, that really was a case of Manuel Metzger trying to remember what word went with discretion. Valor. No, no, keep the valor in check. Discretion exactly. was the important thing. So good little scrap over sixth position overall. And um, now, just when I thought that was going to uh, come to an end, the there's a sea out that's just just slowed the idea up a little bit. That's put the Mercedes right in position with it. If I could throw something else into this battle, the Aston Martin should be coming into the background of the shot very shortly indeed. It was a lap faster last time around than they were by Marco Sorensen. He gained four, five, six seconds off them. But of course, as they fight, this is his opportunity. But he's uh, how far back? Just under five seconds back. Yeah, he should be able to cl close in in this lap or the next. But we're getting towards the point at which the third of the stints, the four standard stints in this race, nothing standard in this race, um, will be coming towards a conclusion, but uh, certainly... Oh, another slow zone is thrown just in front of them. Now, we just saw a replay there, but that was what well, was showing... I believe that was showing the BMW, which might be alluding to what we're saying about this safety... Uh, um, code 60. The car shooting past a car under the code 60, then, then pulling up. Well, I was trying to, I'm just trying to work out which one it was. I think it was one of the BMWs. One of the GT3 BMWs in the S9 class. Correct, yes, cars. sorry, yes. Okay, we're being shown, I think it's car number 36, which is from the Walkenhorst stable, which is uh, Henry Walkenhorst, Friedrich von Bolen, and Jörg Breuer. Henry Walkenhorst started that up. So, and that is running in the Pro-Am class. No, it's the AM class of SP9, so uh, running sort of fairly much on its own. Dan Harper still listed as leading by 19.2 seconds from Conor de Filippi. It's BMW from BMW, and BMW in third place with Sammy Matty Trogan on board. 91st position overall, three laps down. There have been problems, and that's the car we were just talking about, the car in the SP9 AM class. Um, and of course, when things don't go your way, 91st in any meeting is not something you aspire to, but it's only just outside the top half of this field and emphasises the size of the field in the Nürburgring Langstrecken Serie. We're very much uh, still all racing with an hour and a quarter to go. Du magst Sim Racing? Du liebst die Nordschleife? Und du bist zwischen 14 und 18 Jahren alt? Dann mach jetzt mit bei der DNLS Junior Sichtung. Der Sieger startet zusammen mit Mercedes AMG Fahrer Adam Christo Dugu in der digitalen Nürburgring Langstrecken Serie 2022 und 23. In der Nürburgring Esports Bar kannst du dich jetzt parallel zu jedem NLS Lauf von 13 bis 18 Uhr beim Shootout qualifizieren. Vielleicht bist ja du der nächste Sim Racing Shooting Star. See you then.
Ihnen progressiv beschleunigen. Jetzt Falken Reifen kaufen und Tankgutschein sichern. Weitere Informationen auf tankgutschein.falkenreifen.de Falken Reifen First, Asphalt Watch. Die ersten Zifferblätter aus echtem Rennstreckenasphalt. Auf dem Asphalt wurden Legenden geboren und magische Momente erlebt. Cobblor. Direkt neben einer der legendärsten Rennstrecken der Welt baut die Hubert Haupt Immobilienholding einen neuen Premium-Gewerbestandort für anspruchsvolle Motorsport- und Automotive-Unternehmen. Sichern Sie sich jetzt Ihren Platz auf der Pole Position. Liebe Fans, besucht unsere Social Media Kanäle von Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter und TikTok. Willkommen zu NLS. Be the winner. It does seem strange have days when you really aren't talking about uh, some, some of the cars that frequently feature at the front end of the field and the number eight BMW uh, Mercedes with a lineup that is solid gold. Adam Christodoulou, Maxi Gotts and Mauro Engel. And to find that outside the top 10, Mauro at the wheel, third driver in that sequence. He's in 11th place overall. I'm sure he's lapping at decent pace. Yeah, fairly decent pace, but he's he's 13 seconds down on the car in 10th place. That's a, that's a big margin around here, but the pink, white and uh, BWT livery Mercedes going well, but just not in the hunt today. Didn't get it together in qualifying. Qualifying was very much stop-start affair, as uh, Peter mentioned at the top of the show. And the race has followed in that similar vein with um, incidents I think for a lot of drivers, they seldom get two laps of their stint in 
consecutive order in which they have no slow zones, no yellow flags. It's been an extraordinary day, extraordinary day, yet in dry conditions. Dry, simple, perfect conditions for them. I'm still trying to work out this number 44. I don't want to, um, I'm going to say harper on about it. That's a bit too obvious, isn't it? Um, your point is absolutely right. On the right-hand side of the timing screen, it says pit stops, two. That's what we, we rely on. But the, the same information is contradicting because it definitely says a number 44 car analysis, if you look at that particular amount of that car, has pitted three times. It's extraordinary business. For Hagen six laps, Harper five laps, and then back in again for seven odd seconds and out again. And now this is, his, this is its fourth run of seven laps, on seven laps now. Yeah, I mean, there's still, still logic. Three drivers in the car, yeah. so if you, you run the sequence for Hagen, Harper, Harper, and Max Hess to bring it home to victory, well, of course, that, that's the sort of plan. But we have had these these moments, and uh, I keep looking across to, to Peter's 45 timing screens, and um, there is definite sign of the other visits to the pits. They're just not listed on other timing screens. So uh, things can be confusing. I am going to branch away and have a very quick look if I can find another source of timing screens. I, I mean, I, I really think it's been a fabulous day for uh, BMW. It's just simply trying to understand the ramifications of the BMW junior team. It's, it's, I've, yeah, I've the, not known a race like this for being so perplexing. The, there's definitely, on this on this 44 car, there's um, uh, Neil Verhagen started the race and did six laps. Came to the pits, 47 second uh, pit stop. It's fine. Harper then does five laps, 43 second pit stop. Yep. Mm-hmm. So comes in, starts lap seven, comes in lap 11. There is then an in and an out, start and end, recorded by race control for the 44 BMW junior team car, Dan Harper at the wheel, of lap 12 for seven seconds. And now he's on this stint, which started at lap 13, in progress still which would because he should be finishing. I would predict that Dan Harper is going to bring uh, this car into the pits on the end of this lap. So it might just be, Bruce, that this all works out when these two complete their next pit stops because the second place car, De Filippi, he completed seven laps. Augustus Farfus, seven laps. And De Filippi is five laps into his stint now. Right. Whereas Dan Harper's on seven laps into his already. So... Dan Harper's unlikely to go for an eighth lap, I'd have thought, in that car. It probably coming in at the end of this lap. If he can go to an eighth lap, then that will um, bring it's got them... a bigger fuel tank than we thought. <laughs> yes, yes, it's a miracle. Yes. Uh, right, Dolphin so fills I, very quickly by the look of it. I just looked at another another timing system, and Dan Harper's car, the 44 BMW Junior Team car, is also listed still with two pit visits, whereas uh, Intelligence, or, or maybe the eyes in our heads, sometimes suggest that it came in more. And uh, so... This one could keep us entertained right to the finish. But uh, well, we're going to find out fairly shortly because Dan Harper, the leading car, is just coming out of the dotting of her up the tier garden and will be diving for the pits, I'm surmising. I'll be amazed if it doesn't. And indeed, straight over to the right-hand side, into the pit lane. So Dan Harper brings the 44 junior team entry into the pit lane. This is his... Is it his third or his fourth stop? <laughs> Well, I, I did ask him for the race. Just keep an eye on Dan Harper. And, and you know, it's been busy, hasn't it? He's made it all about him, hasn't he? <laughs> Throwing us all into confusion. Wait. So, straight in. Car up on its jacks. Uh, drive. There is a driver change. And it... Uh, just trying to see who's going to go into that. It is... It'll be Max Hess Max going Hanks in. Have gone into it, yes. And uh, the Rover Racing car goes on for another lap. Now, bear in mind that their pit stops will be, providing this is a, a clear lap, eight to nine minutes, somewhere in that margin. And that can be a difference of 23, 24 seconds. Yeah, the he's, lead. he's only completed six laps now, so he can he got another lap in hand yeah. on that one. If he can, yeah, if he can do that and one more, if he can stretch it to eight seconds, uh, eight, eight laps, then uh, that will be in the bag. I think uh, Caution, when you're sitting on a potential advantage, uh, will be enough. But it's still possible, according to time screens, this is all fair and square. But I, I, it's just, I simply haven't known a race like this in a, well, forever, where we have seen extra runs through the pits. We haven't seen astonishing laps that could gobble up that time deficit. 
and still the Dan Harper BMW Junior Team car ought to be just about in the lead of this race where with those extra pit stop visits it, when all these final pit stops are done it shouldn't be in with a shout it could be it should be running for second place but it is potentially going to come out in the lead of this race or if not very very close to the 99 Rover Racing BMW and um, that's really very very hard to fathom it's much easier to read the fact that these two cars are dominating the race they had that early advantage in the opening stint where the slow zone sort of worked to their favor and not for anybody else like kevin estra who were, who was originally in their wake but lost a whole load of time uh, then he started making it up of course and the car handed over the manti racing porsche was handed over to fred makiewicz who had that moment where he misread a, a moment on the track going through galgen kopf and clattered the barriers there going past the porsche cayman that probably sort of won wandered a little bit out into his path but uh, suddenly the challenge was taken away and it really has been unusual almost unique in the Nürburgring Langstrecken series for have, to have two cars make a break at the front like this and uh, fight so hard but and however all at the same time there is confusion uh, I wish we could uh, sort it out and have absolute clear information for you on this but uh, what our eyes have seen are not being echoed by what we're seeing on the timing screens and that is really very difficult and not just not on the timing screens but you delve into the matter deeply as Peter has been and it almost becomes more perplexing. I feel I'd rather let you down here I've not been so busy delving into that I've not really supported you but I do apologise Bruce. Are you, are you back in the booth now? Um, <laughs> I've no, been I'm sitting here twiddling my thumbs but no you haven't you've been diving very very deep. I'm convinced it's completed a short lap this the 44 car convinced done it just by looking at the times uh, in and out but and however short lap or not but i still can't see how it's managed to make up the extra time of even coming in to do a short little loop through the pits i say you can't have say that the short lap you know you go down through the first three four corners you double right uh, you then go down on up the hill through the vidal chicane and then turn into the pits that's not just losing 20 seconds doing that and then having to do it again you're going to be losing a minute so I, it simply is confusing to me, unless somewhere someone can find out some, on some timing screen or other information screen that we haven't stumbled across, um, how you can shift time. <laughs> so very, very difficult indeed. But it's been a great day, confusing but great. It's been some fabulous racing, but uh, I think really, I just want to applaud uh, Rover Racing, two cars running uh, in at the moment second and fourth places. The 98 car has really progressed well. It was outside the top 10 at the start and um, picked its way little by little by little towards the front end of the field. And they, I reckon how far, yes, it's catching. And it's Sammy Matty Trogan right in their line of sight. So maybe the 34 Walkenhorst Motorsport car won't complete the top three and it will be two rover racing bmws but another slow zone just uh, to throw out in front of the drivers it's on the brakes riding on board with one of the porsche cup class cars that's car number 102 and uh mining its own business pressing on team black falcon black falcon team identica paul arkema and uh, tobias muller and suddenly having to slow right down catching the back of a porsche cayman not clattering it though that's good more course rescue vehicles out on the track cleaning up incidents they've had a very very busy day i mean we haven't had big clatters we've had small car cars sliding off in a small way into barriers and clipping the back of others but uh, and apart from the wheel right rear wheel coming off the number 53 ktm crossbow gt2 that uh, shone so well in the early stages of the race most things have been pretty standard and they did well to remove that wheel from the, the run the blast down through dotting a her Got it off the track, so a big shot from Mad Silly Howe. And as the drivers get out of one zone, uh, course vehicle doing what so many of them do so well. They, uh, they park slightly diagonally at the side of the track with the nose in towards the track to give cover, to guide the drivers over to, say, the right-hand side of the circuit or whichever side they want them to go because there's a flatbed truck and other course vehicles up ahead. And that was the case there. And, uh, I'm full of admiration for the, the officials. For the Nürburgring Langstrecker series, they, they have a difficult job and uh, certainly communication is a phenomenal thing and it's clearly very, very well done, Peter. It is talking of communication. God, no, I can't even say it. God. <laughs> I tried talking, that once. That's a great phrase. Isn't it? Talking of communication, you can't even say the phrase. <laughs> Extraordinary. Um, I've gone old school. Did you send a letter? Well, not, not quite. I had to get the quill out, though. No, I've sent a message to Dan Harper directly oh. and said, 
can you just clarify for us? He may or may not get it. I mean, we can't blame. If he doesn't, there are more important things happening in his world than, than informing the commentators to what he did on his. Uh, but let's ask the man direct. I'm sure he will. He's always been very good at communicating, and he'll. I'm sure I might find that answer later. And if he does, then uh, we'll do a little little extra podcast on it, shall we? <laughs> If you don't know the answer by the end of the race, but I'm um, like you, I'm I'm intrigued as one of the else. I'm not suggesting anything anything wrong. Highly unlikely to do anything wrong. You say the experience, collective experience in that uh, BMW Junior team, highly unlikely to do anything wrong. I'm just intrigued as to why we've got conflicting information. Yes, and, if and I, don't, I don't mind the outcome. I just want to want to have clarity. That's all. No, exactly. And I I, I think honestly, if there had been any. Um, transgression of the rules by doing the short the penalty would have been served by now that's been a good hour ago yeah. so because we've got what 20 laps on the board and that was around the laps 11 and 12 potentially uh so we'd know that by now so i i think it could be well i i still i did enough maths to try and work out you know how to add numbers together and they're still not coming up for me but i think what we have to focus on towards the end of this race is we are now in the final the fourth and final hour is it's BMW all the way. First, second, third and fourth. I mean, that truly is phenomenal. They had four cars in the top six in qualifying, but uh, with their lead rivals having a little bit of problem, but it, even without their rivals having the problem, it appears as though it was going to be BMW's day. But the question to me is just the order in which they will finish this race. Conor de Filippi will be coming in very soon to hand over to Augusto Farfus, who will take the 99 Rover, Rover Racing BMW through to the end of the race. But um, will that be to, to win? Or second place, will teammate Sheldon van der Linde's car, 98, uh, get ahead of Sammy Matty Trogan's car? They'd do a pit stop soon, so they'd be their, their teammates to take it on. But it could be uh, 98 makes it two Rover Motorsport BMWs in the lead of the race, and that would be very impressive for them. As it stands at the moment, it does look very impressive, doesn't it, with the, on the, day, the, the proper debut of this car, really, this weekend. Four of them, three different teams. Well, it's not so much the debut, because we did see a race before they developed it through last year they they, they yeah. hit it hit it running the real debut is is actually the ones in the gt4 class the the concept gt4 concept uh, yeah the gt4 yes. concept they've called it and they, they've been one's been going well they've had a little bit of a little bit of trouble in class but um but it's it's the, BM, the m4 gt3 has been sort of a bit of a slow burn mm. it, it arrived and we saw it last year in these races where it would go out in, in these sort of almost pre-production runs and it would run for about one or hour or hour one and hour four of a four-hour race and then be parked and then when they gave it sort of its full range to go racing it still wasn't quite at the sweet pot spot but they've absolutely whacked it this weekend so far with you say just under an hour to go we do have a code 60 at uh Callan hard at the moment but i can't see a vehicle off there at the moment so from marshall's post 104 through to 108 108A being green and clear. Well, another lap goes on the board for the 99 BMW, Conor de Filippi. Well, I could tell it wasn't coming in that lap because Augusto Farfus was standing with the jacket on rather than just his race overalls. He may be, yeah, he's about to strip it off now. He's got, uh, well, the car should be back around in just over eight minutes' time. But that means it'll be making its final pit stop after 22 laps. Surely... Well, Max Hess has actually now taken over. The, the team, BMW Junior team car has just served its, listed as its third visit to the pits, but we reckon there's still five. How can we be out by two pit stops? Well, we've already been over that. We'll get, <laughs> exactly. to, we'll get to it again at the end. So it's interesting, isn't it? It'll be 22, it'll be a three lap difference in their, in their final pit stop time. Now, I did notice that the sliding scale we have for that final pit stop only can start 69 minutes before the end of this race. But yeah. we're within that now. But the 44, the junior team car, when it came in and Dan Harper handed to Max Hess, that was more than 69 minutes before the end of the race. So I don't know what their minimum pit stop time was. Maybe there wasn't one. But as it is, maybe yeah. they go for a standard minimum pit stop time. I, I know this is confusing round after round. But when this BMW, the race leading 99, comes in, curves around the outside, a very standard looking uh, 325i. What have we got left on the clock? We've got 60, um, it'll be six, so it won't be, it'll be 52 minutes left, but he's got about another six minutes until he gets around towards that. So that'll be 48, his pit stop would be five, 302 seconds. It means nothing, but it's only how long 
the pit stop is relative to anybody else's, but uh, I think their track position should be sufficient for them to be galloping off because their lead without the pit stop is one minute and 10 seconds. That is over the BMW Junior team car. No, it's not. In fact, that's over the Walk and Horse Motorsport car, number 34. Sheldon van der Linde into the pits in the 98 BMW Rover Racing M4 GT3. While he's doing that, teammate Conor de Filippi absolutely charging. He knows his, his race is almost run. He's got to get it back to the pits and not hit the back of that Renault Megane that was just in front of it. And uh, then hand over to his teammate. And his teammate is Augusto Farfus, still the owner of the fastest lap in this race. Seven minutes, 58.487 seconds. Set right at the end of his stint, which was stint number two. He'll be about to take over for stint number four. Lights flashing, and even at this point in the race, Snowy, you can see that not a second should be lost absolutely, by absolutely not. Connor de Filippi going it's, through the Grand Prix loop. It's the time not to become complacent for <sighs> just an hour to go and think it's all done. It's, it's quite the opposite. If anything, concentrate even more right now. We saw how easy it happened to Grello, didn't we, from what the onboard footage we saw, and it's a, a fairly innocuous accident in reality uh, for, for both um, both drivers involved. And I, I really I really couldn't proportion. I don't. Well, I don't like proportioning blame anyway. But I don't think there's. I don't think either was any particular fault there. I think that was just general one of those racing incidents where a slight movement by one has been taken by surprise by another, not have quite the margin of error would normally. And you know. And, and just to it's ex ended up in putting the car out. And yeah, it's, and all it is, it's, it's actually just broken steering. That's what that's all that's happened to it. Really, it hasn't had a hasn't had a major incident. Gone off, rattled down the barriers, and it did a little bit, but that's only because he hadn't got any steering. Yeah, that, that's at uh, Galgen Cop, the exit thereof. So, Fred Machiavici, not. Oh, now we just had Comte de Felipe. No, no, that's the other car, the sister car. Sheldon van der Linde very nearly hit another car as he pulled into pit lane. Sometimes you well, get a bit. Of... Of, that was the 488 BMW that was uh, then going to its pit box to then just swerve in front to take its pit box quite rightly, and you've suddenly got a, a rather large BMW behind you. <laughs> Almost alongside you. Well, that was a uh, very, you know, that you can. I know it's often difficult. It's a very long pit lane here, but uh, for the 98 crew, that was a, a little bit of a moment. I know they're pressing on to gain every nanosecond they can in their battle to try and get up into third place overall, but that was a little, little bit tighter than they'd have liked. Sheldon van der Linder, I think, stayed on board. Yeah, he's doing the third and fourth stints in that car. This is a four hour race. It's the second one of the year. It should have been the third, but two weeks ago, Midweek, it was decided the snow that was already on the ground uh, meant with more snow forecast uh, for the, the, week, the weekend ahead of them that round two shouldn't be held. And, uh, a late season date has been added in November to conclude this year's Nürburgring Langstrecken series. But I think this one is going to go down in the history books as one that was confusing from the start of the second hour through to the end of the race. Still trying to get atop all of the incidents and, well not really the incidents it's just explanation as to how bmw junior team car is still in the mix and my timing screen has suddenly been i oh know of course the others still have to make the final pit stop because right now down in ninth position overall is where max hess is but a lot of his rival teams ahead of him need to come in and make their pit stops but it really is can that car still get on the podium or will it somehow have got victory back in this race, but I don't think it can because their final pit stop was some laps ahead of the one that still isn't, hasn't been served by the 99 BMW crew from Rover Racing. So it's been a dry day, great weather day, a spring day on the Nürburgring Nordschleife. It's BMW all the way. The question is which, and perhaps at the end of it, how? is something I'm going to have in my mind. I've, I've never been quite as perplexed as to what has happened with extra visits to the pits. The one thing that is absolutely sure and obvious is that the Rover 99 BMW from Ro Rover Racing has driven just been driven supremely well. Conor de Filippi, almost at the end of um, his second stint, he started from pole position, challenged into turn one on the opening lap, but uh, held off the challenge from BMW junior team fleetingly fell down to third place, then fourth place, then worked his way back with Neil Verhagen at the wheel, was chased by his American compatriot Verhagen, but he brought that first end to a conclusion just in front by about half a second. 
and a great stint in number two from Augusto Farfus. Then back to Conor de Filippi. He's about half a lap away from um, heading back into the pit lane. He'll have 22 laps on the board in this four-hour race, and the final 50 minutes or so should be handled by his teammate, Augusto Farfus. And uh, really haven't put a wheel wrong, but uh, came around the next corner after the one they're going through at any moment the drivers of these front running cars know there could be a slower car that just hasn't quite predicted where they are and might just correct one way or just wander into their path and uh, we saw that coming up to bite Fred Makiewicz driving the car in which he won the opening round with his teammate Kevin Estra and Lawrence Van Tour and um, ended up in the barriers Lawrence didn't even get to drive the car so this track can still bite at the best of times, even in decent weather conditions. Not just tricky when it's wet, Peter. But it's the one element that hasn't uh, hasn't thrown at us uh, today is, it, uh, is the weather. It stayed nice and constant, not terribly warm, 14, 15 degrees, not too bad. Good, good for the engines, good for the aspiration, as it were, and not too bad for the perspiration of the drivers. It's not too warm uh, inside those in those cars, but um, it uh, it can. It's always a layer that can. It's always there, sort of, isn't it? Sort of the, that axe not far from your neck kind of thing of looking over your shoulder, the grip, what's the weather going to do, looking up at the skies. And so we've seen extraordinary things. Who would believe that four weeks ago when we opened this series, we had a day probably better than this in terms of sunshine. And then two weeks later, they have to postpone it, as you've just said, uh, that round now, 5th of November, uh, for snow. And, you know, it, as you said, they took the decision really early on the Wednesday to say it's going to happen, it's forecast, it was. And I was, I was watching the webcams and stuff. Um, oh, two diving into the pits there, need to take him one of the out on the way in. Uh, that was, I think, it was a last minute dot com pit stop uh, for whichever the. I think, was that. Um, oh, it was Conor de Filippi. Yeah, it's Conor de Filippi, yeah, very last, very last minute. Uh, just going past a Porsche Cup class car, so just yeah. marginally faster, but I, I, again, a foreshortening thing. I, we knew who's due in, 22 laps on the board, in fact, I'd already written his car number down. I think it would have been, it felt a little bit more, more than marginal in the, the Cup class car, and that rather large, the winged BMW. Chopped across your back. <laughs> that was a warning shot across the back. Well, it was. But we did say that Conor de Filippi is trying to shave every last tenth of a yeah. second. So even on on his in lap, the end of his second stint, he was still trying to do that. Again, it probably wasn't as close as it looked, but certainly there was one car moving past and across the nose of another on the way into the pits. We know now it was the 99 Rover Racing BMW. And you know what? In many ways, that goes to prove that the timing screens, as much as they've confused us, goes to prove that Rover Racing don't think there's a second to spare mm, in this absolutely. battle against the BMW junior team. If they're getting it, it's fine. It's not settled out. It'll all wash out with the time penalties from earlier on. Clearly, it hasn't. And clearly, BMW junior team somehow, despite not having been any faster on the track, maybe the odd tenth here or there, um, really clearly are right in the mix. And where is the BMW junior team M4 GT3? The 99 the car is in the pit lane. Augusto Farfus is on board. Don't forget, they can't hurry these things. But because it's stopping so late in the race, it's a pit stop will be a relatively short one and down through the dotting hoa up when the track starts to incline towards the kink comes max hess coming towards the final chicane the 99 bmw is still in the air just waiting for it to go down onto the track it's down on the track at the front now at the back waiting to be flagged away it can't go it's not just because the pit stop isn't finished it's only finished when the signal goes to the man with the lollipop who's going to lift it up and say right do this and you get pit exit in the given time into the final sequence of corners comes uh, Max Hess, he's done the, the right, he's done the left, he's accelerating hard down the start, finish straight, Augusto Farfus still at a standstill, can't go, can't go, this is a fight for victory and he's still not moving, Max Hess is coming past, BMW junior team have taken the lead of the race going into this final stint, or more to the point, they've maintained it, it's going to be about a 10 second advantage, so the BMW junior team, they're going to have to explain how they've done this, but it's been remarkable, and certainly for Dan Harper with that double stint in the middle, Peter, and now Max Hess pushing really hard in his third, fourth lap since the pit stops. That has been a phenomenal run. But I really want to know what Conor de Filippi's got so to say. Hi, better And uh, galling for Farfus going out of the pit there and just watching that similar car just go past and you're still sat there on the pit limiter just watching it, just pulling away, pulling away, thinking, how much ground is it getting? You just want to let go of that pit limiter and floor it and you can't because it's the rules. Well, he'd been getting a signal from the pit crew saying, you've got to stay, got to wait, we can't get, get you off. I don't think he even saw Max Hess going through turn one because he can't see the car coming down the start, finish straight. He's sitting in his car behind the pit wall. When he exits, his line of sight is down to the first turn and I reckon the advantage is so much. I reckon it is about 10 seconds and I think that is enough for him not even to have seen Max Hess. All he can do now is get his head down and chase. He has the fastest lap of the race to his name. 
uh, Augusto Farfus does. He's got to see if he can go faster than that every lap. Which is coming up behind the very shortly the uh, Marco Sorensen run driven TF Sport Aston Martin. He'll be up behind that a minute going on to the Nordschleife uh, element of this track. Christian Chrome's back at the wheel of the 34 BMW. OK, I just want to throw something in. It's not going to affect the outright victors in this race, but Marco Sorensen, I expected to come in this time mm. around. He's got 22 laps on the board, not listed as coming in. You've seen him going onto the Nordschleife, so he is pushing deep, deep into the reserves of the Aston Martin crew. It has Tom Ferrier pulled off a masterstroke because, of course, if he's stopping another eight minutes or so after the 99 BMW came in, that would equate to him finding... I know I can look at the sliding scale. Well, Sorensen, 21 yeah. seconds or so. Sorry, yes. Sorensen started this car and did seven laps. Pittard then did eight, so the car is capable of it. And Sorensen has just done seven already. So I suspect Sorensen will be in at the end of this lap. Yeah, well, Maxime Martin probably wants a bit of a go. So we will see. But that that is interesting because they there were only three cars that did a set of the front runners that did a seven lap opening stint that was the 99 bmw the 911 porsche yeah. and the 21 aston martin from ts4 oh now, i do like the sign on the back of the dacia dacia versus goliath <laughs> i've no idea what it means but i like it that's a tantalizing thought of uh, maxime martin uh, in that aston for the last 30 minutes fresh driver Fit, match fit, ready to go. Hasn't been in the car all day. Man is, of his calibre, jump into that Aston. Is there some overtaking to do? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, goody. Well, can you put some slower cars in front of me, please? Now we've got somebody with uh, some very slowly coming down the dotting of her, actually into the dip where we had the wheel from the KTM before it is getting up the rise. There's, a, there's quite a dip there on the last half of that past the left-hand king. And something travelling very, very slowly there. Didn't have time to get eyes on it, but as soon as we find out the number, we will let you know. I think it was a GT uh, a Porsche Cup 2 class car. Couldn't quite tell. It's, it's a fairly good guess, isn't it? If, if you say it's by, I think it was a Porsche or a BMW, you're going to get close, aren't you? You're getting warm. I was going by the shape of the wing mirrors before it oh, disappeared sorry. into, into I, the dip. I didn't imagine you with that, that advanced spotting. Sorry, I thought you were just going for a make. I think they were yellow. <laughs> yes, they honestly. Were. Day glow. Yes. Highlighter colour. So. Of course, looking at timing intervals, that we won't get the gap between the BMW junior team, M4 GT3, and with Max Hess on board, and the chasing Augusto Farfus until the end of this lap. And I confirm that your spotting skills remain intact. It was a Porsche. It's number 411. And it's the V6 class entry. Uh, it doesn't have a team name, actually. It's just the, just the drivers. So rings, Sebastian, Sebastian rings. Uh, Jacket Pridis and Alexander Kapke. Them again, eh? It doesn't have a my digital one. I'll have a look in the in the hard copy, the printed one. The old go back to the old printed bit. Yeah, it doesn't have a team name. No, yeah. it's quite a lot. Quite yeah, a few Sebastian don't. Rings and Alexander Coppen. This bit they also had. Uh, it is in the car as well for this race, but it's travelling very slowly on the on the dotting of her, making its way back. You know what I? Oh, oh, yes. Was that a different one? Because this the 411 actually is further back. In fact, it hasn't even reached the kink. Whereas the one we saw on the camera was the other side of the kink. Wasn't no, it, it wasn't. It was before the kink. It was. Okay. It was in that, in that dip, and that goes to prove that was about two minutes ago. Really, it's yeah. uh, limping home slowly. The Glicken House is still going, which is a. Uh, Good to see Thomas Much, but he's down in well, it'll it'll the order will move around a bit. He's uh, in the 16th position. It's sort of been very much where that car has been through the course of, of this race, but um, nothing much has changed. But again, good mileage. We'd like this Clicken House to be at more and more of these events. It's a it's a mate that's had such affinity with the uh, long distance races on the Nürburgring. The car looks absolutely fantastic and it's great. They're keeping this going alongside, of course, their World Endurance Championship charge. Right, directly from the horse's mouth. We can finish this now. His number on the, wind sc uh, the screen at the moment. Car number 44, Team BMW Junior Team, and Dan Harper speaks. And he says, nope, 
no short lap. I served drive through on lap 11 and then one full lap and boxed again, pit stop. On lap 12? Yeah. OK. And that's from a man who's obviously got out of the car, so he knows what he's done. OK, well, what that goes to prove is the time they lost driving through for a drive through penalty hasn't cost them that much. Exactly. So let's say they lost, sake of argument, 25 seconds. They have managed to claw that back and be in front. Thank you very much, Dan Harper, and well done for sending him that telegram. That really was uh, very, very useful indeed. So BMW Junior Team and uh, Dan Harper have won here before. It looks like it could go their way again, but the margin is going to be dictated at the end of this lap, at the end of lap number 23. We've seen on track when the 99 BMW from Rover Racing exited its pit stop, Max Hess in the BMW Junior Team entry, car number 44, was in front. Not just by a few seconds, we think by about 10 seconds or so. So galling as the Rover Racing team sat there. But uh, right now, the 44 car charging down the long run through Dottingahoa up to the climb. We'll go in a few moments. Track is level, level. Now it's starting to rise up towards the kink and then the arrival at the tear garden sequence of corners that lead the cars onto the start finish straight. A bit of a tow being achieved from the Aston Martin. Car number 21 owes us a pit stop though, surely. Only two pit stops served so far, so Aston Martin in front, so it could go back. If it stayed in front on the track, past the pits, it would be another lap led by the Aston's Martin, but they've been having the longest pit stop uh, uh, Longest lap sequences of anyone. The yeah, Aston in. Martin dives into the pits, but how, their pit stop, well, there are only right the minute, 34 minutes left in this race. That's going to be a short pit stop relative to its rivals, but how many will get past before it exits the pits? The 265 seconds, it has to be at a standstill. Certainly the 99 BMW has come through. It's even flashing its lights because I've mentioned its number. Um, but the gap, 5.6 seconds is the gap between Max Hess and Augusto Farfus. Not the 10 seconds I, I thought or feared, but... Um, Anyhow, let's see how they settle down. Hess's tyres will be a little more tired come the end because their pit stop, the final pit stop, was three laps ahead of the number 99 car. So no seconds to be lost uh, by the race leaders from BMW Junior Team. Max Hess, lights are flashing, goes through the cut through on the Grand Prix loops. Got to say it, Cooper in front of him. Should be able to get past before the track suddenly bends to the left. Does so well indeed without having any compromise there, Snowy. Absolutely, just it, it foreshortened. You, you just never know, you say, but just clean, tidy, job done, carry on, relentless, metronomic almost. Well, that was so 5.5 5. 5 seconds. It's going to be a bit more than visual soon, isn't it? For these it, two, it is. So, and I, I really think the, the element's about three extra laps for the BMW Junior team. I think Mr. Farfus has the bit between his teeth. You think so? He still has the fastest lap of the race to his name. So, this is a real tester for Max Hess's. Dan Harper did the heavy lifting in that car. Neil Verhagen did the brilliant opening stint where he was only half a second behind when they came to the pit stops. Half a second behind that uh, number 99 crew. One of the Felipe who started from pole and he pushed so hard. But for Max Hess, here's a big one. He's won here before. He won twice last year with the same teammates. Uh, but for the German, obviously he's the only German in that uh, works lineup. Uh, very, very keen to see what he can do on home ground. See if he can put another win down. But again, so young, he's only 20 years old at the moment, 21 later this year. Vernau, his uh, greatest result so far was winning the ADAC TCR Championship three years ago, but he also won a class of his, the class he was competing in in the Nürburgring 24 the following year. But uh, it's, you know, for young drivers, they, they can chop and change. But I think the BMW Junior team, with all those decades of experience, have kept this trio together for a third year. And I really think it, it's a. Uh, reaping dividends well, for them. They've kept them together for a reason, haven't they? It, it clearly works. Um, I don't know how much longer they can keep calling them a junior team. Yes. There, there must be a threshold. There must come a point at some stage where you're not regarded as a junior and you're, you're actually in the BMW big boy team. Yeah, but it's a sign of the times. Back in back in the mid-1980s, mid to late 1980s, I remember the BMW junior team had the likes of Roland Ratzenberger, who I know was 25 at the time. They all were because they simply didn't you know, get so much racing under their belts when they were teenagers. It's, it's pure and simple. Well, certainly not at this level, no, karting, no. Well, a bit more karting by then, but uh, as you say, TCR type stuff, yeah, but certainly not in the top category in those days. 
Max Hess is really pushing and he's coming to a slow zone as we say that. And um, he's making sure we've got an overtaking manoeuvre done beforehand. Yellow flags. And out of the slow zone. They, they can come at you almost out of anywhere around this circuit. And, and I think the whole point so is as you, as you look at the drivers around certain really twisty parts of the Nord Schleife, the drivers have already sort of planned their route. They've spotted a car, worked out what class it is and how fast it's likely to go into a corner. And then you, your, your overtaking plan is suddenly scuppered when you have to suddenly back out. Can't overtake it here. Wait, wait, wait. Have I seen the flags? Yes, I've seen the flags. Now I can go. Now I can complete that overtaking manoeuvre. And how much is that chap chasing me gaining? It's the thoughts must just, it must be so hard to stay calm when you're in this hunt to the finish. Just over half an hour to go. But he knows he's being caught by a car on fresher tyres. But it's, it's all part of the tools you've got in the armour, isn't it? And you've just got to, as you say, settle down, concentrate on it, not get, not get flustered, and just keep on, keep on doing the job. But at some point you have to, as you say, if, if the car behind has got fresher tyres by a significant margin, the team will have informed you, they will have said, this is happening, this is going to, you, you can't defend it. So there's absolutely no point in taking a risk because you're still better off being second and the result and the points for that and everything that goes with it than you are throwing it off trying to stop it coming wide because you're defending the indefensible. What's the point? But it's, no, it's very easy sitting here saying that talking to you, Bruce. It's not quite the same when you're out there on the north side for any GT3 car. No, exactly. The emotions do have a part in it. Long may that be the case. So they do have a case. Victory versus career glory. You know, and longevity. But you know, who knows what the BMW junior team is saying. They're going, maybe we're being challenged by Rover Racing. We don't fancy that too much and we're going to press on very, very hard indeed. But we're into... The final half hour of this race, absolutely bang on now. And it's BMW versus BMW. And for good measure, two more BMWs filling the top four. So there we have it. How will it run out towards the end of the race? We're very, very close indeed. The chase is on. Du magst Sim Racing? Du liebst die Nordschleife und du bist zwischen 14 und 18 Jahren alt? Dann mach jetzt mit bei der DNLS Junior Sichtung. Der Sieger startet zusammen mit Mercedes AMG Fahrer Adam Christo Dugu in der digitalen Nürburgring Langstrecken Serie 2022 und 23. In der Nürburgring Esports Bar kannst du dich jetzt parallel zu jedem NLS Lauf von 13 bis 18 Uhr beim Shootout qualifizieren. Vielleicht bist ja du der nächste Sim Racing Shooting Star. See you then.
Jetzt Falkenreifen kaufen und Tankgutschein sichern. Weitere Informationen auf tankgutschein.falkenreifen.de Falkenreifen First Asphalt Watch. Die ersten Zifferblätter aus echtem Rennstreckenasphalt. Auf dem Asphalt wurden Legenden geboren und magische Momente erlebt. Koblor. Liebe Fans, besucht unsere Social Media Kanäle von Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter und TikTok. Willkommen zu NLS. Draw in the breath, look ahead and um What would it be? Will there be another incident that sorts this out? Will will the track go to code 60 the whole way round? Will it co go to slow zones on corners? All these thoughts will be going through Max Hess's mind. And all he can do is keep it clean, keep it tidy. And Augusto Farfus, so all he can do is precisely the same, give chase. You've got that hat, haven't you, with all the permutations written and you're just pulling them out and reading out what might happen. Did I get them in the wrong order? He did. He didn't follow the script, dear boy. <laughs> I mean, many, many things can happen here but you know we'd like to think we had so many little not niggly act moments early on it just meant that lots of incidents had to be cleared up none of them large but enough to sort of break the flow in that first stint we just couldn't wait for green flag laps we have waited now we've been getting a lot of them and hopefully we can run through to the end of this four hour race the 53rd running of the Adnour 
Rundstrecken trophy and it's been an enthralling one but it has been BMW all the way we forget of course they were being challenged uh, not just by the Manti Racing Porsche in that opening stint and then just a lap into the next stint until Fred Machiavici ended up having the steering broken um, but there have been other, other sort of roles as well and that true racing KTM Crossbow GT2 stuck with them we thought oh, I qualified well mm -hmm. it'll fall back but it rose to third place got ahead of the Manti racing car with Kevin Astra Kevin Astra on board so that was uh, really mighty for Tim Heinemann but uh, then it, it fell back and then it fell off we didn't fall off the circuit but the wheel fell off the car the right rear wheel uh, came came off just as soon as Matt Siliaug took it over and then we thought he deserved the bravery prize for the race for having it fixed and then going out all over again so clearly the team had to be very clear what it was that caused four wheels to become three he went, but obviously that took it a long, long way down the order. The sister car, the 52 KTM Crossbow GT2, is, for example, in 30th place overall. We'll have to scroll back some distance further down the time charts to find where 53 is. But it certainly made its mark, and it showed it could lap not just when it qualified, but it could keep that pace together, certainly for that opening stint. Very, very impressive indeed. As I scroll down and down the screens, tiny screens, to try and find how far down uh, that KTM is, but uh, I'm down into the 120 something and I haven't found it. But uh, meanwhile, at the front of the race, you know, there's a 10 second advantage for Max Hess over Augusto Farfus. That's the battle for the lead. What will the interval be next time around? The 99 giving chase, Augusto Farfus for once has been a clear track ahead of, ahead of him. The blue sky at the start of the day has uh, turned a little bit gray, but it's dry, only uh, fine weather clouds up ahead is really, really pushing towards the end of the lap. Delighted to find no cars immediately up in front of him and uh, pretty much coming on to the dotting of her. No, a few more twists and turns to get there, but uh, the track yeah, over again. Schraub and Schwanz. Schwanz. Yeah, OK, yeah. I thought we'd so gone through Schraub and Schwanz. No, you were close. But if I took that approach and I hadn't got to Schraub and Schwanz, I thought it was all straight from here. That would have been a disaster. But uh, through Schraub and Schwanz he goes and then... Trauben Schwanz, as it feeds through to Garden Kopf, was uh, indeed so. Where, of course, the uh, incident occurred that had the Manti Racing Porsche going to the outside, then outside a little bit more, and uh, with broken steering, couldn't get around that corner. And uh, right now, the 99. Rover Racing BMW negotiates it no trouble at all, past a couple of uh, cars in the, in the lower classes, and is running up the straight on his own. But is he closer to Max Hess, or has he fallen away? And that time's last time around, not enormously quick. In fact, his best lap of the race is, was 21 seconds faster than he managed last time around. But now the heat is in the tyres for the 99 BMW. Lights being flashed behind. It's another BMW coming up. It's... Uh... Oh, God, big, big... Uh, there's dust down on the circuit as uh, Max Hess goes through. He's through the Tiergarten twist, but as he got into them, he went on to some... To, I thought um, I was an engine failure for a so, second. So did I. Yeah, yeah. The camera suddenly came to the race leader. In the background was the flashing headlights of Augusto Farfus. Right, 25 laps on the board. The gap between them last time was 10.192 seconds. I sense Farfus may have just closed in a tiny bit. Let's wait and see. He's coming over the start-finish line now. 6.7 seconds, so he found uh, four, four and a half, three and a half seconds there nearly. But look at the time. They both... 7.55.525. Better than pole. Max Hess, exactly. Quicker than, two seconds quicker than pole. Max Hess has just done a 7.58.90 across the line, which is the fastest lap for that car on the race. And as, it, as soon as we looked at it, went to process it, seven seconds later, or just under 6.7 seconds later, uh, as which is far from said, well, I'll take another three seconds off that. Right, we've got 18 set minutes left in this race. That's three laps. They're on to the final three laps. That is what they can manage. But extraordinarily, particularly for the 99 car, towards the end of that lap for the Rover Racing BMW, for Augusto Farfus, he had clear track ahead of him. You sort of sense if you're treated to a, an enjoyable sight of clear tarmac ahead of you, chance to pick your line. Next time around, you won't. You'll have gaggles of cars. But uh, certainly, I think that may have aided his his chase down of the race leader, but clearly his car is on sweeter rubber, fresher rubber. Max Hess, how much is he hanging on? He's a little bit cautious as he goes towards the end of the Grand Prix loop and then doubles left to the Sabine Schmitz curve, and there are no cars between them. How has that happened at this point in the race? We started with 153 cars, and suddenly this is absolutely magical. This is exactly what Augusto Farfus wanted. He wanted to be able to have clear line of sight, he's certainly got that, but it's where the gaggles of car up ahead uh, 
where they will find them and how many at a time. Just to prove the point, Christian Cohen's in the uh, uh, Valken Horse Motorsport BMW. It's just said a new fastest lap race at 755.1, taking four tenths off it. He's a minute and 12 seconds down on... Is he the fastest? fastest man on the circuit? No, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's all that matters to him. No, because when, when the bar came across the timing screen, I thought, that's funny, when they go in the pits, they shouldn't be coming in the pits, they get a, a red one, but yeah. this is pink, and I thought, oh, it is pink, right. Oh, 55-1. Well, that's very impressive. So, into the closing stages of this race, we've got 16 and a half minutes remaining until the chequered flag can be shown. SP9 Pro Class cars fill the top 13 positions, and then that number 112 Porsche that's been driven so well for K Kramer Racing is in leading the, S the Cup 2 class in 14th place. So it's just ahead, oh, well, by more than half a minute, the SPX class leader, which is the Glickenhaus Thomas Mutsch at the wheel at the moment, and a couple of what you get, some teams just don't have a clear run. To have the likes of Thomas Prining and Earl Bamber in 17th and 18th places in their Porsches is extraordinary. Slow-moving Audi yeah, TCR three, three, one, class car. the MSC Syndic entry. Luckily for those chasing, he was sort of running on his own as he went up into Tiergarten because certainly anybody coming up behind would be wanting to lap faster than that. But uh, again, Marshall's doing a very good job. Interesting there that uh, the tenth place car of uh, Manuel Metzger, the um, Mercedes, was weaving coming down the pit straight, uh, almost as if there was no reason to. No, no, obviously not warming up tyres at that point. But almost as if it was latter stages of running out of fuel. And I'm just weaving it to get some, make sure it picks up and across that. It was slight, slightly odd. I'm not quite sure why he was doing that. Well, well, it's, well I mean, they'd have got it very wrong if he's running out of fuel, but his last lap was 40 seconds off the pace of the front-running cars. And Manny Metzger around here should be right on the pace. So something untoward has occurred for him. I'm trying to think if he's dropped down the order. I think he's... No, he's 10th. He has dropped down the order. That car was originally fighting with Cuba Gamaziak's number 16 Team Phoenix car. So if I take away 40 seconds of his time, yeah, he's lost three positions, four positions on that lap. He's, so Aston Martin with Maxime Marta has now moved up into seventh. And he's fallen from seventh down to tenth place. So I wonder if there was a moment. Certainly to lose that much time around a lap isn't what the doctor ordered. Grossman and Kolb having a great battle in the uh, Octane from 26 Ferrari and the Audi. Just less than half a second across the line there with a good old ding dong down the um, dotting of through traffic which is now resumed they've got through the Grand Prix, almost through the Grand Prix but they're on the hairpin back the Grand Prix bit where they turn 180 degrees complete the last few corners of the the current Grand Prix circuit as it were before they disappear off onto the Nordschleife traffic keeping out of their way for them Ferrari leading at the moment in the, this battle this is for 12th place and uh, as Kobe, Christian Kolb's lap on the previous lap was the same match there. They were a tenth apart, 8.15.5 and 0.6. You know, at this point in the race, they're outside the top 10. Points they'll earn will be limited. But they, you know, what you want to have when you're out on a circuit, particularly a circuit like this, is someone to tussle with. And certainly that keeps it tight. But to talk about tight, the lead battle has come down to about a second. It was 10 seconds. It got start finish line, it was down to 6.8 seconds. They're going into the carousel, it's down to a second. So Hess, I'm afraid the borrowed time he's been living off has almost come to a conclusion. Second place would still be a very, very meritorious result in ordinary running. But just to reiterate, this is a car that served a drive-through penalty and yet still against supreme opposition, it's still in front. But unfortunately, the extra laps it's done on this final stint on its rubber will cost it, is costing it. Uh, but to still be in the mix, still to be in front with, what, a dozen minutes remaining in this race, despite a drive-through penalty, is extraordinary so i think it's been a really good drive for all three drivers in this car neil verhagen who had the the race chase at the front of the race his was a standard stint but then dan harper having that drive through penalty interrupting his form and then having to do longer stints on his rubber to still be in front of the stage shows just how well they've been racing max hess if he could hang on to this that would be a miracle 12 and a half minutes remaining it certainly would be. I didn't think it was going to come down to that. We saw the gap go five and a half seconds, went down to ten, came back down to 6.7. Didn't expect to see this just yet. You said there were three laps to go. I thought, well, I said that, that we'll really see it in the final three laps, laps of the race. I actually thought we'd see it coming down and then maybe with a lap or so to go. But it, he's a, at least a lap ahead on this chase that I 
and to my expectations as Agosto Farfas closes in all the time. Christian Cronius has the fastest lap of the race, but uh, this time around, well, how good are these laps going to be? One, seven minutes, 55.1 seconds is the best pace so far by the Norwegian racer last time around. And right now, it's all about Augusto Farfus not just catching, but then doing that tricky thing on the Nordschleife, passing Max Hess. But if you were the Brazilian, Snowy, you'd wait for your moment, wouldn't you? You'd go, right, we'll get on to the start, we'll get on to the long run, dotting her. Maybe I'll make a move there, or maybe I'll wait and try and do it down into turn one. He's got the tyres, he's got the handling, Max Hess in front is hanging on. Well, that's exactly the point. You've got to decide when and where. Uh, and try and work out the car if it has any weak spots, driver and car combination. Car unlikely because it's the same make and model, so it's going to be down to prep, setup, tyre wear. As you say, you've got how much of that advantage have you got in those tyres? Because they're slightly fresher. You, you reckon they were three laps newer? Oh uh, yeah, three yeah, laps. So three laps newer. So so much fresher. So and a lot of it can here just be stay in touch and see what the traffic offers, because the traffic is most likely presented the opportunity. Oh, that said, such match cars. That said, Augusto Farfus, the final sequence of corner, kicking out the dust where it turned sharp right, and then he had to turn sharp left, but he's right under the rear wing of Max Hess, they're going past uh, TCR Audi, no problem at all, under the start line gantry, they go down to turn one. Is there going to be an inside offered? Certainly not. Max Hess adopts that inside line. If you're coming round, go around the outside. No, I didn't mean go around the outside. No, I'll move across it in front of you. He's got it covered off on the exit of turn one. Well, has he? And into turn two, only just sweepy across the nose of Augusto Farfus. Of course, you carry on turning, arcing constantly to the left, and then what's up in front of them? It's uh, a, a slower class BMW. You know they're going to have no problems getting past that. But the important thing for Hess, they got through turn four before that. Is it going to be a dive? Not close enough up into the cut through. Oh, but. Farfus is just trying to unsettle him. Even if there's not quite a chance, he's going, I'm pretending I'm going for it, I'm going for it. Halfway round the, the curtail part of the Grand Prix loop that we use here. We've got, what, left under 10 minutes remaining. It's this lap, and unfortunately for Max Hess, the following one as well. That's plenty of time for Augusto Farfus to make a move. He's got to make sure it's going to stick. He knows he's got the life in his tyres. He can bide his time. Quite so, and he's, uh, he's just playing the mind games now, isn't he? Of just filling the mirrors. Uh, of Hess's mirrors, flashing the lights all the time, just not, just putting him off, just distracting him, just, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, to take him off, his mind off. Now, going into Sabine Schmidt's coach, Costa lost a little bit of time there, in fact, lost quite a bit of time there, while the 511 uh, BMW, and he was correctly cautious there, was that as far as that could have gone so completely wrong, but that's, that shows experience as well, that in actual fact, he could have just then capitalised on making the opportunity he didn't no it's going to cost him a couple of car lengths so what it's better to have a couple of car lengths behind and be second than it is being the barriers well, well it is it's also better you know last time around he took um well the gap's down to 0.2 of a second on the start finish line but it, he, he took five six and a half seconds out of, out of the race leader so no problem at all he's got time he's got another 40 kilometers minimum uh, to, to to haul it in so you can see why all those years of experience that augusto farfus has uh, gained was used very well indeed by being so prudent and in fact looking at the front of the car you forget of course that it came into that first pit stop and had bodywork damage just thinking we had yes. spotted before it must have been just before the pit stop but um, farfus knows what he's doing and he's done it before he's gone for he's got it he's gone to take getting the lead well that was a blink of an eye coming up across um, a tail in bmw but i think hesser just slightly lifted to try and read the situation and there we were saying you know, you know what, Farfus doesn't have to take any risks. You know what, that's the moment where we least expected it, and I think Hess least expected it. He's got to stay close. The German trying to get back. He's about five car lengths down on Augusto Farfus, twisting around, trying to get it down to four car lengths, to three. He's at about four at the moment. He's trying to get any toe, but, of course, the track has all sorts of twists and turns. That's another statement for the Nürburgring Nordschleife, but... Uh, He's got to get back in front because I think if this settles down, then Augusto Farfus with that greater tyre life will just pull clear. But there are four car lengths between them. Hess is not finished yet, but his is the harder task. Nor should it be, but that opportunity presented itself to Farfus at, uh, uh, on the run-up to Flugplatz. Uh, and as you say, he just hesitated, hesitated very slightly there, Hess did, and that just uh, gave him the opportunity at Svadenkraut just to, to run alongside. I thought Nietzsche was having a look alongside, and he didn't. He just... Uh, here we see it again there. Sit behind the back markers. Slight hesitation from Hess. 
and Farfa says, thank you very much, I'll go through that. And there was a, there was almost a, uh, an extra moment there with a couple of wheels on the grass. They, they believe that to Manti. You don't need other cars going on the grass as well. But um, that was very, very opportunistic. It did present itself exactly what we said. Traffic was most likely to do it. Uh, and Augustus Farfa didn't need to be asked twice to take the race lead with seven odd minutes to go of this uh, NLS 3 race 2. But importantly, it's this lap and the next one. They should complete this one. But the, the difficult thing there for Max Hess was that it wasn't just one car in front of him. It was a Porsche Cup class car. But in front of that was another one. And he was obviously trying to guess how the Porsche Cup class driver would react to the slower BMW 325i. And was trying to gauge where he was going, get a hint of where he was going to go and try and pass it. And I think that was the moment. That was and the that's scintilla. exactly the right thing to do. There's no fault on, on Max Hess's pastures. I've got to that. Thank you very much. Yeah. While you're, while you're thinking about it, I'll get on with it. So, so difficult. And since I was still thinking Max Hess was in with half a chance, I said he had to stay close to the tail. But the smiles are on the faces at Rover Racing because that advantage of four car lengths has become eight car lengths for Augusto Farfus. He's pulling clear. The fresher rubber will really be an advantage for him now around the, around the remaining lap and a third, one would feel. But... Um, has he got the job done? Looking for high shots to the corner before the climb up to the carousel. Not a car to be seen running up to the carousel or down and beyond. So they've got about at least half a kilometre clear ahead of them and that will carry on. The important thing is that Hess has to try, just try what he can to get onto the tail again of Augusto Farfus so he, he can use its toe. If he can't use his toe out of the Dossinger Hoa, he's done for. This is his last chance. He's got to stay close this lap. There's still one lap to go as well. They really had. And at the moment, I'd say he's not quite close enough to capitalise on anything at the moment. He's playing a, a waiting game here, stuck behind. He's got to now this guy down. It is, as you say, Bruce, five, six car lengths. If anything, it's opening up very slightly. Um, not massively in time, but just a car length, half a car length. It's just he's almost ebbing away a little bit. Maybe that's the advantage of those tyres uh, on the lead car and far as those three lap newer tyres that he can just, just got a little bit more left in them, haven't grained as much, he can just push in, in from a bit more. I, I also think it's in, in the driver's minds. If you're far you know, whatever I do, he's struggling to, to even match me in terms of pace and you flip that over the other way and I think Max says, oh, God, I bet he's got grip, I haven't, but he's certainly taking as many risks as he possibly can as they come round towards the completion of the, the twiddly fiddly bits. They've still got so much gradient change to deal with here but through the twisty bits of course that's where Farfus with more grip in his tires has just got the advantage but certainly any high shots show that Max Hess is really hanging it out to the edge of the circuit he's tasted victory here before but he really really wants to work at it again I love how you just said describing the Nürburgring the twiddly through bit. the twiddly bits can you, can you be more specific which particular twiddly bits do you mean the bit, the bits. which bits aren't twiddly apart from the pit straight the pit straight and tossing a her <laughs> And you could almost say it's straight around Schwedenkreuz, Flugplatz, that, oh. that sort of part of the circuit. But uh, three quarters of the way around the lap towards the 7 8 mark. And now getting towards the end, they're going to be going down to Galgenkopf. And I'd say this is about the five or six car length margin that Farfus enjoys over Hess. If Hess has any chance, he's got to get a good entry to the long run of dotting her. And I would think that final, that corner, Galgenkopf, will hurt him. And it has. He's lost another couple of car lengths down the straight. They go, no chance of a tow. He's begging, looking for traffic up ahead. It cost him the advantage. But it was a matter of when, not if, for Augusto Farfus getting past. There is a little bit of traffic, but only one car. He wanted a multi-car group fighting around in front of Farfus. The Opal keeps out of the way. Thank you very much indeed. Is passed. But no chance of a toe. That was surely his chance gone. He can't I think eat he did. any more Actually, rubbing. I think he did get a little bit of a toe there. Tiny. Yeah. yeah. But he wanted a two or three car group yeah. to, to slightly confuse Augusto Farfus in the lead of the race and then give him an advantage, give him a chance. But it hasn't happened. So two, just under three minutes to go. We'll, this is starting the last lap. It's not done yet. It does look remarkably in Augusto Farfus's favour. OK, last time around the gap was uh, two tenths of a second in favour of Hess. Now it's, only it's Farfus. Only one second. That's been a sterling effort. And they both lapped in, in fact, Farfus 7.57.5 and only 1.2 seconds faster than Hess. Well, we've already told you those time incidents, but I think that's phenomenal, bearing in mind how much life 
how much more life has been taken out of the rubber on Max Hess's BMW M4 GT3. And unfortunately for, for Hess, he had to go round the outside at turn three. That's cost him a little bit more time. He's just got to do what he can, but you just feel that Farfus has all those years of experience plus the fresher rubber. Surely he can make this happen. Traffic is going to be key on this final lap. Both drivers experienced, both got the same equipment. Theoretically, they'll each have each team will have their own way of setting it all up, but it won't be that massively different. It really is down to it. Now, just getting towards the end of the Grand Prix loop, and there is quite a bit of traffic they're going to come across in about two corners' time. The clock will stop very shortly. Now, Farfus takes advantage of that, gets between two of those cars straight away, decisively down in there. That's held. Hess back a little bit. Now they're going on to Sabine Smith's curve, and that's really held up. Hess got stuck behind. A little bit of traffic there. Farfus can make haste with his, his runaway down to the hats and back. Well, he really can. Every time there was a, was a moment, he'd lose a little bit of time, but then the Red Sea would pass and then close again right in front of, uh, of Max Hess. And when he was going between the first and second parts of Sabine Schmidt's curve, there was no eye to the needle to thread as he tried to go between three of the back markers, one of which is trying to overtake another. Yet still, he's not lost that much through that sequence, but... I was he, just thinking that it hasn't, hasn't cost him as much as it looked visually. No. Start, it really hadn't. But but uh, now they're getting to what I call the, the fiddly bits and the twiddly bits, and it's working very much for the race leader, for Augusto Farfus. And don't forget, he's the one who can push that little harder in the corners. Max Hess is just trying to do what he can, but he's having to have a really smooth run. You know, he's really got to keep it smooth. What's up ahead? There's another car just coming up in front of them as a back marker, but it's about a dozen, maybe 20 car lengths between them now. It's been unkind, unfortunate for Max Hess, but uh, Augusto Farfus has read things very, very well indeed. And if you just happen to turn on, tune on, as we get to five seconds to go in this four-hour race, Max Hess has been blocked again. But the fact he's even in the chase, even trying to keep up with Augusto Farfus, in a car that served a drive-through penalty is still in the mix. That's been a great, great run from Neil Verhagen, from Dan Harper, who did the middle two stints, and from Max Hess, who is clearly hanging on by his fingertips. But I, I fear he was the one who needed the traffic to work for him on this lap to stay in the mix. He is the one who hasn't had the brakes, yet still, still somehow he's there. But the front end of that is BMW Junior Team M4 washing around now in the tighter corners. The grip's gone. It certainly has. He's done extraordinarily well to, to stay in touch. As you see that last, uh, those two, these two, their last laps were a second apart, 1.1 second. That's pretty impressive on old tyres, I've got to say. Traffic has been key to this. Uh, and I think it really is not uh, not taking anything away from Augustus uh, Farfus, but uh, it's traffic that really played the hand there and he, t he, he took advantage of it. Yeah, he took advantage and actually since then it's helped him again and again. But don't forget, he, he's got something in the bag. He's got the extra life in his tyres. And so for a handful of drivers, that yes, the four hours are over, but they don't get the chequered flag yet. It'll only be shown when the race leader comes around and there's at least half a lap to go for Augusto Farfus. For Rover Racing, it looks like they're going to come home in first and fifth positions because Sheldon van der Linde has... It was passed a while back by the Toxport WRT Porsche, running a Porsche this year with uh, Matt Campbell on board. So much success over the years with Porsche for the Australian racer. Christian Cronias, though, is safe in that third position. So it'll be BMW from Rover Racing, BMW from BMW Junior Team, and BMW from Walken Horse Motorsport. Giving a sweep of the podium here in NLS 3. It's the second round of the championship because the second round was cancelled but it's still listed as NLS 3 and the second round will be replaced with an event in November to bring the Nürburgring Langstrecken series to a conclusion for 2022. One feels there are going to be some amazing races between now and then. We've got the big build-up for the Nürburgring 24 hours uh, but for Rover, Rover Racing uh, it should be smiles all round because uh, they've worked hard and uh, the BMW M4 didn't want to play to start with, but now it's really, really finding its form. And it's up to Augusto Farfus to bring it home. Rover Racing, last one here in August 2020. Nicky Katzberg and Steph Dusseldorp. Steph is driving today one of the M4 concept cars, which is next year's GT4 cars, class uh, challenger from BMW. So he's not notably much further down the field. The cars up the front are all in the GT3 class, known as SP9 here. 
and uh, they are dominating the show. We're not used to having uh, one make of car being so dominant, and particularly one that's only just stepping up into the breach. But uh, for Rover Racing, they are pushing on, pushing on, but they have to because uh, being pushed so hard by Max Hess, he's really taking Never Say Die as his mantra today in these closing stints. Still traffic in the way, and Audi TT don't get to see too many of those out on racing circuits. That's passed with aplomb, and in fact, for once, it seemed to go the way the advantage slightly to the chasing Max Hess. He's got nothing to lose. It's about a second and a half, possibly two seconds down on the race leader, Augusto Farfus. No disgrace. In fact, I think driving supremely well. But unfortunately for him, with every corner to go, that means there's probably only another 100 corners before the end of the lap. But this, this is the final lap of the race. It never fails to deliver, does it, this place? Never, ever. doesn't matter what the conditions are. It just never fails to deliver. Here we are yet again. Uh, watching a final lap with the cars second apart. It's a chase. I mean, misfortune and uh, little things cost us a couple of the others who could have challenged, but really on the form of qualifying and the form since the opening lap of the race, it's these two, the 99 car from Rover Racing and the fellow BMW M4 GT3, but from the rival BMW junior team. They're giving it their everything, but their everything doesn't have a lot more to give because we're nearly at the end. This is the final lap after four hours of the 53rd at an hour AEC Rundstrecken Trophy and Augusto Farfus should be putting a big smile on the face of Rover Racing and it was a proper, proper race and it's not over yet but you feel with every corner unless there's a huge gaggle of cars not knowing what they do are doing things are going their way so let's try two abreast, three abreast and suddenly the race leader is held up by I think ironically it was another BMW M M4 GT3 there was an Audi. No, it wasn't. It was an Audi. Sorry, similar livery as the, one of the walking horse cars. No, and no. The toe down dotting her is 12, 12 length advantage. Come down to half a car length advantage and going for the inside. There isn't an inside. The dust is kicked up on the left of the circuit by Max Hess. Look to the outside now, but uh, Augusto Farfus, that's years of experience for you. But he lost a dozen car length advantage and the nose of the BMW junior team car is up the inside but the track is going to kick left but it's on the left his nose is half the bonnet length is in front but Augusto Farfus now is a slightly faster line on the outside he's covered it going to Tiergarten there's a back marker ahead surely surely he's going to hang on now that was the sternest of challenge we thought opening round was brilliant with Yusuf Awega giving chase and just losing out the cars come into the start finish straight there is probably half a second between them what an astonishing that but Rover Racing and Augusto Farfus take the victory in NLS3 and breathe, ladies and gentlemen. But Max Hess, that was super impressive. And just at the end, two cars fighting, not even a class battle, came together on the run through Dottingerhoa, and the gap suddenly closed right across the nose of Augusto Farfus, and his 10, 12 length car length advantage came down to nothing. That was storming. Never, never, ever give up. <laughs> well, you were spot on. Uh, 0.582 of a second between them across the line. Oh, I forgot to look yes, at that. Yes. Yeah. Four hours of racing, half a second separates them. What a fantastic and absolute credit to both of them as well for not coming together. Oh, I would totally. And, and I just thinking if, you, if you're in the boardroom at BMW, you must be going, oh, I made that decision. Thank, <laughs> yes. thank goodness my job's safe for another few years. <laughs> so waiting for the car to come through in third place, it should be uh, Christian Cronyers. And that will be a BMW one, the two, one, one, two, three, three yeah. and then they'll come home in fifth as well with Sheldon van der Linde. But for the first two, that was an astonishing battle. In fact, we're still waiting for the car coming through in third place. Uh, such was the margin of dominance. That final lap, were, they still lapped in under eight minutes, the sort of pace they dreamt of in the early stages of the race. Uh, and just looking to see if there are going to be any other changes. Kuba Gimnasiak might even deprive the second BMW from Rover Racing for fifth place. We'll have to see what happens there. Christian Cronyers crossed the finish line third, one minute, 12 seconds down on that amazing battle for victory. Well, that really, really was quite something. Oof. And breathe, as they say. Just wait and see who's going to come through in fourth place. It should be the Toxport WRT Porsche. As I say that, yes, it does. He was another 30 seconds down on Christian Cronyers. And Rover... Rover Racing do just get the, that fifth place hunted down and in fact actually pulled away slightly from Kuba Gimaziak on that final lap so Gimaziak in the Phoenix Audi takes sixth place and waiting for the next car through it should be the TF Sport Aston Martin that uh, tried to do those long stints early on worked hard took a victory last year but uh, Aston Martin did but uh, 
another day for them. But uh, for Rover Racing and BMW, that was a fantastic result. And uh, the run through to the finish, Max Hess got that brilliant, brilliant toe, went to driver's left, found uh, half of his tyres were, well, all his tyres on the left-hand side of the car were on the dirt. And then he tried again and again. And he's on the left-hand side. And he gets his nose in front, the whole bonnet in front. But unfortunately, he's on the outside of the circuit. You need to be on the inside there. And Augusto Farfus able to cover it off. And of course, there was another car between them just before they got to the Tiergarten Twisters and they got through. That was an exquisite bit of uh, racecraft. But uh, Max Hess, you can't fault him for trying. That was fabulous. Just beautiful to witness that as well. And uh, such a um, professional driving from, from both of them. If you look how close Hess actually got to the back of Farfus at one point, just after that kink where you get that draft, um, how he didn't collect it is an absolute credit to driving ability. Yeah, he, he might look at that video and go, <laughs> how didn't I collect it's it? Like, oh, yes, don't, don't need to work on that manoeuvre, do I? <laughs> that was absolutely extraordinary. Who would have thought there? At one point he was, as you say, whole bonnet ahead. He did actually take the lead uh, with a matter of metres to go, but unfortunately just didn't quite get the draft. He said he couldn't go to the inside at Tiergarten. Well, he couldn't know. But uh, Farfus knew that because there was a back marker there and there was no way he was going to do it. So he just stayed where he was, just not going to go around the outside. We saw it almost exactly the same play for play a month repeat ago. of a month ago with um, uh, Yusef Vega trying to go around the outside uh, of, of, of Fred Macbecki in the Manti car. You can't do it there. It's not going to happen. So what? What a finish. What a race, Bruce. And some people are still out there racing because, of course, we got the, we just broke onto this, this final lap and... Um still crossing the start finish line some will still be about four minutes away but it's all smiles Connor de Filippi's going up to congratulate his teammate Augusto Farfus who I think you know it might not have been the greatest race in his career but it's probably the greatest finish and that was a huge amount of pressure and for BMW well back slaps all round from Augusto Farfus and it's good to see that uh, Max Hess has just got out Dan Harper's in the mix and uh, Neil Verhagen as well they worked so hard those BMW junior team drivers but uh, Let's just remind you, in that final chase, it very nearly overturned the uh, race order. And for Rover Racing, they had the tyres at the end of the race. For Max Hess in the junior team, they must have been on images of rubber rather than the real thing. They took it <laughs> right to the end, and yet still he was fighting. That was absolutely brilliant. And it was extraordinary as they came down that, that long run from dotting her. You always pray for a few back markers. They, they managed to use them uh, just extraordinary, uh, the way it folded in on Augusto Farfus all the way around that lap. The first 24 kilometres were brilliant. Every bit of traffic sort of worked its way a little bit. And then suddenly there was no gap. And then suddenly the gap came right down. And that was extraordinary. And then the slipstreaming effect was phenomenal. Not enough for Max Hess. Well, that was an absolutely brilliant finish of the race. So the opening round, it was settled at the final corner. This one, it was second, settled about 20 metres before the final corner. So that was extraordinary, but it very much, Snowy, has been BMW's day. It certainly has. Um, at one point, we said the top four were basically got a little interlope there. So Matt Campbell in the uh, Top Sport 911 GT3, he uh, managed to get it onto into fourth place. But it's, uh, it's a BMW podium, and uh, such is the strength of that car that that uh, still relatively new uh, M4 GT3 car, but it's um, not only has it taken all three steps to the podium, but it's three different teams. Well, it, and that's, that shows what a, what a brilliant customer car that is and what, what, what a platform that new car is. And, and that's even more exciting, I think, if you're, if you're a manufacturer and you produce a car and, you, and your, your teams have a big spread. And I, I think also just, you know, Rover Racing won an event this in for BMW last year, but it was the M6. We have to just reiterate, it's the M4 that's now doing the winning. And Augusto Farfas is just smiling from ear to ear. <laughs> Every driver likes to win, but even better if you do it with a real battle. Was well, that you, want, you, you race for a reason, you want to race. Yeah, winning race, yes, it's great, but you want, you want to have a battle. It's, it's, they often say it's so much better to have a race for second, third, fourth, tenth. And it's just to be out there on your own at the front. There's no, there's no real satisfaction in doing that. Um, but that was you, you couldn't have got a much closer battle there. I still, I still want to watch that replay of uh, of Hess 
Okay, just trying to get past Farfus on the on the dotting of her, and I, I didn't think you could get any closer and jink out without missing it. I'm not sure you could. No, no. I think the definition would be definitely the thickness of a respray. Yes, both of them will have learnt an enormous amount. Augusto has so many years of experience, but um, again, you know, it's a matter of pride. It's not just to win the race; it's to keep the juniors behind you at all costs. And uh, very clean driving. It was fabulous to watch, and this circuit just keeps on producing. And Connor de Felipe, who started from pole position, you know, he had for a while the fastest lap of the race but let's just uh, remind ourselves as uh, connor explains that brilliant first and third stints for him fastest lap went to another bmw driver the drive one of the drivers in the car that finished third that's christian cronias but uh, for american racer connor de felipe a proud proud win here today and a lot of his career has been in germany he has a real affinity ever since he tied himself up with um, bmw many many moons ago in fact he was winning in the well it was the vln then back in uh, 2000 and, uh, 2016 he won here with christopher meese but that was in an audi Shock horror. so affinity with the circuit but definitely a bmw man through and through these days and uh, of course for the bmw junior team they won two rounds last year but for max hess he's looking a little bemused he must be very very proud i, I didn't win that but i gave it absolutely everything had got away from him and then it came back and it just shows uh, it, yeah I thought Harp, I thought um, Gustav Farfus was smiley but uh, certainly Max Hess that is a proud proud moment a winner here before but that chase will almost give him more accolade than the wind absolutely it'll done his stock no harm at all will it no it, 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 entirely so and um, what one has to keep reminding ourselves is the stand at the top of uh, the Nürburgring Langstrecken series just gets stronger and stronger. And um, proof of the matter was, I know we didn't get the Falcon Motorsport Porsches uh, racing here today because of tyre supply problems, which is something that's going to affect, unfortunately, teams around the world um, in the months to come. Uh, they could have been in the mix as well. But if you're BMW, you want that blue and white badge in the front of your car, plenty to smile about. Sammy Matty Trogan and... Um, Andy Suchek uh, being interviewed, but really the driver would be great to hear from in the third place crew would be Christian Cronje's fastest lap of the race. But uh, that BMW M4, they must be going, thank our lucky stars we've aligned ourselves with this crew for 2022. Unfortunately, we had to miss the previous race due to a problem. Uh, so it's nice. Uh, our first I want to go and drive one now. That's I thought I can sense that. I can absolutely <laughs> sense that. And where would you like to drive it? On the Nordschleife, perhaps? <laughs> well, of course. Yes. He knew the same one. The look on your face there was like you got that fatherly look of a child that knew that was coming. <laughs> He's kept it under his hat for four and a half hours now. He's been very well behaved. Give him a bun later. Well, having, having driven uh, the, the, ro the road going version of this, it, I can confirm it is an extraordinary car and on track. It was, and one at uh, Goodwood yesterday, actually. It's uh, quite, quite an extraordinary piece of kit. But I want the GT, I want the GT3 version. Okay, thanks a lot. I want to go and play. If you do it, do it properly. Absolutely. So, third place crew. Go large or go home. Very, very smiley indeed. But to the biggest smile, if you can find any representative from BMW, is uh, well, how did you do at the Nurburgring today? Yes, first, second, third. Now, you know what? I'll give you a bonus. Fifth as well. <laughs> But really, above all, it was the conclusion of that race. And just to remind you, the 44 crew, the BMW Junior team crew, they served a drive-through penalty and they were good enough, clearly for overall victory, to, to end up just half a second down, uh, was a great result for Neil Verhagen, who gave chase to Conor Felipe in the opening stint of the race. Dan Harper, who had his race interrupted by that drive-through penalty and then did the double stint in the middle of the race, phenomenal from him and for max hess those closing laps on tires that didn't want to play anymore that was a brilliant brilliant chase it had got away from him nearly came back but augusto farfus wise old bird in many ways and that is why he's been a works bmw driver forever and a day he held on to take victory that's it from the third round of the nls for 2022 plenty more in store five more rounds is also the number green 24 hours to keep uh, fans of the nordschleife very happy indeed just a month from now. So no snow this time, sun at the start, but I will just always remember the final few moments of this race because they were absolute gold on a brilliant circuit. So hats off to Augusto Farfus who took victory and Max Hess who took everything but victory. It was a brilliant, brilliant run to the finish. And I simply can't wait for the next round of the championship. The Nürburgring Langstrecken series, it's been absolutely brilliant so far and looking forward to the races ahead.